Hey, everybody. Quite the range of topics and tactics. Spiders, uh, South America. Hi, good morning everybody, and welcome to day two of the Anti-SLAPP conference. My name is Susan Coftry, I'm project director at the Foreign Policy Center, and I'm really delighted that we are holding this conference uh, on the topic of countering legal threats against media freedom with our partners, the Justice for Journalists Foundation. We had a really packed agenda yesterday, starting with a keynote speech from Baroness Kennedy, going into four panels with lots of journalists uh, talking about their own experiences uh, before having a wonderful evening event with Claire Rucastle-Brown and Paul Radu, two fantastic investigative journalists who faced considerable legal threats, but also here in the UK. Um, I just wanted to reflect on a couple of points uh, that I really picked up on yesterday from two journalists and, and lawyers who, who spoke about what was happening. One of them said, uh, the process itself is the punishment. And someone else said, the only thing worse than a threat is the reality. And I think that that really seemed like the theme, what was coming through from the different journalists who spoke um, about their experiences. And despite you know, the, the range of topics that these journalists are investigating, um, the jurisdictions that they're working in, the exact laws uh, that they're being targeted with, and the tactics used on them, uh, and, and also those bringing them uh, against them. Um, the impact on, on the journalists and media freedom felt pretty much the same. Um, and I think that's a key thing. Hopefully this, this conference is supporting that sharing of experience and understanding. Something that really struck me, um, despite wherever the journalist was in the world, and we had a, a huge range yesterday, from South America to India, from Australia, and all across Europe, that there's a significant psychological impact and an impact on the journalist's well-being that comes along not only just with the legal uh, threat, which is often given a veneer of legitimacy because it's a legal process, but so many of them mentioned how they were also impacted at the same time by smear campaigns and other forms of harassment. They also mentioned that getting legal counsel can be stressful and expensive and challenging, especially if you're not being uh, sued in your own jurisdiction. But beyond the costs of all of that, it was quite staggering to hear some of the damages that uh, these legal cases are being put forward, millions. Um, and I personally cannot imagine what that must be like to uh, receive a, a legal letter and be threatened with 
you know, 13, 14, 15 million pounds worth of damage. Um, and then contrasting that with some of the costs, uh, Steve Canan from Australia, who spoke yesterday, mentioned that um, one of the lawyers that was um, you know, questioning him during his court case in the three days that uh, this lawyer was, was questioning him, earned as much, if not more, than Steve himself had while writing his book, which took him four years. Um, so, you know, that kind of inequality of arms um, and just the unfair playing field, um, I think, is something that has come out pretty strongly from yesterday. Um, today, we've got a series of panels, uh, four more. Um, and we're very excited to have uh, more journalists speaking about a range of issues and particularly looking at that question of the enablers and the lawyers who are involved. And then, you know, how this same system can be used not just against journalists but can be seen as a, a broader lawfare tactic against public interest bodies, including law enforcement agencies, um, as we've seen here in the UK. Uh, the last panels this afternoon are going to look at the impact uh, on journalists and society and see what happens not you know just to the journalists themselves, um, which sometimes we don't see, but sometimes we you know sometimes we do hear about. Um, and then the actual impact on society, which is often the forgotten part of the story. Then lastly, we will be uh, hearing from maybe a hopefully an optimistic point of view, which is what can we do? To change this issue um, and particularly here in the UK and members of our UK anti-slap working group will be launching some proposals um, and suggestions which we are going to open up to public consultation. Um, before all of that I'm really delighted to say that we have uh, another fantastic keynote um, to officially open day two with Professor Dario Milo um, who is a partner at Weber Wetzel Attorneys in Johannesburg and he's a member of the High Legal uh, Panel of Legal Experts. So he will be uh, using his keynote to talk about the legal responses to slaps and um, using the common law to slap back. So uh, delighted he will be joining us just shortly um, to give the official open to day two. If you miss anything again from day one, please do come to our website. Everything will be there. Thank you.
Hi, Dario. Uh, just to let you know that you're live. You are live. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm privileged to be addressing you today from South Africa, where I practice as a media lawyer. I'd like to express my appreciation uh, also to the Foreign Policy Center and Justice for Journalists for organizing this timely, important, and already highly informative conference. I also address you today as a panel member of the Newberger High Level Panel of Legal Experts on Media Freedom, and I'm grateful to my wonderful colleague, Baroness Helena Kennedy, for her discussion yesterday of the panel's work and for her inspiring address. We will certainly be referencing this conference's work um, in our work. I'm sure that everyone will agree with me that yesterday's panels were riveting, and I'm delighted that this network of lawyers, activists, and journalists has been convened to debate these burning issues because SAPs are indeed one of the burning issues of our times. I'd like to take you through a few case studies from my country, South Africa, which to my mind illustrate a parallel mechanism for dealing with SAPs, particularly in countries that do not yet have the legislative interventions that are needed. And I especially want to encourage those functioning within common law traditions and systems to explore options within their civil procedural law and their substantive law to address the scourge that SLAPs have become, even as they agitate for legislative intervention. And that's why I've titled my address, Using the Common Law to Slap Back. Um, if I may ask for the next slide, please. And the following one, please. Yes, thank you. I start with a story about a president trying to silence his critics, perhaps the quintessential slap. Between 2006 and 2010, a South African politician named Jacob Zuma, who became president in 2009, sued the media and other critics for defamation in 15 cases. He sued eight newspapers, a radio station, two cartoonists, a columnist, op-ed writers, journalists, and an artist in an art gallery. Some of the publications that he complained about are on the slide that you see before you, um, together with one of the 15 writs to give you a flavor for the kinds of cases that were involved. At one stage, the total amount of claims in these cases exceeded 65 million rand, which is about 3 million pounds at today's exchange rate. Considering that the most defamation plaintiffs get in South African cases, generally speaking, even where very serious allegations are made uh, to a wide audience is about 200,000 Rand or 10,000 pounds, our thin-skinned president was valuing his reputation very highly indeed. And what it meant for the defendants in these cases is that they would face years of litigation and massive legal costs to defend themselves. The claims were generally not about factual statements, but critical comments and opinions, satire that were expressed, such as the column that you have on the slide, which criticized Zuma's culture defense in his rape trial. He was ultimately acquitted of rape. So these were clearly lawsuits in intended by Zuma to intimidate the media. He left the claims hanging over the heads of his targets for years and had no real intention to litigate, which would have required him to give evidence in the witness box and to be very severely cross-examined on his conduct. So Zuma's strategy, in my opinion, was to silence his critics and chill speech as he ramped up his political campaign to unseat then President Thabo Mbeki and ultimately became the president, as you know, of, of the country.
But he never cared about actually getting his day in court because slaps, which these cases are prime examples of, are all about bullying and intimidating, inflicting litigation, monetary and emotional pain and signaling to others that they dare not follow suit. This slap strategy was going well until the brave cartoonist Zapiro, backed by the newspaper publication who published his cartoon and who funded his legal fees, called the president's bluff and dragged him into court in his own defamation case because by then he was the country's president. I was privileged to represent Zapiro in the case and we chose a case um, that would ensure in our mind that Zuma's slap strategy would backfire to use the word of Charlie Holt yesterday, who incidentally is a great colleague of mine on the expert group advising the EU Commission on their anti-slap policy. Um, and of course, the, the anti-slap strategy that we adopted in that Zapiro case was widely publicized, which is an essential element when one fights slaps, in my view. If we can move to the next slide, you'll see the cartoon that we chose to call the president's bluff on. The case itself, and it is a graphic depiction, uh, this was one of the 15, and this was a cartoon named The Rape of Justice. It was probably the most infamous of the 15 claims brought by the former president, though he sued against the artist for the Lenin parody that you saw up on the screen a bit earlier, came a close second. On a very South African note, I should pause to explain the shower head, which Zapiro affixed to Zuma's head in this cartoon, and indeed in all uh, of his cartoons, his later cartoons, depicting Jacob Zuma. It was done after Zuma testified, as, as many of you may remember, in his rape trial, that he had consensual sex with the complainant. And although he knew she was HIV positive, he took a shower after intercourse to ensure he would not contract HIV. After that startling admission in his rape trial, Zapira invariably depicted Zuma with this shower head to show what a morally and intellectually bankrupt president the cartoonist believed he was. So the Rape of Justice cartoon created in 2008 has the following context. This was the time when Zuma and his allies waged a political campaign to ensure that the corruption charges against Zuma were dropped. And in parallel, in the corruption case, his legal team expressly adopted the Stalingrad strategy, saying in court that they intended to fight the charges against Zuma like the Battle of Stalingrad, burning house to house. And that's a direct quote. So the political and Stalingrad legal strategy succeeded. It was only this year, 2021, that Zuma appeared in court on these charges once the court had ordered that they be reinstated after they were dropped by the prosecuting authority some years ago. So Zapiro, the cartoonist criticism in 2008, was classic fair comment that, that the president was, uh, or th then the president in waiting, was abusing the justice system based on the statements made by him and his um, allies and his legal team. Um, and his allies, for instance, had said things like there would be blood on the streets of South Africa if Zuma was pr prosecuted for corruption, uh, and that the judges of our highest court, the Constitutional Court, were counter-revolutionaries. So having sued over that cartoon, one would have expected a wronged litigant who wants to clear his name to act proactively to get to court, but not President Zuma. Instead, in a manner that was not unlike his Stalingrad legal strategy in his corruption case, Zuma took every technical point he could in the lead up to the defamation trial that we dragged him kicking and screaming to. For instance, he had to be compelled by two court orders um, to discover relevant documents. Another stratagem of his was to refuse to admit that the public statements by his allies had been made. And, and so we, when we obtained video evidence of these statements, he again objected, saying uh, they would argue that the case was not ready because the evidence had been submitted late. The climax of the procedural blockade was that on the, the very day that the case was called in court, <clears throat> Zuma unsuccessfully argued that the case had been wrongly enrolled because two different case numbers with one digit differing had inadvertently been used. All of this, as I've said, received massive publicity and civil society was firmly behind the cartoonist, uh, the cartoonist Zapiro. And indeed, as I say, the slap strategy backfired with Zapiro mocking Zuma in other cartoons. If you go to the next slide, you'll see some of them. Um, and indeed, going so far as to call 
calling Zapiro his publicist, uh, calling Zuma Zapiro's publicist. Of course, as we reflect on that cartoon, Zapiro had the luxury of being able to do this as a successful, well-established, internationally renowned and award-winning cartoonist by then, who was backed by his publisher, like Steve Kinane uh, told us about yesterday in his testimonial about his fair game book and, <clears throat> and the Church of Scientology. But others are not so lucky. Freelancers, social activists, community jour journalists, students, non-profit organizations, bloggers, etc. And even big publishers have much tighter legal budgets now. Uh, and litigation is, of course, never a good investment in any event. And as Steve reminded us yesterday, the emotional and physical investment in litigation, even if your fees are paid and you have lawyers or you have lawyers acting pro bono, extracts more than its pound of flesh. I was especially struck by his point yesterday about the opportunity costs of forfeiting other stories as you immerse yourself in defending your case. Because after all, litigation, particularly against an investigative journalist, is a declaration of war. And it's a war the investigative journalist cannot afford to lose. So by design, the slap, such as Zuma's slaps, intimidates those who are slapped from carrying on with future work on the same theme as, as Paul Radu emphasized last night. And I recall an artist in the case I was involved in facing not just a defamation lawsuit, but um, allied physical intimidation, saying to me, although only partly in jest, that he should stop doing political art and rather do artworks of the flora and fauna of the Cape. Back to the Zuma trial. Our anti-slap strategy succeeded. On the eve of the trial in 2012, where there was nowhere left to hide, and Zuma knew he would lose in an embarrassing and very public way, he withdrew his defamation case, as you will see from the next slide, uh, which is the anti-slap victory as depicted by Zapiro in this classic David and Goliath cartoon. What's more, within the next few weeks, Zuma withdrew all his other cases. Of course, he tried to spin it to look like he had done nothing wrong, ironically saying he was doing so in the interest of freedom of speech, but no one was fooled. All of which brings me to how we should deal with slaps in the law, because if anti-slap laws were around in South Africa at the time of Zuma's defamation suing spree, the defendants, of course, would immediately have turned to the courts for swift redress. South Africa's law has moved on since the Zuma defamation cases. Most importantly, uh, on the political scene, Zuma is no longer president. And I might add, in a contemporary footnote to the Rape of Justice cartoon, a decade after his capitulation in that defamation case, Zuma was jailed, albeit very briefly, for deliberately defying an order of the Constitutional Court, which required him to spill the beans on the capture of state by his friends, the Gupta family, during his presidency. And in fact, as the next slide will show, Zuma returned to the Lady Justice theme in depicting this momentous occasion in South Africa's democracy just a few months ago. If ever, a metaphor for the wheels of justice turning slowly. Now, despite the fact that South Africa, in common with other African countries, has no extensive jurisprudence or all legislation on slaps, there have been, as I say, developments. And in fact, this year, our high courts have handed down two important anti-slap cases without any need for legislative intervention. So a critical point I'd like to make today is those who operate in countries who um, are um, working in the common law tradition or who have equivalent civil procedure tools to do so should not wait for legislation to regulate slaps. Of course, it's the case that anti-slap legislation should be passed in all democracies that take freedom of expression seriously. But until they do, litigants should use the common law and civil procedural mechanisms that may be available to them to develop anti-slap legal responses. And of course, law, as we all know, is really only one of the many ingredients needed to successfully oppose slap strategies by the powerful. So these two cases in South Africa, which I'll briefly deal with, uh, have done exactly this. They've acknowledged the phenomenon of slaps under common law so that activists are now able to use the common law to slap back. The first way, and I'll, if I can go to our next slide, that our, the first way that our courts have recognized this is in a less ambitious form to allow punitive costs against the plaintiff after a failed defamation case for bringing it abusively. 
And the case in question also illustrates how SLAPs are used to stifle digital public participation and how its targets need not be activists and journalists, but may well be ordinary citizens, as long as the chilling effect is achieved. Meet on this slide the tweeter who was the subject of a slap by the former head of South Africa's embattled power utility company, who is a controversial figure who has faced criticism in the context of the state capture by the Gupta family of the public utility. He denies any wrongdoing. The tweeter, as you can see from the slide, is a 72-year-old headmistress or principal of a preschool, and she had 141 followers on Twitter. The plaintiff sued for a declaration from the court that what she had said about him was false, an order that she remove the tweets, that she apologized to him, and that she pays him half a million rand, which would likely be more than the average preschool principal's annual salary. What she had done, the principal, is tweeted, you stole so much that I'm so sick of your innocent ramblings. In a reply to a tweet that he had made, that he had published, the plaintiff, professing his innocence. After he sued, she shut down her Twitter account, never to be seen again. The plaintiff spurned her offer to apologize, but took no steps to take the defamation case forward, much like Mr. Zuma's strategy. If we can go to the next slide, the, next, the case eventually got to court, thank you, when the principal secured legal representatives who would take her case on um, a basis that was favorable, um, and, and particularly on a contingency fee basis, which means they don't get paid unless costs are awarded against the plaintiff. Ms. Tanton, the principal argued that because the lawsuit was a slap and had no merit, she should be awarded punitive costs. And she had excellent evidence of the motive of the plaintiff in suing her. He had given a radio interview two days after suing, and I quote from, him, from the interview saying, she needs a big clap so that others can learn that the time for impunity is gone. I must again, from, for the non-South Africans in the audience, translate that clap is Afrikaans for a slap. And a better admission of a slap motive from a plaintiff, I, I venture to suggest, would be very hard to find. A month or so ago, the court held that the plaintiff's case was an abuse of the court process. He was not entitled to any relief, and he had to pay punitive costs, meaning a higher level of costs, of course, than would ordinarily apply. Apparently, he is appealing. Now, while this result is undoubtedly correct, there are obvious disadvantages to only punishing slappers by awarding costs, even punitive costs, at the end of a trial. Most significantly, of course, the defendant has to go through the emotional and financially ruinous process of what will often be a lengthy, all-consuming trial before they are awarded costs. The better way to use anti-slap mechanisms under the common law is to develop a substantive defense in its own right. And this is exactly what happened in the second case decided in February this year, the Western Cape High Court's decision, if we go to the next slide, in the Mineral Sands case, which is a classic case of a battle between a multinational, multinational mining corporation taking on environmental activists. Now, for almost a decade in South Africa, there's been public concern about the activities of the Australian mining corporation, Mineral Commodities, and its various South African companies, including mineral sands. The attempts by the corporations to mine a 22 kilometer stretch of pristine beachland in the Eastern Cape and on the West Coast of South Africa has resulted in debates, community activism and legal challenges. Critics see the potential mining as resulting in the permanent destruction of fauna and flora for the short term and private benefits of titanium money, mining. And of course, what will my political artist, artist have left to paint if the flora, flora and fauna um, of, the, of the Cape are destroyed? Among the voices who participated in the public discourse were three environmental attorneys and three activists. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that from a little uh, sample, they criticized the corporates in books, radio interviews, and in the case of the two attorneys, presented a lecture at the summer school of the University of Cape Town. If you can go to the next slide. The response of the corporates was to bring defamation actions against the six, claiming that its corporate reputation and the reputation of some of its directors had been damaged to the tune of over 14 million rand, which is almost 700,000 pounds 
The social activist, one of the defendants, was sued for 28 different publications, albeit under the umbrella of one writ. My firm took the case on, on a pro bono basis and we pleaded a substantive slap defense, uncharted territory in our law. We argued that the mining company's conduct in bringing these cases amounted to a slap, which should be recognized as a substantive defense under common law, even in the absence of legislation. And we did so because we said the courts have powers and inherent powers, powers to ensure that their processes can't be abused. The allegation that, were, that we made was that the company's cases were brought for the ulterior purpose of chilling criticism. The companies responded, amongst other arguments, that a slap defense couldn't be used because it would have to be created in legislation and couldn't be developed in the common law. Now, I should emphasize that the court did not find on the facts that a slap was made out because this was an argument in principle at a preliminary stage of the case. But the judge, beautifully named Goliath, a good Goliath, in a sweet twist on the biblical story, Goliath upheld the principle that a defense of slap is available as a species of abuse of process in the common law. And if we go to the next slide, and I won't read everything, um, you will see that, for instance, taking the, the bottom half of the slide, Judge Goliath said, litigation of this nature poses a serious threat to the defendant's participation in matters of public importance. Public dialogue and debate on matters of public interest must be protected and encouraged. Any legal action aimed at stifling public discourse and impairing public debates should be encouraged. And the next slide, to the point of my address to you today, she said, in the absence of, of anti-slap legislation, picking it up from the second sentence, courts have limitations to cure the symptoms of slap. This lack of a legal framework could be exploited by corporates and in the process render civil society vulnerable when they embark on pursuing legal challenges and raising legal defenses. This contributes to the success of the slap since such legal challenges and defenses have a draining effect on public purse and participation. However, the interest of justice should not be compromised due to a lacuna or the lack of a legislative framework. So the court's recognition that there is a way our law can guard against slaps is of profound importance to South Africa and to the African continent where there is no developed slap jurisprudence. And it means that if upheld on appeal, because it is being appealed, the slap defense can probably be heard as a separate part of the case before the remainder of the case is heard, which is a far better proposition than having to litigate a case to completion before arguing that it is a slap or that punitive costs must be awarded. And it's a way, of course, of achieving something akin to preliminary hearings on slaps, which we heard about and, of course, which is very popular in um, the United States, in some states in the United States, and which many of you have rightly said uh, yesterday should be a key feature of anti-slap legislation. Next slide, please. And I am coming to a close. I see I've overstayed my welcome slightly, for which I do apologize. As I was saying, the Mineral Sands case is being appealed to our highest court, the Constitutional Court. It'll hear argument on the 17th of February next year. Um, and there's another aspect of that case that I should mention, because what we have brought to the Constitutional Court on behalf of the slappies, not the slappers, is the important question of whether corporations have the right at all to sue for defamation, to sue for damages for defamation. And it's an argument which, though not slap specific, if successful, will also enhance the right to criticize without fear of ruinous damages claims being brought by corporations. I hope I'm able to report in due course that the Constitutional Court has upheld the common law defense of SLAP and the fact that corporations should not have the right to sue for defamation, but more about that in the coming year. Three reflections in closing, if you will permit me. In her excellent book, In Sullivan's Shadow, the US academic Amy Edmondson studies around 40 cases in the years before and after New York Times versus Sullivan, where police officers, public officials, and prominent public figures brought defamation claims, as she puts it, used slap suits to silence speech about civil rights and punish the speakers and those journalists who wrote about them. As Edmondson says, slap plaintiffs rarely win in the US nowadays, but she reminds us that the urge to silence dissent continues and she highlights stats that show government officials in the US asked Google to remove over 15 and a half thousand items from various online platforms 
from 2011 to 2015, citing defamation. Although, although these were not lawsuits and Google did not simply accede to each request, the L in SLAP is sometimes not a lawsuit but a letter with similar deleterious effects on public participation. Sarah Clark, Susan Cocktree and others made the same point yesterday. Secondly, countering the SLAP scourge is too important an exercise to wait for the legislative process to unfold. In parallel to this process, at least in countries where this is possible with some creative lawyering, I urge lawyers and activists to seek to develop the common law to slap back, even as we reinvigorate efforts to deal with slaps and the policy uh, and anti-slap policy at the legislative level. And finally, I would emphasize that slaps should also be seen in the broader context of other areas of law, which continue to oppress, persecute, harass, detain, and even in some countries assassinate truth speakers and truth seekers. And adopting best practice to counter these threats lies at the heart of the work of the high level panel. A good place to start though the tip of the iceberg, but one that I suggest will immensely assist in countering slaps, would be to decriminalize criminal defamation and insult laws. Not least given that as documented in the excellent research conducted by Lady Nancy Jaramillo, slapped but not silenced, 63% of slaps in that study involved criminal charges. I thank you very much for listening and I look forward to our further engagements. It takes a village to fight a slap and I'm very honored to be a resident of this particular anti-slap village. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Oliver Bullo. I think I am now live. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm not there in person. The difficulties of COVID are still sadly with us, um, but I'm really pleased to be chairing this panel, uh, not for publication, how lawyers and reputation managers enable legal intimidation and slaps, which is an issue that is very close to my heart, uh, not least because <laughs> I'm currently being targeted with legal proceedings in two different countries. It was three, now two. Um, and uh, I think probably in common with pretty much everyone else on this panel and probably on most of the other panels, I have received my fair share of extremely 
aggressively phrased letters over the years from people who are paid much more than me to make sure that I don't write about their clients who are paid even more than that. Um, we've got a really great panel here today. Um, and the way we're going to do this is um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then they're going to spend six or seven minutes talking about um, the issue. And then you're going to send in questions via the Q&A app. Please do so um, as you go along at the end. Whenever you think about it, anything that occurs to you, please send it in. And I'll combine the questions you send in with things that I think we should be talking about. And all together, I think we're going to have a pretty fascinating hour and a bit. Um, so uh, our panelists are in order that they're going to be speaking. Franz Wild, um, finance editor, um, experienced and award-winning journalist previously for Bloomberg and now at the Bureau, Bureau, Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, he is their lead on the Enablers Project, which was launched um, in the summer of last year, which investigates how top paid business executive lawyers and political advisors in the UK um, are enabling oligarchs, dictators and criminals around the world. A lot of mainstream reporting has been done on the crimes, abuses and financial misdeeds of malicious foreign states and wealthy individuals, but very little, um, not enough, not nearly enough, has been brought to light about the lawyers, PR advisors, accountants, estate agents and bankers and so on that take care of the details and help them get away with it. Um, so France is going to speak first, followed by Manuel Dahlia, Maltese blogger and freelance journalist, um, uh, started out as, in his own words, a political operative in the Maltese scene and press secretary to the prime minister. Um, since 2013, he's been analysing what's happening in Malta, and I think we can all agree there's quite a lot of, to talk about there. Um, other than that, um, after that, sorry about my pronunciation, perhaps in this, uh, Therese Dakar, advocacy coordinator for the Amabugane Centre, how am I doing, um, for investigative journalism, which means dung beetles. Perhaps she'll talk about why they name themselves after dung beetles. Um, a small team of investigators has done probably greater impact than many, the most groups of investigative journalists in terms of forcing information to the public domain, um, which have contributed to all sorts of changes, including not least the resignation of a president. Not many of us can say that. Um, and then last but very much not least, Nicola Solomon, um, Chief, Chief Executive Society of Authors. I should declare an interest. She's very much helped me in the uh, legal cases that I've been facing. Um, she's a solicitor by trade, um, but joined the Society of Authors um, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, does a lot of work advising authors on how to manage uh, legal problems. So, France, I think we're going to start with you. Um, would you like to kick off and tell us your thoughts on uh, lawyers, reputation managers, and the general enabling industry, why it's such a problem, and what we can do about it? Yeah, thank you, Oliver, um, and thanks for having me here. Um, just very briefly a bit about me, uh, because it'll help you understand kind of what I know and what I don't know. Um, I worked for Bloomberg for over 10 years. I was based in uh, various African countries and uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ivory Coast and South Africa before I moved to London about five years ago. And over the period of my career, I've been sort of drawn more and more towards um, reporting on corruption. And that kind of started in Democratic Republic of Congo, where I started noticing that all these sort of weird mining deals were happening. Um, and it wasn't really entirely clear what was going on behind the scenes. And there's quite a small community of journalists and um, uh, NGOs and other people who are quite interested in making sure that transparency remained a thing. Um, and over the, over, the, over the last 10, 15 years, that's been quite successful, but we've all obviously also faced a lot of um, pushback from the people we're writing about. And I think the best way to illustrate this is kind of an example, really. Um, and that example, m my sort of uh, most vivid example was about two years ago when I was writing an article uh, about a gentleman called uh, Dan Gertler. And he had acquired a, a mineral asset in the Congo. Um, and there were question marks around, well, how did he get this incredibly valuable mineral asset? Um, uh, Dan Gertler is under U.S. sanctions. Um, the U.S. government believes that he has paid $100 million in bribes uh, to Congolese officials, including the former president, uh, Joseph Kabila. Um, that's something he denies. He, he says he's not done anything wrong, but that's um, you know, the, the claims of the U.S. government. So we were obviously curious as to how this individual came about these assets and we wrote an article, sorry, we researched an article about it and amassed quite a lot of new information. 
And then it got to the point of um, going to him and um, kind of asking him about this. And so he did this. Uh, he has a, a PR agency uh, in London. Um, they're called uh, Powers Court, or at least were. And so he approached them and said, well, um, you know, what about this? Um, how, are we missing something? Do we understand things incorrectly? Um, could you help us get to the bottom of this? And instead of the um, press agency responding, we got a, uh, a, a letter from their lawyers, uh, Carter Ruck. A very long letter marked private, confidential, not for publication. And, you know, immediate, uh, probably six, seven pages by memory. I haven't looked at it for a while. But um, there was no attempt to answer any of the questions. And to be clear, the questions were you know, very straight laced questions. I was working for Bloomberg at the time and there's very, in fact, there's no space for innuendo or supposition or anything like that. It's very much fact based. Um, so we got this letter and all of it was basically um, alleging that we were um, uh, sort of out to get him. We're not interested in the truth. We had a vendetta, is that sort of stuff. Um, and, and then also basically questioning well, where did our information actually come from? Um, as most of you know, it's not always safe to kind of talk about your sources. Um, and particularly if, you, if some of your sources uh, either are or interact with a place like the Congo, where the rule of law is, is maybe not quite the gold standard, you might understand that it's not always safe to do that. So um, to cut a long story short, this turned into quite a long back and forth of legal letters. Um, w with our side kind of saying, well, we stand by our reporting. These are the questions. And can we engage with the questions, please? And the other side saying, well, no. You need to tell us where your information is from. And by the way, we think this is it. Um, and this is why your information is, is wrong but never dealing with the actual substance of what we're trying to write about. Always dealing with, well, we believe that this is your source, and your source isn't credible for this reason. And what this basically turned into is a process of about a year long uh, before we could actually get the article out. And thankfully, I, I was working for Bloomberg, which is an incredibly well-resourced organization, and you know, stands behind its journalists and is able to kind of see this through and also has um, extremely experienced and um, uh, able lawyers who could assist us. So in the end, the information got out there. Um, but what, it, what happened was um, there was the kind of something that started out as being a sort of, uh, essentially what the press is, is we're kind of representatives of um, you know, the people, everyone serves their role in society. Well, w our role is to get information for other people who are too busy baking bread or making clothes or whatever. Um, so, you know, we, we do represent the public. And um, so this, this conversation that was meant to be in the interests of the public, in the public interest, was kind of forced into the private sphere. Um, this may sound like a sort of extreme example, but what's great about a place like Bloomberg is walking around the newsroom there, you bump into all sorts of journalists and also at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism where I am now, all the people there are always working on stories that are trying to expose wrongdoing by sort of rich and powerful um, people and corporations. And so this is not an isolated incident. This is par for the course. And, you know, traditionally you kind of always hear, oh, well, you've got to be careful about libel. You've got to be careful about defaming people. Well, nowadays it's, it's a lot broader than that. It's turned into, well, you've got to be careful about um, not breaching their data, um, uh, sorry, not violating the Data Protection Act. You've got to be um, careful about not violating their privacy. Um, you know, th there's a whole gamut of things that you've got to um, be careful about. Um, so th that, that's the experience. Um, th just to emphasize, this is a live case. Um, next month, Bloomberg, in a case that I've got nothing to do with, is in the Supreme Court 
arguing a case about um, uh, uh, privacy and at what point uh, a journalist has the right to write about someone who's under investigation. At the moment, the latest um, Court of Appeals judgment suggests that you can't write about an individual if, um, if they're under investigation, unless they're someone like sort of Boris Johnson. But there's a whole sort of tier two or tier three uh, layer of people, individuals, who need to be held to account, um, who, where, where transparency and accountability are essential. And it, and that doesn't happen if journalists aren't able to write about them. Um, I'd like to leave it there and um, have some questions later on. Uh, we can't hear you, Oliver. Sorry, that was me muting myself to prevent me disturbing anyone with my chat, which I did rather better than I'd anticipated. Sorry. Um, you're on mute, after all, being the words of the year. Um, Manuel, um, yes, we're now going to have um, you talking about the situation that you have faced in Malta, please. Thank you, and thank you, Justice for Journalists Foundation, and thank you, Foreign Policy Centre, for this important and timely discussion. I will share with you my personal experience of slap suits, or at least a sample of them, to try to throw light on what happens when a self-publishing blogger working on their own must be prepared to face when covering stories of financial crime and the organizations that perpetrate it. My name is Manuel Delia, and most of my work is published on a near daily basis on my blog. It used to be something I did on the side, but it became a full-time job the day a far better journalist was killed by a car bomb in Malta in October 2017. I resolved to help fill the void she left, not by journalism of the same quality, that would have been impossible for a novice like me, but at least with commentary and noise. Six months later, I published a story about a bank operating in Malta that had only been set up four years earlier. I had solid information, doubly confirmed, that Maltese investigators had been tipped off about previous investigations by other agencies into the conduct of the owner of this bank. And I published that report in April 2018. I was called in by a firm of Maltese lawyers and told to retract the story and expunge it from the record, or I would face a lawsuit in the UK, where the same Bulgarian born owner had other business. I had written in Malta about a Maltese bank operating in Malta, but I was threatened with a lawsuit in the UK. As I hesitated for a few days, I got a call from one of these lawyers. He may have meant this as a friendly aside, but he told me his client was serious about filing in the UK, and if he did, I wouldn't have to look for a defense team. I would better look for a cliff high enough to jump off. I gave in. I had only been at this for six months and this bank was a sideshow in comparison with reporting about Daphne Carmona Valicia's case. But just six months later, Maltese regulators froze the bank's activities. Thousands of people whose only money in the world was trapped inside the bank suffered severe hardship for months before their money was released. I wrote an apology on my blog to all those people. Had I had the courage to stick to my April story, they could have been warned and banned elsewhere. But I had lost my nerve and they suffered as a result. More than a year later, longer than the limit allowed by Moti's law, the bank's owner sued me in Bulgaria. As evidence about the defamation, he suffered, he produced his girlfriend, who said my piece worried her about her man. Presumably the fact that his bank was shut down and was fined 3 million euro for systemic anti-money laundering failures did not worry her quite so much. The European Centre for Press and Media Freedom funded my defence, but I lost the case and I have since appealed. In May 2019, together with my co-authors, John Sweeney and Carlo Bonini, I was wrapping up a book about Daphne Caruana Galicia's murder and our Hercule Poirot-like list of suspects of possible perpetrators. I sent summaries of our findings to the Prime Minister of the time, Joseph Muscat, his wife, his closest advisor, and two of his ministers, inviting them to send in their responses to be included in the publication. They did not reply directly, hiring jointly instead the UK law firm Carter Rack, who sent a flowery cease and desist. That letter ensured no publisher in the UK or elsewhere would touch our book. 
If you could write in a book that you suspected a prime minister in office of corruption, which could be a motive for a murder, the publishers asked us, why are they still in office? How are they not arrested? A fair question, except this was exactly why Daphne had been murdered. Luckily enough, we found a Maltese publisher mad enough to print the book and the Justice for Journalists Foundation who funded the project. A month later, Joseph Muscat and his government collapsed. I am not claiming causality, but the collapse of Joseph Muscat meant that a UK publisher was then happy to publish the book internationally. That's the chilling and toying effect in action. While writing to Joseph Muscat et al, inviting them to send their comments, I also wrote to one Jorgen Fennec, sending him direct questions that heavily implied suspicion of his involvement in the murder. I believe that was the first time, if not the only time, he was directly confronted by a journalist about the killing of Daphne Caruana Galizia. He hired a local to say what of hellfire should be considered to publish, which we proceeded to ignore. Three weeks after the publication of the book, Jorgen Fennec was arrested, charged with murder, and he is still detained awaiting trial. Again, I do not, do not imply causality, but I rather suspect he does. The noise from the local lawyers was just advanced artillery. Much later, I would learn, Jorgen Fennec consulted ACK Media Law in the UK and drew up a strategy to silence journalists reporting on him, his business, his past and his present. His lawyers in the UK identified me as an easy target, not backed by a corporate structure and clearly unable to afford the defence. The lawyers advised Jorgen Fennec to use the UK courts to claim from me any risk of increased cost of borrowing from UK banks to his businesses. The plan was to send me a bill for over 70 million pounds. That would have been my last coffee. From prison, he did not follow through. Instead, he uses his local lawyers to harass me, file personalist court complaints that single me out, and recently a lawsuit claiming a denied right of reply. His lawyers are prepared to do all this and more for their client of apparently inexhaustible resources. They have been charged with attempting to bribe another journalist to secure good coverage for Jorgen Fennec. They deny any wrongdoing. One final remark on enabling lawyers. These firms enable the crooks paid from their huge pockets, some of which we often rightly suspect is made up of proceeds of crime. But lawyers also enable us. My experience is also of lawyers who work for no charge, reading my stuff to warn me against more obvious pitfalls, and defending me in court when the slaps smack. They remind me that even in the anarchy that we live in, some light shines bright. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good to hear you talking about the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom, which is doing a lot of good work helping journalists out. Um, the Rory Peck Trust as well, obviously, which is also helping people. It does seem that there's this core problem of um, businessmen, politicians who are very wealthy and don't really care whether they win or lose a defamation case, um, and, and they don't really care whether they have costs to pay at the end of it. The issue is more uh, just making sure that you get tied up in paperwork forever, as France was um, at Bloomberg, though admittedly it must be nice to have Mike Bloomberg as your um, backup. Um, Jorais, would you like to talk about your experience in South Africa and how your team has faced and dealt with this particular problem? Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you to the organizers as well for giving us this opportunity to speak about our experiences. I'm quite struck as I'm listening to uh, Franz and Manuel about the parallels, even though you know we're a continent away on a completely separate continent. But um, to kick off, I'd like to give a bit of context about Amabungane. Uh, we are a non-profit investigative journalism unit based in South Africa. Very importantly, we have no ties to the UK. Uh, that includes we don't have offices, we don't have any employees who work in the UK, we don't investigate UK-based stories. Um, we're quite an, a small organization, there's 12 of us, and some would say that we do punch above our weight. Uh, we've produced some award-winning uh, journalism stories that have investigated um, corporates uh, and corporate wrongdoing, as well as uh, corruption and malfeasance in the highest levels of government. Um, we have in the past investigated alleged corporate malfeasance by a South African-based group of companies. 
um, and I'm not going to say their name, I'm just going to call them the group. Uh, they were founded by a local business person who for these purposes I'll call the founder. Um, we reported on the company several times over uh, the years, but in 2020 we became aware of some claims that the South African operations of this company had been um, starved of capital in order to fund offshore interests. And in addition, the International Consortium of Journalists, or ICIJ, provided us with information that um, uh, well, provided us with leaked financial records that formed part of the FinCEN files. Um, and they concerned the group and the founder. Um, the record showed that Barclays Bank had in 2015 submitted a suspicious activity report in relation to the group and the founder. Uh, about these concerned the character of financial flows within the uh, founder's empire. The ICIJ awesome. emphasized that um, such reports were not proof of wrongdoing. Um, so our awesome. journalist, Mike Reddy, sent questions to the founder, uh, setting out the allegations and requesting comment. Um, and uh, what we got in response was very unexpected. Uh, instead of answering the question, uh, we got a, law a letter from a law firm based in the UK. I'm not going to name the firm, I'm just going to call it UK Firm. Um, they sent a legal missive alleging that Amabungane was part of a conspiracy or being used by others as part of a conspiracy to discredit the group and the founder and demanded that we account for how we came into possession of the information. Um, they said that publication in the UK was sufficient to ground jurisdiction and that they would not hesitate to seek the intervention of the court if the article made use of improperly obtained confidential information, contravened UK or EU data protection law, or defamed their client, which is exactly what France mentioned, ticking all the boxes that now tend to get, get ticked. This was very bizarre to us. As mentioned, we're online publication, but we don't have any uh, UK connections. Why would they uh, send uh, English solicitors to threaten us with legal action in the UK? Well, the answer is, of course, is why we're all here. This was obviously a slap threat. Um, we know that UK litigation is very expensive, but in particular in South Africa, our currency is very weak against the pound. So there was an additional sting of that. Um, and we also know that the UK's laws um, in this respect may be, uh, let's call them somewhat retrograde. Uh, South Africa has got very uh, robust constitutional protections for media freedom. Um, and the, the issues like defamation involve a very careful balancing of rights. You would have heard Dario's uh, presentation earlier. The highest courts in the land have affirmed these principles. So we feel comfortable publishing in South Africa, but the UK is a completely different terrain. So when we looked at this, we said, you know, even the costs of successfully defending um, a, a case like this and getting a favorable cost order in, in our getting a favorable cost favorable cost order would still not be enough. We would still face, we would still be very much out of pocket. Um, but we were concerned, uh, we were not daunted, and we decided to stand by our reporting. Uh, we didn't want to back down. So the first thing we did is we mustered as many resources that we could. Uh, we are very grateful to have received uh, guidance without charge from the Foreign Policy Center from the International Lawyers Project and from a London-based QC who provided an overview um, of our concerns. Um, and then we had a very another very important arrow in our quiver. We had the benefit of the expertise of leading, leading South African media law expert, Dr. Dario Milo, who you heard from this morning. And he's also very well versed in UK law. And so we, uh, through Weber Wenzel, which is Dario's, the firm which, is, which Dario is with, um, and I also want to mention that Weber Wenzel has an alliance with Linklaters, which is reflected on the letterhead, and Linklaters also uh, made some offers of pro bono assistance. So through Weber Wenzel, we engaged with the UK firm, uh, basically denying that we had contravened any laws, we denied that jurisdiction had been established, and we said we'd acted reasonably by balancing the public interest against um, the founders' you know, alleged corporate de-interests. Um, in in our reporting. Um, the UK firm asserted that the jurisdiction would be established due to the proximate cause of harm arising in London due to the presence of Barclays Bank being there, which is where the suspicious activity report uh, was generated. 
Um, it also, again, adding another kind of, you know, layer to the to the issues that they wish to bring. Um, alleged we had engaged in criminal activity and they um, encouraged us to distance ourselves from the ICIJ, basically insinuating that if action was going to be taken against the ICIJ um, for dealing with these leaked reports, that we would be lumped in and, and face liability as well. They also told us that they were going to be briefing a South African based uh, law firm, which I'll call SA firm, uh, to address South African law. So our response to this on our advice of our attorneys was actually to publish. Um, we published the first part in the two part series on our own website and through another financial publication called the Financial Mail. Um, and this pr prompted a change in tack. The Financial Mail got now got a letter from the um, uh, SA attorneys, basically saying that the group and the founder should have been offered an additional right of reply, reply prior to the reprinting of Amabungani's article, which is of course absurd. But they also descended into personal attacks. Um, they, they attacked our journalist, Micah, using statements on his social media accounts to draw unsubstantiated and incorrect inferences and basically calling his character into question. Um, at the same time, the UK firm had been directing thinly veiled threats against the ICIJ, suggesting that it was in collaboration with Amabungane, who was driving, and I quote, a hostile agenda, agenda against the founder and the group. Very sinister, apparently. Um, we've then published the second part in the series, and then it took a further turn into the absurd. The South African lawyers demand that Reddy confirm whether he'd been in possession of an anonymous character assassination internet book that had been peddled across the media. We don't know what this book is about, but they were trying to allege something else, which we don't know. We hadn't spoken to that. We just left it at that. Um, and that was the last in the correspondence for quite a while until the Foreign Policy Center asked us to uh, write an article about these experiences for World uh, uh, Press Freedom Day, which, as you know, is the 3rd of May. Um, so we wrote to the UK firm telling them that we intended to publish this article containing some of the allegations and um, basically in saying that the article would, would basically reflect that, uh, that this was a slap threat and an attempted slap against us. UK firm responded very promptly, saying this is for our own interests. We are responding on our own uh, in respect of our own interests. They said that we took a one-sided approach and that very ominously it's for the judiciary to decide whether any claim succeeded or not. This is uh, this is an interesting point. They noted with academic interest that their correspondence could not be a slap because the purpose of a slap is to deter publication and because neither Amabungane nor the ICIJ was deterred, uh, this couldn't potentially be a slap and therefore our argument was a theoretical abstract, which is very interesting. Um, responding on behalf of their clients, they took the same threatening tone, saying that we shouldn't make the mistake of believing that um, legal action would, would not be pursued. And then they said our letter was then forwarded to the essay firm. From the essay firm, we received a 20 page letter um, that letter had obviously been typed up and ready to, they were ready to hit send the moment they heard from us again about this matter. And uh, it set out the complaints of their clients in almost excruciating detail, going almost line by line through Reddy's article and saying they added again another additional potential charge. They said we had breached South Africa's press code, so we could then be potentially hauled before the press council. Interestingly, the, direction, the director of communications responded um, as well, um, basically say, giving a response to the questions and the, about the alleged slap and saying that this needs to be included in the article in full. So on the one hand, they were threatening us in the UK and South Africa. And then on the other hand, they were exercising the right of reply, which was also unusual. But by this time, we had sunk so many resources into the matter, not just the legal fees to Weber Wenzel, but the time of journalist, our man uh, journalist Micah Reddy, our managing partners who were involved in every step of the legal um, aspects, as well as mine in writing the article and having it reviewed, that it just wasn't sustainable um, for us, even just based on the threat of South African litigation, to proceed um, with publishing. So out of abundance of caution, we put the article in ice and it's not been published. So the outcome of this is while we didn't bow to the initial slap threat, 
um, when we tried to talk about that slap, the doubling down um, by the founder of the group was enough to overwhelm our resources. And uh, we, we've already, as I mentioned, we're very small and it, it wasn't feasible for us to go through this process again. Um, so I just wanna say that we're very grateful for the guidance offered by um, many people all over the world. Um, but the unfortunate situation is nothing short of an offer of legal representation in the UK would be enough to give us a complete sense of security in, in publishing on this issue. And as we know, those situations that there aren't enough um, resources such as legal NGOs and lawyers willing and able to work pro bono on this. Um, so it is a very serious situation and we hope that the law will be amended um, making it more difficult for uh, uh, law firms in the UK to bring spurious um, uh, slap threats or um, assist in recovering the costs, um, as Dario said, almost on a punitive basis to make sure that the costs really are recouped. Um, without that, many, many critical voices will be silenced. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that's obviously being someone from Britain and in Britain, an astonishingly troubling thing to hear. I've heard other stories from friends who work in in um, outside the UK who have faced these kind of issues, but that's a particularly grim one. I can only apologise on behalf of my country. Really, weirdly, the situation used to actually be worse before 2013. Hard though that is to believe. Um, and yet, um, it's still uh, the, the reform passed then is still very far from ideal. Um, now, turning to the UK, um, uh, we've got Nicola Solomon. Um, this is, I suppose, an issue we often think about. It's largely being confined to affecting journalists, but of course it affects anyone who writes things down or indeed speaks publicly about people with wealth and power who don't want their secrets to be revealed. So Nicola, would you like to talk about how this affects your work at the Society of Authors? Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be here. And thank you for, to the other speakers and uh, the chilling things that they've told us, all of which is sadly not a surprise in this country. Perhaps I should start by saying something about the Society of Authors so you know the background. The Society of Authors is the UK's trade union for writers. We've got around 11,700 members. And we advise them in all sorts of ways. So we do lobbying on their behalf, for example, for the Defamation Act and others. We, um, we do events and educate them. But we also offer a service whereby we vet their contracts at a very early stage. We'll give advice at any stage, not like poor Oliver once something's happened, but right from the beginning. And because of that, we see well over a thousand publishing contracts a year and the publishing contracts we see add a great deal to the problems that we see that journalists see here um, for various reasons and it's to do with the chilling effects that we've talked about. One of the things that we need to think about is something that Manuel said. He said that Carter Rock's letter stopped any publishers touching his book. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons it's even worse for books than for journalism is once you publish an art, a journalistic article, it's out there, it's done, it's mostly these days on the internet, it's actually quite easy to take down. But if a book contains something in it, which is considered defamatory, even if it's only one sentence about one person in a whole book, and you have to scrap the whole print run, then that can be fantastically even more expensive than the lawsuits. So people are very concerned about printing, even in these days, of much more short run printing than they would be. And that makes them even more cautious, which is, of course, not good for public participation and not good for the kind of work of investigative work that people want to do and we in contracts see things from the beginning which make it very much more difficult for authors the first is that most contracts we see will contain indemnity clauses which means that the author will indemnify the publisher against anything any legal action they have against them but any claims that are made whether or not those claims have any merit at all and that means that an author has to be really really careful because not only do you have to cover yourself as we've seen against justified claims but against unjustified claims as well 
and many authors are not represented by agents and certainly don't have lawyers on their publishing contracts. So publishing contracts are incredibly in publishers' favours. If we do see those, and if we see them on something which is likely to have, you know, is being published in fact because it's giving a revelation about somebody, we will suggest to authors that they ask for reverse indemnity, that the publisher, who after all is going to get most of the money, indemnifies them or that at least the claims language is taken out. But very often that doesn't happen and that has a huge chilling effect. Another thing that is complicated is about insurance. Clearly, it's usually the publishers who are insured, not the authors. If we see these kind of contracts, we will ask that the, public, that the author is added as insured on the publisher's contract. But if that happens, and then as we see in slap cases, that a claim is taken just against the author, even if they're named insured on a publisher's policy, if the publisher is not sued as well, then that author will not have the protection of that insurance policy, which means that, in, that at the moment, authors would be advised to take out their own insurance policies, but that's ridiculously expensive. We know from research that we did in 2018 that the median income of a full-time professional writer is around £10,500. And the average earnings that an author gets from a book, any book, is about £6,000. If that's the case, you're not going to take out insurance. You just can't afford to do so, particularly because if you're taking out insurers on a, insurance on a one-by-one -one basis, it's really expensive. It's much, more, much cheaper for insurers if they're doing the spread betting for publishers, where there are very few claims. So at the moment, we don't have a situation where authors can get insurance. As we've heard, it's very hard to get legal advice. And, um, and authors are looking at, is it worth the trouble and the massive time it takes to defend something? Or are they going to do what Manuel or Jerez said that they have to do in the end? As they say, it's not sustainable to proceed. We've got an abundance of caution, said Jerez. Oliver talked about aggressively phrased letters from people paid more than me, which I think sums it up beautifully. And, and, and Manuel talks again about the chilling effect. And really, there is no way around it. And the chilling effect on authors is perhaps even more, which is why books are often safer, because publishers also won't touch them. And we need to get publishers who, if they want books with revelations that they they've got the right to rely on proper checking by their authors but they should be asking for indemnities that are narrower and they should be taking on a lot more of the risk and they should be prepared to stand by their authors because otherwise we really don't have the way for things to be published if we know that people are going to take claims against them and I'm just before I finish going to put on a different hat and say something slightly different around the things people have said about UK law. Because in one of my other roles, as um, Oliver said, I was a lawyer before I went to Society of Authors. I'm still a lawyer. And I sit as a judge in the county courts. I don't do defamation claims, but I'm a deputy district judge. And I see how judges apply the law right the way across all sorts of claims. And we might be thinking not so much about asking for changes of law, but asking for lawyers and for judges to be trained to use the law that we have in the way that we're meant to use it. When the civil procedure rules were changed, we started by having an overriding objective. That's part one of the civil procedure rules. And it says that there are new procedural code. They have an overriding of ob objective in enabling a court to deal with cases justly and at proportionate cost. And they set out what justly and proportionate costs includes. And one of those, A, Literally, A of our Civil Procedure Code says that we have to ensure that the parties are on an equal footing and can, can, can participate fully in proceedings and that parties and witnesses can give their best evidence. It says we have to save expense. It says we have to deal with cases in ways which are proportionate to the amount of money involved, the importance of the case, the complexity of the issues and the financial position of each party. And we have to ensure that that cases are dealt with expeditiously and fairly. So judges are subject to an overriding objective to make sure that cases like these, people do have the right 
to be treated fairly in and we do need to look at their financial position and in my view this really isn't happening so perhaps we before we look at changes of law we should be looking at judicial training we should be looking at the fact that when cases are to be struck struck out and at the moment you can only strike out a case if there's no real prospect of success but no real prospect of success is defined now as something that is more than fanciful is a prospect of success. We ought to be getting judges to be more robust about striking out cases at an early stage when it is clear to them from a common sense point of view that those cases are only being brought to stop people speaking. We should not be allowing parties with a massive amount of money to to stop, to, to make people stop taking their cases because it's not sustainable to proceed. That's not, the overriding objective tells us as judges that we shouldn't allow that. And I think that before we start looking at changing the law, we should start maybe about looking at judicial training and a bit of protesting about whether the law is being applied as the overriding objective said it should have been. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, and uh, thank you everyone for all of your thoughts. That was really interesting. We've got about half an hour now to chat. Um, if you watching or listening have got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, we've got a couple of coming already, the more the merrier, as far as I look at it. Um, I'm going to start off, though, by asking, um, first of all, Franz, to talk about what happens when a letter arrives. Um, I mean, and it happens to me, um, but I'm wondering, you know, to you, when, if you receive, if you're about to publish something, if you've asked for comment from someone, um, and a letter arrives from one of these many law firms, which we appear to be not naming, um, but, you know, Carter Ruck has been named, but as we all know, there are plenty of others. I once had a slightly awkward moment at a law firm in a lift when I was going up and realised that one of the people in the lift was the mother of someone at my son's nursery. And um, we never actually mentioned that she was the enemy. But there you go. Um, she'd always been perfectly friendly. So, Franz, what happens when um, uh, you receive a letter? What's your response? And how does the newsroom and the, and the team respond? Um, well, before, before I answer that, I actually had a very similar situation with um, a parent of um, someone at my son's nursery as well. Uh, it wasn't a lawyer. It was someone I was wrote, writing about. I had no idea. That, they, <laughs> that their child was at my son's nursery. Um, so uh, usually, I mean, also often, so initially I, as the reporter or journalist, I send out the, the, the questions. And then sometimes the more proactive lawyers will um, respond to me and copy in our lawyer um, and often copy in the most senior person at the organization I mean, usually not, uh, in Bloomberg's case, not Michael Bloomberg, but possibly the editor-in-chief. And you do get some comical situations where they, they don't actually know the email address, so they just put anything in. It just sort of sounds ominous. Um, but basically, they'll, so they, they try and make, they try and punch this up into a big, big thing. Um, you then immediately sort of go uh, and and speak so it gets shared internally to um, sort of lawyers and senior editors and everyone has a look at it and then you kind of uh, huddle around and go okay well um, what are we actually dealing with how serious is this are they actually addressing our questions are they actually giving any information that has an impact on the actual story and if that is the case, then obviously we, we take that very seriously and we go away and either do more reporting or go, okay, well, these are aspects we can't actually write about. Um, but then often if it is on, it, depending on, and, and this is where the kind of a judgment call comes in. So uh, sometimes the decision will be made, well, we need a legal response, so we'll have a lawyer sort of write back. In other cases, we'll just say, okay, let's just have the journalist write back. Which, which I actually think is, is preferable because ultimately, you know, this is a journalistic enterprise. This, uh, this is not, the aim of the game isn't to kind of have lawyers kind of hashing it out. The aim of the game is to, to pursue something that's in the public interest. And, and the way you do that is by, by having a non-legal uh, discourse. Um, Manuel, so as, for someone who, who doesn't have the, the backup of, 
of in-house lawyers and so on. How, how does it work with you then? If you if you receive your 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 email goes ping, and you've received a letter with one of these scary letterheads, um, you know how do you respond? What's your process? Uh, well, you, you have to remember that the, it, it, the first thing that usually follows is a conversation with my wife, because any risk, any liability risk, is is for someone like me a completely personal affair. Um, I write it by own name. It's not just that I'm not backed up by a structure. I'm not fronted by a structure. There's no company that sort of keeps a separation between what, who, who I am and what I own and the risk that I'm facing. Um, so so it, it, it can get a bit hairy. The, the experience was a bit different when I was writing the book because I was writing it with two very experienced journalists. One um, spent many years facing um, this sort of thing when he worked at the BBC and the other one worked at La Repubblica in Italy. And, and when we got, you know, a, a, an aggressive letter from a UK law firm, um, I, I, I sort of felt the confidence um, rubbed off from them. That they sort of said, this is exactly what you'd expect when you're accusing someone who has the means to respond in this way of the sort of things that we're accusing them. Um, so, so, so I, I think really uh, the answer to your question is it, it, it's, it's trying not to um, allow the text to overwhelm you, try to see through uh, this, the second question I ask myself, am, am I wrong? Is, is, is my journalism wrong here? Um, are they right? So, so I really need to take into account um, what they're saying. But normally if they're right, um, they can just say so. And that's the end of the story. They're hiring big uh, lawyers like that to scare you off because they aren't. Um, I, I'll, I'll just mention something which was not my direct experience, but which I which I witnessed. The week Daphne Caruana Galicia was killed, um, the owner of another bank on, on which she reported a lot sent these legal letters from a, a Washington law firm uh, to all newsrooms in Malta who had covered the story after Daphne broke the story. And um, when they worked out the simple calculus of defending the case, even the largest news organization in Malta thought it made sense to just pull the story down rather than take the risk. Um, that, that was tragic, but it, it, it was even worse when you realize, when I realized a couple of months later, it was my story. Uh, that the same banker did not challenge Daphne Caruana Galizia in the same way. He simply opened a lawsuit in Arizona, claiming $40 million of her. She never found out about it. She was killed before she was notified of this. But you see there that it, it is not just because of the very extreme situation that I am in, because I write on my own. In a country like Malta, which is a country where billions of euros flow, and there are 31 banks, only three operate locally. The rest are bankers for the world. And the largest news organization, Times of Malta, would not be able to defend itself from a lawsuit like this. So the, the, the risk here is really of overwhelming all journalism in Malta. And there's at least one episode I can think of where the perpetrator of this managed. Great, thank you, Manuel. Well, I'd, I'd just like to compare, um, there's a couple of questions coming, which I'm going to come to in a second, but I thought before we get to that, I'd just like to compare the experience of, of South Africa with a constitutional right to freedom of speech and, and the UK without that. Um, just wondering in, how in your, how you prepare a story for publication, Therese, if we could ask you first, what, what kind of checks do you have to do to a story before publication? And then Nicola, if we could come to you afterwards to see how that compares to the UK. I'm just, just interested in, in terms of what you would normally do when you expect something to only have resonance in South Africa. You know, what, what do you need to do? Oh, hang on, I think you might be like me on mute, Therese. Sorry. Um, yes, I was just saying that we're quite rigorous internally uh, when it comes to preparation of stories. Um, so we have a managing partner with a lot of, uh, you know, over 30 years of experience and um, experience kind of batting off legal threats as well. So um, that there's an internal process of, uh, you know, the journalist writing, it goes through edits. There's, and I think that's a particular strength that we have is that we're very careful um, when we're doing the preparation of our stories. 
with that said we don't submit every story and you know they can be quite hard hitting stories as well um as we said you know targeting uh, some of the powerful political and, and corporate elites uh, but we don't submit every story to for for legal publication we've uh, now only recently just established a bit of a, a kitty for for pre-publication review but this was definitely not some a regular process it's something that we've had to do in, in response to a number of um, legal letters coming in, but more on the South African side. Uh, but in, in, in doing so, we're actually quite confident in, in defending ourselves. We, we've, as you would have seen by our publication, uh, we don't back down, you know, because we know that the judiciary has in the past really recognized uh, that balancing aspect in relation to freedom of expression. Um, so we 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 go we go we approach it with a, quite a bit of, of confidence, and you know if it's really something of concern, we we've, we've got um, Dario that we we refer to and and can get that uh, kind of um, e extra level of confidence. But I think in this particular circumstance that I described, um, the the UK element really threw um, uh, us into a bit of disarray because we were very on very unfamiliar terrain. And so um, this, that was a unique experience. But even you know, later today, we've got you know a, a meeting about a, another South African um, a lawyer coming to us and saying some outrageous things. So um, we we just confident in, in that respect. But definitely, the the international element is something that we're not um, confident about, and also it underscores our vulnerability. Um, in in that respect, when you when you're dealing with international lawyers, yeah, um, it's sadly that the, the case is rather different. I had a I actually wrote an article about a book that hadn't been able to be published because it was being sued by lawyers, and then the same lawyers then approached the public the newspaper. So the the article about the fact that the book couldn't be published couldn't be published, <laughs> um, which just says it all really for me. Anyway, uh, Nicola, the, the situation in the, in the UK, what, what, do, what do you have to do before publication, um, you know, to try and insure yourself? Obviously, there's a sort of insurance, very expensive insurance post publication. But, you know, what's the, you know, publication process? You know, I mean, all of this sounds so, a little bit like a sort of employment process for lawyers, really. But anyway, what's the pre-publication process? I mean, I imagine it isn't so different because we would expect everybody to rigorously check their stories and rigorously make sure that they've got their sources lined up and that they know what they're doing. I think, though, the difference in the UK might be that there is a bigger awareness of the people who are likely to sue and that actually then you might take even more care and your publishers might take the view that they won't take it forward if that's likely to be a risk whether or not uh, you can prove what you've said unless you know you can really show a lot of public interest and one of the things that's complex in books as opposed to articles is that they tend to be longer and have a wider scope you'd expect a bigger cast of characters in them and the real question is are we going are we going to trim out some of the things that are said on the people on the side who aren't the main narrative here rather than have to be, risk the whole book being pulled because somebody who is mentioned on page 371 um, threatens a, a lawsuit later on. And that can be difficult. And also, I think the point, again, that Manuel made later, that if even before you go to a publisher with your prospect for a book, you've had a letter warning you, nobody is going to touch you and nobody's going to touch you not only because they're cautious but because their insurers won't cover them if they were they knew there were threats even before publication and that can be very chilling because these are the people who might most need to be investigated but it is brave publishers who will be behind you if you've already had a letter saying if you publish this we'll sue I heard a wonderful story a couple of weeks ago about someone who had that exactly that same problem that they that they had a, a legal threat against them and they couldn't find a publisher. And um, they were talking to John Le Carre about it, the late great John Le Carre, who who got out his checkbook um, and signed a check and wrote the guy's name on it and said, "There you go, take that to a publisher and say if you have any problems, I'll pay." And they got a publishing contract, no trouble at all. So there we go. You just need John Le Carre. Um, on the subject of people who are very generous with money and very helpful to journalists. Um, 
uh, I we have a question from the floor from Futara Kusari from the ECPMF. Full disclosure, she's being very helpful to me. Um, Flutara, um, do you have a microphone and would you like to ask your question? I believe yes. Uh, hi, my name is Flutor Agosari. I work for the ECPMF, European Center for Press and Media Freedom. We document legal threats to journalists on mapping media freedom and Council of Europe platform on safety of journalists. And we also offer legal support to journalists. I have a question for um, the speakers. Uh, very often we have difficulties in convincing journalists to speak up uh, about their cases, to document these cases. We ask them whether they want to, to publish anything, to say anything. And when I say publish anything about these stories, it means facts, not opinions, not comments about these cases. And there is this hesitance from journalists uh, to document such, to allow us to document these cases publicly. And I just wanted to check with you and to ask you, why are journalists so hesitant? What are the reasons that they refuse some, very often to go public about these cases? Thank you. Um, Shiraz, would you like to start on that one? I mean, that ties into a bit what you were talking about earlier. If you'd like to expand on, on what you were talking about earlier about precisely this same issue. Absolutely. And I mean, this is part of the, the reason that I was cautious in not naming any of the, the um, parties in this uh, in the scenario that I sketched out. And um, I was, you know, texting Dario earlier today and he was saying that he was looking forward to um, the day's events. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be speaking about this, but I hope it doesn't poke any sleeping dragons. Um, as, as I mentioned, the, um, the law firm had a 20 page letter, you know, drafted and ready to go just waiting for us to, to, to come back to them once on this issue. So, um, you know, even now, part of my participation on behalf of Amma Bungani in today's event is, um, and Susan, you know, very helpfully pointed this out, um, the one year defamation uh, uh, prescription period that we would call it in South Africa has elapsed because the articles I referred to were published in September, 2020. Um, and that gave us a bit of confidence to, to come and speak about it, but I would still be wary about um, publishing, um, you know, if the, the subjects that I talked about, um, you know, do do get wind of it and respond again, uh, you know, it's the it's the issue of double slap that was that was mentioned. So, um, you know, we have to be uh, extra cautious. I'm also another thing that I was weighing up is the one year period in relation to defamation may have elapsed. Um, but what about these um, data protection claims? What about the claims in relation to privacy? And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer by training as well, but I'm not well versed enough in, in UK law to, to answer those questions, nor can we brief lawyers just to get, you know, satisfaction. So again, it's the cautious approach. And this is why we're not comfortable to, to you know, uh, put all of this on, on record necessarily. Um, France, would you like to talk about that? The, the, the dragons, um, you know, we are in a slightly ridiculous situation since I think we all know what these dragons are called, but I certainly don't want to particularly poke them with a stick either. Um, you know, do you, th do, you, do you agree that there's an issue here with, with journalists essentially being unable to talk about, um, let's face it, you know, a, a genuinely serious threat to freedom of speech and who is and who's behind it? Yeah, I, I, I agree that that is a massive issue. And I think there are a couple of reasons for it. I mean, one is uh, I think a lot of journalists don't necessarily want to sort of talk about themselves too much and go, oh, um, you know, they just kind of want to get on with the, the stories. I mean, at the end of the day, sort of our sort of sub stories are, are possibly less and less important than the things we're actually writing about. Um, I think secondarily, yeah, there is that kind of uncertainty about, well, what are the kind of legal implications for this? And I actually, before I spoke, I kind of wondered, well, ha to what extent do I want to name people? Because it's not really about that, those people. It's, it's about uh, a system and uh, a pattern. And I decided that I, I did want to because, because I, I think there is a, a, a little bit of a taboo. Um, and it, it does hinge on this kind of uncertainty. Well, am I getting myself into kind of trouble? And there isn't really um, advice on that. Um, and I, I suppose you can go and get advice, but you know, you don't kind of go and do that uh, when you're just working as a journalist. Um, and particularly, you know, if a lot of the stuff is kind of marked private, confidential, not for publication, 
you kind of wonder in the back of your mind, well, am I doing something wrong? But ultimately, I, I agree. I do think, and I, I, that's why I think the, you know, what Foreign Policy Center and, and others um, index and censorship uh, are doing is, is so useful, um, kind of bringing all these experiences together, because at the end of the day, everyone's in their own newsrooms having very, very similar experiences, and we're kind of not really sharing those experiences sufficiently. Great, thank you. I think we have another question from the floor. I'm loving this question from the floor business. Um, Annika Hordenberg. Uh, sorry about my pronunciation. I'm getting it all wrong today. <laughs> Hi, Oliver. Annika van Wittenberg. So a question also following up from what Franz said and from what the panel said. Um, and I work for a civil society organization, so we get some of these letters as well, threatening letters. I actually wonder, well, I have two questions. One is, should we think about sharing these letters? I know they're marked private and confidentially when they frequently arrive in our inboxes, but actually I don't think there is a legal obligation to keep those private and confidential. Could we begin, is this potentially a, a future project, collecting these threatening letters from the same dragons and starting to put this information together in a way that's helpful to counter such threats? Let's be more informed about what we're all facing and see what we can do to counter it. Um, Manuel, if we could come to you on that. Now, I know Daphne, Daphne Caruana Galizia certainly didn't, wasn't scared of putting these letters on her blog. She wasn't scared of anything, bless her. Um, but as her fate tells us, you know, sadly, a libel suit is very much not the worst thing that can happen to a journalist. <clears throat> um, you know, it is, it, 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 it's uh, compared to what happened to Daphne, you know, obviously a very minor thing. So, so how do you feel about that? If you if you keep getting these these letters and you feel that they're essentially just bullying you, would you want to? Would you be prepared to publish them, or, or would you not want to take that risk? Look, um, I, I have so so the Carter Rock letters before the Daphne book, and and Jürgen Fenex lawyers letters before the Daphne book made an annex into the book because we felt two things: we felt confident in our reporting. And uh, the other thing we felt is that the, the language used uh, by the lawyers and by the subject of our investigations in response to our questions were an indication that a reader could uh, figure out for themselves without us having to spell it out. Um, they could make their judgment of, of, how, of how these people felt and how responsible these people were. Um, I, I, it, it, but it's, it's, you still get a mixed feeling about the situation because there are situations where uh, the risk evaluation leads you to drop a story. And that's not something any journalist will ever uh, speak proudly of. I, I, when I spoke about, in, in my first intervention, I spoke about an apology I published to clients of a bank that had been shut down and they lost a lot of money in the process. Um, and, and this happened after I withdrew a story because this I allowed this bank to bully me. And we allow banks to bully us, we allow these, these corporations to bully us, we allow, we allow these politicians to bully us because sometimes the calculus, as has been described by the speakers today as well, is that this is not worth the fight. I do not have the means or the resources to fight. And then what we're trying, is telling the public is, we know something that you should know, but we are unable to tell it to you. And, and I, I don't think anyone is ever proud of that. Um, I think that is a reason for the sort of um, silence that Flutura was speaking about. Um, it's, it's, so, so it becomes a bit of a, of a misguided wisdom to be careful and to be, and to be quiet. And there's another consideration yet, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this one. Um, we heard um, from, from, from my colleague explain a situation where if you get a legal letter, however substantive it is, threatening you with a lawsuit if you were to publish your, your, your book, um, then they would sue. And because you get the letter, no publisher would touch you. Now combine that with the other principle that we discussed, which is absolutely fundamental, that is that every journalist must double check their sources, but must also give the persons they're writing about the opportunity to respond. So you are obliged, morally, ethically, professionally, to tell them that you're writing a book about them and to tell them what you intend to say about them. 
and to invite them to respond. When you do that, you're inviting them because they know exactly the effect it would have to send you that legal, legal letter that alone shuts you down and shuts down the book. And so there's, there are good reasons why this is a taboo. And, and that is that um, we come across information, we investigate information, we establish information, we do our duty because it is in the public interest, but the public is preventing from acquiring that information because of the threats we receive and we are unable to respond to. Um, Nicola, could we come to you as our, as our lawyer here present? Um, I'm obviously not expecting you to give legal advice to everyone here, but is there a, a general principle if, if we receive a letter that says not for publication, um, does that mean not publication or is it just one of those things people write in order to you know, try and get their way? I think that there were a couple of issues here. I just want to add to something that Manuel and the others said as well about why people sometimes choose not to publish. It's about particularly again for authors when they know that publishers are so careful they're really nervous about getting a reputation. And one of the things I've learned after 10 years at the Society of Authors are things that we as lawyers may think are not a problem at all. You know, even the, the publishers would never do that. Even if we thought the publishers would never do that, and in this case, I think they would do it, authors are very worried about putting their heads above the parapet, about getting a reputation as someone who has been sued and then writing more and banging on about it or whatever, and, and that they won't get... Um, contracts in other areas and so all of that makes them nervous and in terms of the law well you know there are various things about what it means by publication and also as we all know about what is the risk that people will come back and do anything about it because what would it mean for their reputation if they were to sue you for publishing a letter that you sent them whether or not you're entitled to in law is a question again that we have to weigh up but and publication, yes, of course, there is a copyright. They own the copyright. So technically, you're infringing their copyright if you publish their letter in full. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't paraphrase it or whatever. And it doesn't mean you can't show it to your advisors. And in this case, if what we're talking about is collating letters that come in and sending them to advisors for a real reason, that's very different from just putting them in a, in a newspaper and publishing them for no reason. So I actually think that the idea that we might have a central place where we we collect them and think about them and then publish quotes from them later and where you're entitled to get advice on them very hard for people to complain because you'd say I'm getting advice on it and and for someone to suggest that you can't go and get advice on something I think would be extremely difficult um, and certainly a freedom of expression question so I would suggest to people, and we do have that, we do have, we, we have authors who won't give us their contracts to vet because their publishers have said it's confidential. I'm like, that is ridiculous. You, you know, nobody can criticize you from letting us see your publishing contract and commenting on it and advising you on it. And, um, but everybody is standing alone. Journalists are standing alone as we hear and writers are standing alone and unless they feel supported it's great that groups are here it's great that people do it the more we can say we'll stand with you send them to us we'll look at them and we'll share it because what's coming out from this room is it's happening all over the world to all sorts of people who don't realize the extent of the problem and that there are other people there who are extremely knowledgeable about it who can help them Thank you. Very, very interesting. And I mean, obviously, the, the FPC was was trying to collect a few examples of these letters, and I think managed to, to get a few together. But yeah, um, people are naturally reluctant to take the risk involved, particularly when you're up against very well resourced and very um, resourceful uh, legal firms. Um, I, we've got about five minutes, six minutes left. Um, I thought I might, um, first of all, there's a, a question which has come in, someone who's asked to be kept anonymous. Um, France, and, and just for you in, in when you're facing a uh, kind of legal back and forth like you did with the with the Democratic Republic of Congo story, how do you protect your sources or, or be sure that you are going to protect them in a, in a situation like that when they are trying, throwing absolutely everything at you to try and figure out who it is who's been talking to you? Yeah, that's that's a really good question and I, something I, I don't think I really got into enough. I mean, what, one thing to really remember is that you've here you've got London lawyers who basically trying to figure out who your sources are to pass that back to the rulers, essentially, in Democratic Republic of Congo. 
and those sources are then incredibly vulnerable. So you've you've actually got these um, British solicitors, um, you know, helping uh, autocratic regimes and their entourage in in persecuting uh, people. Um, so how do we pr protect them? I mean, you know, we we you have to be confident in the fact that you do have source protection. Uh, rights and that you don't have to reveal anything and you've just got to be so for example one thing you've got to be incredibly careful about is uh, let's say you're writing something based on a document and then they say well we can't really respond because you've sent us all these questions but we haven't seen the document and then obviously what they're hoping for is well somewhere on the document is a telltale sign because this has got uh, you know it's got some sort of a stamp on it which reduces the pool of people who could have possibly had it um, so you've got to be careful about kind of sharing documents and y you, you've, you've just got to not fall into the trap um, that's set by, by these lawyers um, and you've, you've kind of just got to stand your ground and say this is exactly what you know and you obviously you have to be transparent as well and that's where the kind of balancing act comes in but you, you, you have to um, be transparent about what kind of what the character of your information is is. Uh, what the nature of your information or quality of the information is without going into, well, where is this information actually from? Thank you. It's fascinating. Um, so I just thought we'd finish by talking about what, what, what better should look like. What could we sort things out? I mean, you know, Nicola talking about insurance and so on. I mean, the issue is that that's a way of trying to share the cost of these proceedings. Um, I, from my perspective, the, the ambition should be to bring the cost down or, or get rid of the proceedings altogether so so um i thought we'd start with you Therese. could you talk about what does what what would better look like for you what would you like to see apart from british lawyers going away altogether which perhaps is it <laughs> um yes as i mentioned earlier you know the the thing that would be great for us is you know the thing that would have given us complete satisfaction would be if um somebody offered us uh, you know legal representation pro bono representation but that's not going to happen so I think what Nicola mentioned earlier about um, uh, making sure that these these cases are able to be battered away from the courts uh, at a very early stage, that would you know definitely give um, a bit of a boost to the uh, impetus to say we're going to initially you know put forward our our response uh, in in the you know whether it's legally um, on letters or you know engaging in the first stage of lit litigation. With the with the confidence that that you know it would be um, taken out of the system fairly quickly, uh, maybe if there's an alternative uh, review mechanism, so where these types of cases um, you know go be before they get instituted formally in court, if there's a a, a pre process, for instance, where um, someone with a, with a lot of experience in these matters can look at it and and advise um, as to prospects, for instance, um, that kind of thing would be would be immensely helpful. Thanks. And, and Manuel, I, I'm wondering for you, um, I suppose the question is, if, if we did manage to sort the situation out in the UK, would you just face, like you said, you did legal proceedings from other jurisdictions? You know, is, is, this, a, is this an unsolvable problem? Well, um, it, 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 I, it is a moral problem. Um, it is not just a legal problem, it's also a moral problem. And I think it needs to be addressed morally and politically. And that what's happening here, the consequences of this, it's not just that uh, the lives of journalists can become more uncomfortable than they than they should be. It's just the public's right to know, the public's right to be informed about what's happening um, and what the powerful are, are doing um, is is being sacrificed. And therefore, I think um, we need we need to raise awareness of this. I think the public needs to expect from people in public life, from corporations, from big businesses. Um, uh, then not to indulge in this sort of in, in this sort of behavior. I don't know if I want to make an analogy that it is not acceptable to uh, for a corporation to sell textiles manufactured in a sweatshop with child labor. The, that sort of thing is stopped by the consumer demanding a minimum standard of decency from corporations and from from people in politics and so on and so forth. I think the public. It, well, certainly it's been said here, not all journalists and authors are aware that so many others are facing these situations, even less so the consumers of our journalism, the consumers of our books and of our writings, 
that are not aware that there's a lot out there that they're not reading and that they're not finding out because of these abusive, aggressive, and anti-democratic um, behavior by corporations and people in, in, in power. So I think raising the public public's awareness uh, is, is an important step that we need to take now. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good note to end on. Very important. Um, thank you to our panelists. That's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for all listening. And um, that's 11.45 and that's all we've got time for. I think that that's zipped by. So thank you very much.
Oh, live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session on SLAPs as a uh, lawfare measure against investigations into corruption and dirty money flows. My name is Ben Cowdock. I'm investigations lead at the UK chapter of Transparency International, the global anti-corruption charity. Uh, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to um, Justice for Journalists and Foreign Policy Centre for organising this event. I think one of the main things uh, we want to achieve today and the last couple of days is to be able to talk about this issue which is often hidden from public view a lot more uh, to really understand each other's perspectives on this and really understand the scale as well because as we've been hearing um, a lot of the time this, this stuff is hidden behind private and confidential letters um, we don't get to talk about this enough so hopefully we'll get a good chance to talk about that today um, as I said today we'll be discussing how lawfare and slaps are used to stymie investigations into corruption um, and, and dirty money flows uh, particularly the sort of targeting of journalists, civil society, and whistleblowers who work so hard to uncover these schemes. Um, this is really important because slaps in this area have such a corrosive effect on the global fight against corruption and dirty money. Um, because more often than not, the sources for law enforcement investigations and anti-corruption measures come from journalists and whistleblowers. Um, and when they are silenced, that means the information flows go to law enforcement, um, they go to the, the private sector that's supposed to be the, the first line of defense against money laundering. Uh, when they dry up, then we all suffer because this thing, these kinds of things happen more and more often. Um, so really glad to be joined today by this um, excellent panel we've got. Um, joining me in person is Annika van Woudenberg from RAID. Um, and on the line, I think we've got um, Baris Altintas um, from Turkey, um, from the uh, Media and Law Studies Association. We should also have um, Henry Toulier, who's the director of the African Platform to Prevent Whistleblowers. Um, and excitingly, we'll be joined at some point by Tom Burgess, who is currently um, in a court case related to this kind of um, work. Um, so hopefully he'll be able to join us later and talk a little bit about that um, as our sort of roving reporter for the day. <laughs> um, so he's uh, with the Financial Times as a reporter, and he's also written a book called The Kleptopia, which I would urge you all to read. Um, so, uh, shall we kick off and um, go first to um, Henry Toulier, um, who can share his perspectives um, from a sort of more international perspective, um, looking at these issues. Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share my experience here as a, the director of the Platform to Protect Whistleblowers, uh, which we call PLAF. Um, let me just first explain to you a little bit what our work is and what we've experienced in the past two years and the solutions we are trying to, to find. Um, first of all, the PLAF is a, is a French NGO, it's based in Paris, it has offices in, in Dakar, Senegal and in South Africa. And basically we helped uh, whistleblowers whose disclosure have an impact for the uh, general interest of, uh, of African citizens. And in the past we've been working a lot in South Africa, but also in the DRC, in Senegal and many other countries. But today I just wanted to share our experience when uh, on a particular case we worked on uh, which was based in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC. And uh, Anneke, who is sitting on the, on the floor, uh, knows what I'm talking about wow. and we've shared our experiences on, on that as well. Uh, basically what happened is that we were approached by two whistleblowers, two guys who were working in a bank uh, in Kinshasa and who came to us uh, in France with uh, a lot of uh, sensitive information. They had banking documents showing how uh, an infamous uh, businessman called Dan Gettler uh, was dealing with a bank. Basically, Dan Gettler um, is, is famous because he had been sanctioned uh, by the OFAC uh, because the OFAC saw in him a, a very strong intermediary between uh, mining uh, multinationals and Joseph Kabila, the former president of the, of the DRC. And the OFAC sanctioned him uh, because they thought that uh, he was helping basically uh, Kabila to get more and more corrupt. Um, and what the bankers were showing us were documents. I mean, it was a strong body of evidence showing that uh, the bank in Kinshasa was probably helping 
Dan Gettler through a money laundering network to bypass the, the US sanction. That's what the whistleblowers were telling us. And so we started to investigate the, the data uh, with uh, Global Witness, the British NGO, but also with journalists from Le Monde, uh, Radio France Internationale, Haaretz uh, in Israel, Bloomberg in the US, etc. We started investigate, uh, to investigate the, the documents and you know, our, conduct our own investigations. And we came to the conclusion that it was highly likely that such ne network was uh, existing within the bank and that, uh, you know, Dan Gettler was allegedly using a, a network to bypass the U.S. sanctions. And we, um, you know, we came at the stage where we needed to send uh, rights of replies, questions, uh, otises to the different uh, parties who had been identified in our investigation. And that's where we started to receive some kind of uh, threatening letters from, from lawyers, including a, a UK-based law firm, uh, Carter Rock, uh, but also from lawyers in Paris, lawyers in Geneva, but we also started to receive threats from, uh, from people more directly. And basically some of the lawyers of Dan Gettler and of the bank showed us that they knew exactly who our sources were uh, and that they were ready to go into a fight with us um, if we decided to publish. They were basically threatened to you know, to file a suit against us in Paris and everywhere they could, but also showing to us that they knew exactly who, uh, who was behind the, the, the leak. Uh, thank God the, the whistleblowers were uh, safe because we had relocated, the, uh, relocated them uh, before, uh, before publication. So we decided to publish in, ju in July 2020, but on the eve of the publication, we started to be the target of a smear campaign on Twitter with thousands and dozens of trolls attacking us with very fancy videos, uh, portraying, uh, profiling the, the chairman of PLAF as a vampire. Uh, we were all working for George Soros and we were all trying to get the uh, mines back in the, in the DRC, which is obviously what we are doing at PLAF, getting uh, mining license back to us. Uh, but at the same time, on the eve of the publication, they filed a suit against us in, in Paris. But we did publish a report, created uh, lots of noises. They did everything they could on, on, on Twitter and on other social networks to diminish our foundings. Um, and yeah, it was a little bit dirty. But um, at the same time, they made us a little bit upset. So we, start, we decided to investigate more and more the data we had. And so we did a second set of publications in February 2021. Uh, again, when we send confrontations letters, we receive uh, numerous new threats, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go back into the, the, the details of this. Um, the Haaretz journalists got threatened by uh, Israeli lawyers as well. Uh, some people saying that they will uh, finish his career. Um, the lawyer of, uh, of Plaf, the chairman of Plaf, who is also a French lawyer, got blackmailed. Basically, they, they said that uh, if we're going to move on with uh, the publication, they will uh, publish uh, um, a recording of him saying things that he shouldn't have said. And then we, we kind of found, found this recording on, on, on social networks. I mean, it, it was just, you know, very dirty and very time consuming for us and very stressful, while at the same time we had to ensure the security of the, of the whistleblowers. And so for the second set of publication, you know, they announced once again that they had filed suits against us. Uh, three complaints were filed for defamation in France back in October. And more importantly, they said that uh, the whistleblowers had been sentenced to death in Kinshasa uh, in absentia. That we didn't know of. And we started to do our own, our own little research and we did realize that yes, indeed, the whistleblowers had been sentenced to death, uh, but that they hadn't been informed of the, of the proceeding, that they never had the opportunity to defend themselves. You know, basically some guy went to a judge and get the judge to sign a piece of paper and this piece of paper is sentencing our whistleblowers to death. And since we published our, our second uh, set of publication in February, we, uh, Global Witness and, and PLAF got also um, uh, received what we call the summons uh, to appear before court in Kinshasa, where we were basically facing the same charges, which led to the uh, death penalty for the uh, death sentence for the two whistleblowers. So now we've been fighting against this uh, new proceeding in Kinshasa, thanks to a very brave uh, uh, lawyer uh, in Kinshasa who managed, uh, who got the Kinshasa court to say that uh, they didn't stand jurisdiction on this particular case.
obviously the bank who is suing us uh, has made an appeal on this, uh, but uh, we hope we will succeed. And in the meanwhile, we're also trying to we're also trying to get the death sentence uh, voided uh, in, in, in before the court de cassation, the highest court in uh, in Congo, and we hope we'll be able able to do that uh, to get that soon. So just in a nutshell, because it's a lot of information I realize. Well, you know, this case uh, has led to two death sentences for uh, two very brave whistleblowers. We have we have been targeted by four complaints in in, in Paris, uh, two complaints against us in in Kinshasa. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> I don't know, seven, eight, nine. I, I can't remember. I, I can't follow up everything. Uh, but more importantly, it causes a lot of uh, stress. It forced, uh, it, we had to relocate the whistleblowers a second time, first from the RC to France and then within Europe to find them a new, uh, a new address because they knew where they were, they were living. Um, we got to lose a lot of money because, um, you know, in, in, in France, we have uh, some lawyers whom we can pay pro bono, but it's not always the case uh, in, in, in Congo, obviously. So, you know, it's, it's money that you have to budget to budgetize before going into a case like that. And, um, but the great thing is that we got the support of uh, many NGOs, including RAID uh, here. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, we, we've, we've decided to make very public the fact that we were the subject of slap procedures because we saw that it was a, a matter of general interest to know that if you go after these people, you can also get, you can also get uh, prosecuted. But it's also a way to fight back uh, in Paris what's going on. I mean, here in, in France, sometimes the judges are more sensitive to a case if it appears on the media and if, we, if they see that, like, you know, petition has, has, has gathered a lot of signatures from, from, from very serious NGOs defending us. Um, but also one thing that we've learned is that we've lost friends. Uh, we've lost uh, lawyers, human rights people who were pre pretending to be human rights lawyers here in France and who have decided to change their jacket to become the lawyers of Dan Gatler and, and the bank. And that's quite pa painful to see that some people can be sensitive to the strategy of Dan Gatler, which is basically uh, to get our friends, human rights lawyers, to, to go after us. But we have decided to counterattack. Uh, and I'll end up on this. We have decided to counterattack. We have uh, filed uh, defamation suits against the French lawyer of, uh, of the bank uh, because he had said things uh, in the Congolese media which was going after us. So now we are prosecuting him here in France and the two whistleblowers are doing it as well. And we have filed a new, new kind of uh, co criminal complaint um, which I've tried to translate in English Basically, in, in, in French, it's called entrave à la liberté d'expression, which means hindrance or obstacle to freedom of expression. It's a law that was put in the criminal code uh, a while ago uh, in order to prosecute people who are preventing a protest to take place or preventing uh, um, uh, an artistic activity to take place. And the only times where we have sentences in French case law, basically it's when, uh, for example, you organize uh, an exhibition uh, which is a little bit radical. Well, the exhibition will be, uh, you won't be able to access the exhibition because you will have a protest of, let's say, extreme, uh, Christian extremist or radical extremists preventing the access to the exhibition. Then that means you can prosecute these, these, these people because they've been, you know, they've, uh, raise an obstacle to access the exhibition. So basically, we are trying to use this law to say that all the letters uh, they send to us, all the attacks we receive on this uh, during the May campaign, all the, the all the complaints that you know we were targeted with, all of that characterize an obstacle to our freedom of expression. Yes, we managed to publish the reports. Yes, we managed to protect the whistleblowers, but we had to delay the publication of our report. And all the time we were meant to spend on investigation or protecting the whistleblowers, we actually spent it on fighting back and, and you know, trying to, to, to survive within this very slap, slap timing we, we had, if I, if I may, may say. And so basically we, we, we're saying that all of that characterizes an obstacle to our freedom of expression, but also to our freedom of association. 
because the mandate of our association is to protect whistleblowers. So we'll see, we'll see uh, an investigative judge has been appointed uh, to work on this issue. Uh, we'll see if the judge decides to investigate and whether he or she decides to uh, use that kind of laws for, to, to fight against slab procedures. So maybe in a year or in two years from now, I'll be able to, to let you know how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And hopefully you'll be here next year to hear about how that uh, legal action has gone. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll be able to get some uh, similar uh, provisions put into UK law, potentially, as a um, complement to tackling SLAP. Um, I should mention, if you have any questions for our panellists, um, do put them in the chat box if you're watching remotely, or um, throw up your hand if you're in the audience. Um, I think we'll move now to Annika, who um, can share your experience from a more UK-centric point of view. Great. and. Thank you, everyone, and great to have an opportunity to talk about a case which I'm afraid is again going to take us back to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so this, this wasn't intentional, but what's interesting is you're going to see lots of things come together, which again focus us on the city of London and law enforcement. Maybe just a little bit about me. So I'm the executive director of RAID, Rights and Accountability and Development. We're a very small group of lawyers and legal experts. We are a corporate watchdog NGO, so we're not journalists, but we do uh, huge amounts of investigations into corporate crime, particularly in Africa, and then stand with local communities and victims to seek justice. That frequently brings us to the UK courts or to other softer law enforcement possibilities to try and get justice for the behavior of multinational companies. And lo and behold, one of the companies that we have come up against more recently um, is a Kazakh multinational mining company called Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation, ENRC. I will refer to them as that, though today they are called Eurasian Resources Group, ERG. Rebranding is always a wonderful thing, especially when you're um, faced with corruption investigations. And that indeed is the case for this particular company. Let me tell you about it in a nutshell, just so you have the case background. Because what becomes important, I think, for us on SLAPS here is the extension of this tactic, so frequently used against journalists and other public interest groups, to also be used against law enforcement personnel and against the serious fraud office. And I think that takes us into a slightly different realm, which perhaps we haven't spoken about so much. So much of the reporting that journalists do is to expose corruption. And I guess what we all want, whether we're journalists or civil society groups, is then for law enforcement to take the next step, which is to launch investigations into corruption. And in the case of this Kazakh multinational mining company, that is precisely what happened. So the company is, um, as I said, Kazakh, used to be based on the UK stock exchange um, until it went private um, in 2012, 2013. The company um, was notorious at the time in the significant press reporting about the way in which it was governed. But in particular, what came into focus was the manner in which it acquired mining assets across Africa, and particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This became uh, of serious concern to law enforcement agencies. And in April 2013, an investigation was launched by the Serious Fraud Office, the UK's preeminent uh, anti-corruption, overseas anti-corruption body, who launched a full-on investigation into this mining company. What followed was incredibly aggressive legal tactics by the company against a range of actors. And we have now gathered together information indicating they launched at least, at least 18 legal actions in the United States and in the UK against uh, journalists, former contractors, their own lawyers, whistleblowers, and a range of other actors. Sometimes the, UK, the US uh, actions being used to go on fishing expeditions for information, which could then potentially be used in UK defamation or other UK cases. Um, 
new numbers have been added to that, not least my fellow panelist, Tom Burgess, who was uh, served with a defamation suit just a few months ago against him, the Financial Times, and HarperCollins, bringing us back to some of the questions about both publishers, which was discussed in the previous panel, and of course against pretty a pretty big name um, journalistic outfit, the Financial Times. Um, this has gone into a variety of different uh, cases now, and one of them is indeed against the Serious Fraud Office. So a couple of years ago, uh, the company launched a civil suit against the Serious Fraud Office, claiming misfeasance in public office, quite a serious crime, but also leaking to journalists. So it kind of brings us full circle sometimes where slap suits are brought against the journalists who may be writing stories. In this case, the aggressive legal tactics were used against the prosecuting authority, including leaks to journalists. Um, it then took this even a step further, and a case has also been brought against individuals, in this case civil servants, who were prosecutors who worked inside the Serious Fraud Office. So a case against the Serious Fraud Office itself, a law enforcement body, as well as um, current and former members of staff. Um, you know, we haven't spoken very much about that, but these kind of tactics can also be used against individuals like that who earn not very much money. I mean, a civil servant is not earning a huge salary, um, who are doing work for the public good in order to ensure that our law enforcement is strong and that corruption investigations, if indeed information is found, can lead to criminal prosecutions. Um, I Over the summer, there was a lengthy case here in the UK, which you will have heard probably very little about, um, a case that was 10 weeks, extremely long, in the UK courts against the Serious Fraud Office and a number of other groups. And during that court process, huge amounts of information came out, which um, showed both the tactics of the company and showed the extent of the alleged corruption. Let me just add, of course, the company denies that any of these illegal activities took place and also denies that it was involved in any corruption. Um, the information wasn't really covered very much by the UK press, in part because the company is notorious for these type of legal actions. The chilling effect silences. We've heard that repeatedly over the past day and a half. But what I would urge you to read is the closing arguments by the Serious Fraud Office in this case. Because it shows the extent to which these legal aggressive tactics have drawn out a corruption investigation, have diverted time and attention to a law enforcement operation to fighting these types of tactics. Huge amounts of money, huge amounts of time, and also the chilling effect on law enforcement personnel. And one of the really startling moments in the case was when an individual stood up who, uh, and was on the witness stand, who had been the top prosecutor on the case, stood up and said, in open court, I am intimidated by your client, he says to the uh, barrister who was representing the company. Um, it has affected my life and it has affected how I do my work and very clearly setting out the degree of intimidation that he had felt. And so not only does it create a chilling effect for journalists, it creates a significant chilling effect on legitimate law enforcement activities. To date, the company has not been charged and the investigation continues, soon to be nine years on a corruption investigation. And I should say that too has had significant impact on the way any journalists or public interest body or civil society groups like my own organization can report on the behavior of these types of companies. Because until charges are brought, um, it's much harder to report on it. You're constantly reporting on the same allegations of corruption. And either this company needs to be charged or not, but it leaves the reporting and the ability to discuss it in the public realm increasingly limited, especially when the aggressive tactics are being used. 
So any journalist wanting to write about this is very likely to get a letter from Carter Ruck, Taylor Wessing, or Schillings, three who have been quite active on this particular case. But reading the concluding arguments of the SFO is a, a worthy read. Um, it's public information, so none of what I'm saying is ar isn't already out there, but it's of course buried in court filings, which people rarely have the time to read. I want to just raise one, one other point because my fellow panelists may come on and it's just worthwhile to know um, some of the tactics that have also been exposed by this particular company. Exposed again through court records and um, through information in all of these 18 different legal filings. Um, but it does appear the company has engaged in surveillance, following people around, hacking, threatening um, types of intimidation, and allegedly and potentially um, murder of whistleblowers. Again, the company would deny that they are involved in any of these tactics and would deny that they have had any role in illegality. Um, but the extent to which that also impacts those who report on these stories is severe, right? This isn't just legal letters potentially crossing your desk. This is also being followed, going about doing your legitimate reporting work. This is potentially your phones being um, used or, or hacked or being used to spy on you. Um, deeply troubling and concerning and has a huge impact and again on the legitimate work that both journalists and law enforcement do. Um, this case has yet to come to conclusion. We don't have a judgment on the civil case against the serious fraud office yet. The case against the civil servant continues through the UK courts. Um, but I would say the outcome of this case is extremely important for a UK law enforcement and a UK anti-corruption um, body. If the judge finds in favor of the company, the tactics and the aggressive legal strategy pursued by this company will show the playbook to other companies who may be the focus of an SFO investigation. And so I think it should be one that all of us watch very closely because so much of the reporting, especially on financial transactions and report and corruption, tends to attract slap style tactics. And if that then results in a company being able to potentially avert having to face a, a full-on uh, criminal charge and, and, and the case being heard through the courts, I think that would seriously put the fight against corruption back many, many steps here in the UK. So the impact on law enforcement is really quite extreme. So watch this closely. We would anticipate a judgment in this civil suit um, either later this year or early next year. Thank, Thank you, Annika. I think that, that playbook you mentioned is, is underpinned by this imbalance of arms that is so profound in this case and others as well. So not only do they have hundreds of millions of pounds at their disposal to fight these cases, whilst uh, our law enforcement have um, fractions of that for their entire budgets, uh, they're also able to use an array of techniques that um, journalists, law enforcement wouldn't even dream of being able to use. Um, so. I think the crux of what we're talking about today is really redressing that imbalance of arms and um, bringing a sort of level playing field to this to help tackle um, slap suits, but also corruption and financial crime. And maybe if you just allow, I should actually put the figures out there because they're quite yeah, stark. Um, so we know from filings by the company um, that last year alone, they spent $86 million on um, litigation and reputation management. But if you add up the amount they spent from the time they got a, uh, the, the, the SFO's corruption investigation started in 2013, and it is close to $400 million spent on litigation, reputation management. Um, compare that to the serious fraud office's budget, um, and you know, and they're of course not the only ones facing these types of attacks. But the Serious Fraud Office has a budget, if I'm not mistaken, of about 60 million pounds a year. Um, I mean, even when it's government, it's David and Goliath, and the war chest being used 
um, by companies pursuing some of these tactics, it's immense. Yeah. And the serious fraud office still have to apply for blockbuster funding from government. So they have to sort of put the case forward and that's sort of backed up by success as well. So they need to be successful to sort of secure their future budget, essentially. So yep. this, this is a really important case for the UK's future, I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've, I've got word now that um, Tom is on the line. So he was due to be next to speak. So um, can we pass over to Tom now? Maybe, yeah, there he is. Hi, Tom, can you hear us? Okay, maybe let's leave that for a while. Um, so could we pass now to Barish, who could talk to us about yeah. um, the experience of journalists in, in Turkey, which is obviously um, the situation deteriorated over the last <laughs> few years. Um, so Indeed. thanks, Paris. Well, thank you, Ben, and um, well, th um, thanks to you know the both of the speakers. That was very interesting. So my name is Barish. Uh, I'm a journalist, and I'm also uh, co-director of the Media and Law Studies Association. And uh, and our main work is basically um, um, giving pro bono legal support to journalists, <laughs> and we also have uh, extensive trial monitoring. So um, speaking of, of slaps in Turkey. Well, um, you know, in a, in a country, in a system where the judiciary has been uh, weaponized um, systematically against journalists is a bit, is a bit different uh, from, you know, than speaking um, about slaps in, in, in a more, I know, rational <laughs> uh, law system as in the UK, which is still functioning. Uh, but, um, uh, but there are a lot of similarities. And in terms of, I know, corruption and finance, uh, I, uh, we can say that uh, there's an increasing trend by companies and corporations to go that way. But I just want to remind that in 2016, uh, there was a, a coup attempt in Turkey, which was followed by a, a very harsh crackdown on you know, civil society, journalists. I know none of this is news for you, but I just as a reminder, um, so about 200 outlets, media outlets were shut down at the time, which uh, means that mo a lot of journalists were out of jobs. And, and prior to that, the government had um, taken over uh, many main of the mainstream media um, through um, a mechanism of um, um, a government institution for recoup, you know, for getting back debts of um, media owners. So what we have is um, um, thousands of journalists who are, if they have stayed in the sector, who are freelancers and who don't have any backing of, of an organization. And um, uh, starting in 2016, with the um, uh, state of emergency, uh, journalists, we, we at some point, we had about 200 people, uh, journalists in prison. And these were mostly political cases, and we can still um, call them slaps, but they would be uh, really, you know, um, charges related to propaganda, terror propaganda or membership of a terrorist organization. Um, some of them were related to um, cases where journalists worked uh, previously at a media organization uh, that was affiliated uh, with the, the group, uh, the Fethullah Gülen uh, group, which is believed to be in the, which Turkey says is behind the, the coup attempt. Some of them were be, uh, would be the Kurdish journalists who reported on the region, the security forces uh, violations of human rights in that region, which has always been uh, an issue for slaps even before, um, before the, the coup attempt. But um, as you know, these um, uh, terror-related charges and political cases um, f uh, kind of calmed down <laughs> in 2018 because all, most of the investigations in the coup attempt had been completed. Um, they uh, finance news and financial news and, um, and journalists uh, investigating corruption uh, became, you know, kind of came to the spotlight. Again, first for the government and later for the, uh, uh, for the companies. And um, in 2018, Turkey had, a, had a, um, a, um, an exchange rate crisis where the dollar rate, kind of very much like the one we're having now these days, uh, the dollar rate went up from eight to, to nine, uh, uh, nine lira against a dollar overnight, maybe in, in less than 10 hours. And uh, I just want to give an example of, uh, of uh, a case that started at that time. And I think this was one of the first, um, first cases where a journalist was um, basically um, persecuted with a slap 
uh, for a finance report. And it wasn't even a financial report per se. It was uh, the story of a, a man who killed himself because he wasn't able to afford a, a new uh, you know, outfit for his son. But this was treated as a, as a finance story. And, uh, and I talked to this journalist yesterday, so it's been three years, uh, but he still remem remembers that uh, you know, nightmare. So he did the story, he was arrested briefly. Uh, he was uh, in detention for about a day, then they let him go and there was a trial and it was dropped. But it was the, uh, the first of uh, many, which followed, you know, um, talking about the exchange rate, the economy, uh, but most of this was still coming from the government side. And uh, again, in 2018, uh, four Bloomberg journalists were uh, um, accused of, uh, again, um, undermining the performance of the economy. And that trial is still going on, just, you know, commentary on the, on the dollar rate. And um, uh, starting in late 2018, um, uh, around that time, the companies and corporations then came into play, seeing that, oh, this works, because journalists are also writing about, uh, about us. And, uh, and um, again, in Turkey, uh, so there are um, five companies that uh, always win, um, you know, um, uh, huge uh, mega projects and government tenders. And so according to, and they're also in the top 10 companies of, of, of the, the World Bank's list of um, companies uh, that, that uh, make the, uh, that win the, the highest amount of tenders in infrastructural, uh, infrastructural projects around the world. So these uh, companies also started, you know, um, basically suing journalists for you know, their reports that also included uh, corruption in the government. For example, uh, I will give an example of Chidam Tokar, who was a journalist who was uh, sued by a mining company called Shambai, and uh, after you know, um, writing about their um, dubious dealings for uh, one and a half million lira. And then in this case was uh, ac uh, dropped. Another one, uh, T3 Foundation, the Turkey Technology Agriculture Foundation, and, and some of these cases are more recent, uh, uh, started suing uh, these Chidam um, Toker. And in her case, uh, she works at, a, uh, at one of the uh, few remaining newspapers that are not, you know, uh, that are not aligned with the government. And that has um, a good uh, financial backing from its readers, basically. So uh, her reaction is always when of the, when, whenever these cases come up, uh, sharing her own, you know, reports about uh, this company and their uh, links to corruption. So she's, uh, in her case, I don't, I, I can say that, I think we can say that this hasn't had a chilling effect. Uh, but uh, not uh, every uh, finance journalist uh, is, is as brave or as lucky as her, because as I said, most uh, finance journalists were, are either uh, freelancers or, uh, or are not on you know, um, permanent contracts with, with, uh, with media outlets. outlets. Uh, many companies and the uh, government also uh, sued uh, our journalists who worked in uh, international investigations such as the Paradise Papers, whom, um, in some of which were uh, implicated some um, Turkish uh, journalists as well. But, uh, you know, again, you know, um, writing about corruption and finance also um, given in, in this oppressive environment goes hand to hand with, um, uh, you know, security is issues. So those also state as a, as a major um, chilling point for um, uh, ch um, chilling effect for journalists. I want to give uh, just one other example. Uh, so Sinan Aygül is a, a journalist based in Bitlis and he uh, reported on the uh, a um, uh, you know um, sexual uh, abuse of a of a minor by a local person in Bitlis, and he was actually jailed for this report uh, for one night. But still, he was uh, he was jailed for um, you know um, violating the confidentiality of an ongoing investigation. But now we know the details of this uh, this abuse case, and we are hundred percent certain that if this uh, report hadn't been made, um, the aggressor uh, it in the you know uh, in the story would have wouldn't have been um, basically persecuted and they were given five years for um, um, abusing a, a minor uh, so we're uh, so uh, we know that uh, there were attempts to cover this case as well so it's not finance but it was a it was a local person whom uh, the prosecutors obviously wanted to protect and um, in these cases where we are talking about you know political uh, accusations um, against Kurdish journalists or uh, we're seeing a lot of defamation cases against journalists, uh, against the president, the presidential insult cases. Um, 
for the past two years have um, basically made up 10% of all the accusations uh, in courtrooms or about public officials. But I uh, can, uh, I think they're not, um, these political cases are not exactly slowing uh, journalists from criticizing, but in the case of um, corruption stories, we have definitely seen um, a slowdown on, you know, reporting on uh, the family of um, our president and, and and the dealings. And there, for example, there was the case of uh, a businessman called uh, Sezgin Baran Korkmaz. And he is now currently, he was indicted in the United States, uh, States this summer in June for on charges of money laundering. However, um, uh, some revelations that were um, um, shared on YouTube by um, a former mafia boss in Turkey who's now <laughs> turned a bit anti-corruption, who's out of the country, uh, re revealed uh, certain links uh, to, the, to the government. And, uh, and this, uh, an, a, a number of journalists did report on it, but they were limited. And um, one of them was, is uh, located in Germany. And I think the, uh, some of the writings actually have, uh, you know, journalists have verified some of these uh, mafia uh, guys' uh, allegations and they have checked out. But uh, over the past few months, the um, number of reporting on this case, which obviously includes uh, or allegedly at least includes um, the highest echelons of the Turkish government, has been very low. And uh, uh, another, uh, another example is a very recent one. In Istanbul, there was um, a foundation called Tugva, which was founded by the, uh, there still is uh, this foundation, founded by the son of um, uh, President Erdogan. And uh, about a month ago, uh, an, an, a freelancer um, got hold of documents showing that basically uh, some of um, uh, Istanbul's oldest ancient uh, buildings uh, uh, were given basically to this, uh, donated to this uh, foundation at either ridiculous prices or in some cases free of charge. So basically they, uh, uh, these people, uh, the former um, municipal administration gave half of the city to these people. And, you know, and this was a, this is a huge case uh, for, of course, I'm not, you know, uh, where many people uh, should be held accountable and, you know, starting from uh, repay, uh, um, taking these backs to the city. However, there has not been a single um, case against this Tugba Foundation. So I'm just giving this as a very recent example. I think it's a, it's a huge uh, scandal and, and it, it shows that, uh, the, the, you know, these uh, we can enumerate these examples, uh, such as the case of uh, Sinan Aygül, which was yes a child uh, molestation case, but where uh, you can basically go to prison for doing your job. Uh, in the case of um, corruption, again, as the journalist, you can be sued by the government and uh, or companies, and sometimes actually uh, get uh, pay, have to pay compensation. Uh, which is a nightmare for journalists if, if uh, on, you know, not uh, if they don't have a, um, an outlet that, that they work for. But in such a huge scandal of uh, corruption, when you know the, all the assets of the city being embezzled by a foundation, there is not a single file, is a case filed by prosecution. I can't uh, underline how demotivating this is for journalists. And uh, although yes, our country is going through um, extreme times. Uh, we can, I, uh, I mean, my observation is clear that in the case of corruption, corruption by corporations, which are extremely entwined with the government, definitely uh, has slowed down uh, for one because of these um, constant cases by the government or the companies, which uh, they own the judiciary, and, uh, uh, which it's, uh, <laughs> it's this all powerful being. Um, you know, being against a person who is investigating um, uh, corruption. And secondly, just due to the fact that nothing uh, um, is coming out of these uh, huge stories that have been verified by a number of journalists that have uh, produced um, incredible amounts of evidence for prosecutors. And uh, so it is in addition to these dealing with these slap files, there is the... Um, the demotivation being caused by these, especially in the case of finance and in corruption stories, uh, that these, these not anything and these not going to courts. Of course, our hope and the journalists' hope is that uh, this will change one day, dream situation. But uh, we can say that in in the situation in Turkey, uh, these cases combined with the, the, the ineffectiveness against um, 
uh, investigation, cor investigating corruption is having an extremely chilling effect on finance and corruption reporting that we don't see in political cases. In political cases, people go to prison, they're still uh, continuing to write, they do, you know, receive threats and they're, um, uh, you know, they're more ready to uh, brave the, the consequences, but in the ca cases of finance and corruption, which maybe is, um, takes a more specialized investigative reporting, it is definitely, definitely having an extremely uh, worrying and chilling effect. You know, not Thank you. Chill. Thank you, Barish. Um, I think it's quite interesting to hear that often in the UK, these cases are brought by companies and individuals against um, people reporting on them. But um, you're experiencing an entire state machinery being thrown against uh, people reporting on wrongdoing, uh, which is quite a chilling thought to think about. Um, I think we de now have the voice of Tom Burgess on the line. Um, so Hello. can we pass over to Tom? Yep. Hi, Tom. Yes, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I, I was meaning to broadcast live like a foreign correspondent from a magnificent stained glass window inside the High Court where I am today. Um, <laughs> But uh, it possibly the you know the avalanche of malware that's being thrown at my phone interfered with that, so you, you just get my voice. But it's no great. It's, my face is no great loss, um, and I've managed to hear m most of the <laughs> excellent thoughts expressed so far. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we can actually see your face, just a still of it. Um, could you give us a bit of information about um, the case you've been been sitting in on today, and, and maybe some of the other sort of broad experiences you've had with um, with SLAP over the course of your your career? Sure. I um, Well, yes, it's nice to be able to broadcast live to you about this one. I, I, the court's just risen for lunch in this case. I, I think it's fascinating, the one I'm covering today. It's leaving us wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a sec. Okay, maybe not. Um, just a reminder, whilst we wait for Tom to um, get his voice back, uh, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat, or you can um, raise your hand. Can, can, um, you, uh, can, you, can you still hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you again now. I uh, do apologize. Um, we, the, you said how um, exciting and interesting it was, and then you cut out. Um, so we didn't hear what uh, the case was or why it's interesting. Well, I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating because it's um, a, a unique or at least rare case of a, of a politician um, being targeted with what certainly her supporters would consider to be a slap. Just to give you the, the, the tale in brief, um, Charlotte Leslie is a former Conservative Member of Parliament in the UK who now runs um, a body that takes Conservative politicians to the Middle East to try to, uh, I guess, build understanding and build relationships between the ruling party here and the rulers of the Middle East states. And um, she encountered uh, a, about 18 months ago a man called Mohammed Amersi, who is a Kenyan-born British citizen who, who's made uh, an awful lot of money in Russia and who now wants himself to be um, the, the main guy uh, in, in the relationships between conservatives and Middle East rulers. And what Charlotte Leslie did was that she did a bit of Googling and um, pulled together a, a memo on Mohammed Amersi's background. She managed to pick up from from open sources um, uh, some of the basic details about how he'd made an awful lot of money um, in Vladimir Putin's Russia and in other uh, highly corrupt states in the um, former Soviet Union. And this memo was circulated among uh, people in the Conservative Party and reached a mercy himself, at which point he commenced legal proceedings against Charlotte Leslie, um, which are going on today. So he, he's brought them in the form of a data protection claim, saying that she's essentially mishandling his personal data. And, and this is with a view to a threatened libel case, which would add to the very long list of Expensive libel cases brought by expensive lawyers in the in the building out, outside which I'm 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 now standing. And I think part of what's intriguing about about this case uh, and slightly differentiates it from the the usual attacks on journalists is that this is certainly in, in Charlotte Leslie's position just someone go in good faith trying to make some basic inquiries about someone who is seeking a politically influential position. 
but has none of the defences available to journalists. Now, a, a, a Mercy would say that um, this is a sort of scurrilous attack on his on his reputation. He told me when I interviewed him in July that he'd already spent three hundred thousand um, pounds, a total which will by now be much much higher, and it, and will go higher still on his lawyers, um, mainly Carter Rock, who are specialists in this field, um, pursuing these legal claims against Leslie. And it, it is a, a pretty remarkable example, I think, of um, the way that anyone, a journalist, XMP, or essentially just bystander in the affairs of the ultra-rich, um, can, can, can face um, life-changing or life-ruining legal action. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at a time when we're wanting more scrutiny of where money is coming from being pumped into our politics, it's quite striking that one person who is asking some questions uh, has been targeted in this way. Um, it's quite hard to see, exactly, it's quite hard to see how, um, just to, to, to put it from Charlotte Leslie's point of view for a, for a moment, it's quite hard to see how one could go about, let, let's assume that she's telling the truth and she did all this in, in, in good faith, uh, public, civic minded, public spirited, trying to look into someone who uh, was seeking a very influential position in British democratic politics and seeking to, as she says, buy his way into that position. Um, it's, it's quite hard to see how someone if it could undertake that sort of good faith exercise, um, write up um, a, a memo of essentially open source material and, 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 and just raise questions um, without falling foul of this kind of legal risk. And, and, and you know, I, I, we, we've been talking in this session about the sort of the, the, the chilling effect. Uh, you know, what, what, what does this do for even serving politicians as well as acting, active politicians, the people who we elect to, um, to hold power to account, to hold gov the government to account and its, and its donors by extension? W what does it do to that absolutely central work of democracy um, if that's cut off? And I think there's a, there's a, there's a broader point. I, I, I'm not going to um, talk about the, the, the cases against me, but, the, but, but there is a broader point here, which is that... Um, just the kind of day-to-day -day effects that you know one hears about anecdotally of people who are subject to this kind of legal attack, journalists and others. Um, even simple things like the letters tend to arrive on a Friday night. I, I, when I was writing Kleptopia, my last book about uh, how dirty money is conquering the world, I, I received legal correspondence before it was published that was twice the length of the book and it would typically arrive on a on a Friday, last thing on a Friday, it might not seem very significant. It's certainly not uh, significant compared to the risks that journalists in um, Turkey or Congo face to their personal safety. But there's a psychological strategy to this, which is to let to, just just to infuse the weekend with with dread, just to remove your chance to rest and recover. Um, you know, journalists, believe it or not, are, are people too and are, are trying to live ordinary family lives. There's also this trend of naming journalists themselves as defendants in, in lawsuits. It used to be the convention that just publishers would be named, but now there's an attempt to target the individuals. And, and, and as Annika mentioned, there's also this um, sinister trend of surveillance going hand in hand with um, aggressive legal strategies against reporters and others. Um, I know that when I met um, a contact of mine, and I'm not telling you anything that isn't public and isn't in court filings, when I met a contact of mine um, discreetly in a um, in a car park in central London uh, about eight minutes ago, there we were being we were being watched. That that's come that's come clear in, in, in court filings. And one of the remarkable things was that the the lawyers who who revealed <clears throat> this surveillance and used it to make all sorts of um, I would say groundless allegations. Um, uh, didn't bat an eyelid <laughs> about the fact that the surveillance had taken place and that a journalist going about his business, meeting a, a lawyer in private practice, were being watched. And, that, and I, I would suggest that we might actually want to pay some, some attention to the fact that uh, reporters going around central London are being watched by um, agents of very powerful people from very corrupt places. I, I, I was, I, when I was a foreign correspondent in Nigeria, I was very accustomed to having Secret Service follow me and knock on my door. And, you know, sometimes you'd even have a cup of tea with them. But um, 
uh, and I'm not suggesting that there should be one standard for one place and one for another. Um, I am saying, though, that um, in Nigeria, we would we would call out and criticise this kind of surveillance. And in, in, in the UK, there seems to be very little discussion of this, very little discussion of slaps as a whole, and simply because they are very effective. The chilling effect is real. Um, r reporters across Fleet Street, usually doing a job that five people used to do, <laughs> um, under assault by um, lawyers and PRs and their own editors, uh, in an industry that has been slowly dying from the inside uh, ever since the collapse of its business model. Um, th th they get a letter from Carter Rock on a Friday night, nine times out of ten, I feel, there's, there's no, there's no um, statistical basis for that, sorry, I do apologise, the entire school is walking past me. Um, the, um, the, 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 the nine out of ten times, that story will be binned, or cut back, um, rewritten, simply because it's such a mismatch. And just my, my, my final thought here is like the one thing I would say about about, about my case, without commenting on the um, on the uh, on the actual details about the um, the lawsuit that a that a company controlled by some oligarchs has brought against me, and, uh, and my, my, my book and an article I wrote. Um, is that some of the legal correspondence has, has gone on the public record because it's been there's been American proceedings and the American justice system the, the transparency of it is, is, is much more straightforward and lots of documents published online and lots of people can read them and it works far more effectively than the equivalent in the UK um, and as a result you know journalists if they wish to can can, can read that correspondence and can see um, what goes into the sausage of making a book and a and a news story but obviously there are, there, there are the, the, these lawyers work day in, day out, and there will be many, many more cases. Some of the times they won't succeed, and journalists and editors and others will stand up to them. But many, many, many times they will succeed, and that's no doubt how they earn their astronomical fees. And so the the, the accumulated tonnage of information, very often, no doubt, in the public interest, that is simply being suppressed from the public from the public record, is vast now. I would say it's vast, and it's growing every day and when you compare that to a lot of the crap that gets passed off as journalism I think it's very worrying for the for the sort of the information input to um, to, to, to uh, public discourse everywhere yeah absolutely there's more 10 things we learned from squid game rather than 10 things we learned from Pandora papers unfortunately <laughs> um, uh, we've got quite a few questions racking up now, so I'm just conscious that we should get to those so people aren't disappointed. Uh, so the first one from uh, Melanie Chater from the Reform Initiative of Transparent Economies um, has an interesting sort of double-ended question here. Uh, so she wants to know, what is the earliest slap that we know of and have slaps been incurred as a result of prime, private email correspondence uh, between members of an NGO, for example, and whistleblowers? Um, so I don't know if anyone on the panel knows of the earliest slap. I certainly wouldn't like to hazard a guess. Um, anyone got an answer to that? Or anyone in the audience know of the earliest slap? Mm. Charlie. <laughs> I have no idea, but the person emerging is a great expert is Susan Cottery. And Susan's there too. <laughs> I think we've got some experts about to speak. Well, I mean, I, I, I said yesterday that, that, that for as long as people have been able to sue each other in a private capacity, they've been able to, they've, the rich and powerful have abused the process. And, and we have examples going back throughout you know, the entirety of the 20th century. But I mean, it's, it's interesting. I don't want to go into a long, long uh, rant about this. But, you know, if you look back centuries past, you can certainly see that slander and def defamation laws were abused, but they were abused by the state. And it's only sort of when, uh, uh, the, the, with the development of civil law, that then you have uh, the, what we refer to as the privatization of censorship, where you have private parties who have been able to sue. And then when you've had the rise of corporate power, you've, you've, you've seen that phenomenon grow as well. So, you know, you, you've always had that abuse. It's just that the, the individuals and the organizations who are abusing it ha have changed. But and this is the last thing I said. I said yesterday the same thing. But you can see any, any high-profile scandal of the 20th century, and you'll find that same pattern. Uh, in fact, there's a piece I wrote for a foreign policy center about exactly that, and about the various different scandals that there were. Thank you. Um, um, can, can, I can I tip in? Sorry, very, very, very yeah, sure. on that point. 
Do, well, just just to I mean, you may I'm sure this will have been discussed at the the, the, the conference, but the um, the magnificent Catherine Belton's case uh, and about her magnificent book Putin's People is a is a good example of where. Um, it appears, at least, that we've got ostensibly private companies, which are essentially, in reality, arms of a, a, of a hostile kleptocracy. I mean, um, what is Rosneft but an, a, an arm of the Putin kleptocracy? And yet, because we have this system where forces from kleptocracies turn up in a, in a, in a rule of law state, the UK, they, 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 they can fit themselves into roles such as the wronged private company um, and approach the court as such. I think that's going to be a crucial part of that case. The the the, um, the, the use of a kind of fig leaf of a, a private business interest to mask what is actually an attack by a kleptocratic state on a, on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an honest and brave reporter. Yeah, I think that that issue of kleptocracy is being able to sort of jurisdiction shop around the world and target reporters wherever they see fit or wherever the, the legal system suits them is, um, is, is definitely on the rise, I think. Um, we've got another question here from um, Mona Dealey, who wants to know um, if there should be pressure by international institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, on companies who have um, been involved in, in slap cases against journalists. Oh, what was that? <laughs> is that Big Ben? <laughs> ta- ta- Sorry, ta- yeah, that's me. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, no worries, keeping us, keeping us the breath with the time. Um, so uh, another question from Mona Dealey, who wants to know if um, companies involved in, in slap suits against journalists should be debarred by um, in- international bodies. Um, so maybe um, Hen- Henry Toulier, do you know? Are there any that you've covered that you think should be um, debarred or, or consideration should be given to that? Um, yes, probably, but um, you know, it's uh, and I think uh, Alec we can tell you more about that. Um, it's very, it's, I think it's very hard to get uh, the World Bank or the IMF to do anything in general when it comes to kleptocracy and corruption. So I don't know why they would do anything about uh, about slap suits. Uh, I mean, one thing that comes more to my mind is um, the fact that we, you know, uh, well, what I hear from uh, from the other panelists, and it's it's the fact that lawyers can use their prerogative, and at the same time, you know, he, uh, how can I say it in English? But at the same time, damage their own deontology, their, their own ethics. Um, and I think there is a question here, and I know that Susan had raised that before, is how can we actually go to low bar associations and, and get people to be more interested about the fact that these lawyers are being the, just the, 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 the arm of, of, of people who have as many resources as, as they need to go after journalists and, and to violate and breach freedom of expression. And, and so, yeah, we could go after companies, but if we could also go after the lawyers in a way or another, that would be uh, that would be interesting. And I think that there are discussions that are ongoing about the possibility to, you know, file suits against um, the people who are conducting slap procedures, which you know could lead to much more important financial sanctions than just a little penalty or just having to pay the the adversary uh, uh, legal fees. Um, and yeah, that, that things we should think about. I mean, right now in France, there is a new law which is being adopted for the protection of whistleblowers. And it's quite interesting because all the protections that the law gives to whistleblowers is automatically given to organizations who help whistleblowers. So, and that includes uh, immunity from jurisdictions. Um, so basically tomorrow, we, as an organization who is helping whistleblowers, we shouldn't be prosecuted for having being an accomplice of a, uh, an illegal act of a whistleblower, if you see what I mean. So this could pave the way to new, to new avenues to, to get more immunity for, for, for journalists who are working for their general interest, whistleblowers and NGOs, but also a better way to counterattack those who go after us. Sorry, yeah. it's far from what you, your question on the IMF and the World Bank. But, uh, no, 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 you've, um, 
gone, taken us on a journey there. And I think I wanted to ask Annika about broader measures we can take against companies that use slaps and potentially against lawyers that perpetrate those slaps as well. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think this whole question of enablers is so important. And it's, you know, we're beginning to talk about that more and more, but the enablers are law firms, their reputation management, public relations firms, and frequently some of the work I do, accountants as well, which is perhaps a bit less on the slaps front, but certainly on issues to do with human rights violations. And, and I would put the legal profession pretty firmly in the dock here, because I think there is a real need for further pressure on law firms who engage in this, who um, help to skirt the boundaries of the law, violate the spirit of the law. Um, so I think enablers is something that we need to do a lot more focus on and that we need to start to expose the work that some of these enablers do to really crack down on freedom of expression. They're, they're, the effects of what is happening is they're cracking down on the fight against corruption. Um, on the question of the IMF and the World Bank, I mean, it's very interesting. In, in one of these cases, we, in fact, documented that uh, the financial investment arm of the IMF, the International Finance Corporation, had been a victim of corruption by some of these very same actors. And in fact, something they'd invested in had been stolen away from them, and they had been a victim of corruption by some of the same actors we've been talking about today. Um, what was so interesting is they skulked away. Rather than standing up and saying, we are part of this fight against corruption, we stand up against this, we're gonna try and get the money back through the court process, they really just withdrew from the playing field. And, and I do think there's a real role for all of us to play to say to big international institutions like that, stand up when you are the victims of corruption and don't just say we stand against corruption but actually take action when needed. And similarly with investors, because I think particularly where companies are concerned and where they may be engaged in these aggressive legal tactics and slap style suits, um, we need to be urging anyone investing in them to take action to say, hold on, this is not beneficial for society. This is not beneficial for open democracies. And actually, we're not going to invest in you when you shut down freedom of expression and when you shut down legitimate journalism. And I think there's increasing pressure on investors in particular uh, related to environmental harm and human rights violations. And I think there may be a need for us to extend it to this very issue of freedom of expression and um, and, and effective and much needed journalism. Mm. And I think when we're talking about turning the tables on these companies and, and the enablers, obviously in the UK, the SRA is gonna to have to play a big role there. Um, and it's quite interesting that um, until a couple of years ago, or maybe one year ago now, the legal threshold for the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, which is how um, law firms are, are sort of brought to justice, if you like, in the UK, was the criminal standard. So the SRA were having to prove cases to the criminal standard to be able to take any action against them. Uh, but that's now been reduced to the civil standard. So there could be potentially scope for, for more action against law firms here in the UK uh, who have fallen short of the standards we'd hoped they'd uh, be achieving. Um, got a question from the floor over there. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Martin Bright from uh, Index on Censorship. Um, I just wanted to sound a note of caution. Um, in the sense that uh, we need to be careful not to be doing uh, some of these people's, the enablers, uh, PR job for them. Um, I have to say that if I were uh, um, a spy from one of these companies in this conference, um, it, we've been a pretty good advert for their effectiveness. So, of course, I think, you know, we need to develop strategies in order to take on some of these companies, which I'm not going to name. In some cases, uh, they, uh, it may be possible to embarrass uh, some of them. Mr. Gontorea, for instance, can be embarrassed because they like to be seen as the good guys. A lot of these guys like to be seen as the um, effective guys, let's say. Uh, so are there, I mean, it follows on in a sense from your previous comment, are there some effective ways that we can fight back which don't simply do the PR job for them? Yeah. I think that, that question of, of effectiveness is um, often sort of leveled against the SRA in terms of getting any sort of improvement in behavior amongst the legal sector. 
Um, I don't know if there's something around sort of cultural change within the, the legal sector as well to make this kind of behaviour unacceptable. Um, so asking where the money is coming from and those firms, even if they are the effective ones, uh, being outed as those ones that are willing to do anything for anyone, that might end up being their undoing. If we look in the sort of PR world, um, Bell Pottinger's undoing was the work it did in South Africa. So it could potentially be one of these days that one of these law firms goes a bridge too far, represents someone that is beyond the pale, and that could be their undoing. Um, so I think the onus is on all of us to sort of keep the scrutiny on them um, and keep um, keep an eye on who their clients are and, and keep publicising that as much as possible. If I can just add to that, I mean, I, the other pressure point here is the lawyers who work for them. And, and this has, been, has had a degree of success in the United States, in particular younger lawyers coming in and, and joining these law firms. And uh, I don't know if you followed this, but in the US there's been at some of the major universities where these law firms recruit and take huge intake right, <laughs> in, into their lower ranks um, on campuses and especially in those recruitment rounds. Um, students have been standing up and saying, we don't want to work for you if you represent big oil or fossil fuel companies. And um, you know that's not the kind of law firm I want to go and work for. And I think part of what we can do, especially in, in, in connection to slaps and these very aggressive legal tactics, is to start especially um, educating um, students and others who go into these law firms, because the change that can happen from within is huge, as we've seen with Google, as we've seen with some of the other big tech companies. It's the staff that also um, help to make a contribution. The only way we can do that is to keep talking about slaps. It needs to be made, I think, more public, more prominent. And I would also say one of the things that, oddly enough, I find encouraging about the case Tom Burgess is now covering is this is, you know, the Tory party against itself. And actually, if we do want legal change, we're going to need this government to step forward to bring some legal change. And that means showing that this tactic is not just used against journalists, they don't much like. Um, it's also being used against law enforcement. It's being used against some of their own activists. And maybe that will help to galvanize them a bit more to really stand up. Yeah. I think just to sort of um, close this off now, I've got a few, just a few minutes left. Um, just wanted to ask Barish, obviously you're in a very different context to us in the UK. Um, if you could change one thing or bring about one one vital piece of change, what, what would you do to make the, the um, system better for journalists in Turkey? <laughs> well, in the case of Turkey, of course, uh, going back to uh, a parliamentary system, you know, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> but of course, uh, before regime change or whatever, I think, um, I'm just going to repeat, you know, uh, but I think uh, talking about slaps, um, international with international NGOs and, and other international organizations is, is extremely important. Also, I'm, uh, you know, about World Bank and simil similar um, financial institutions, I'm very, um, you know, um, cynical, unfortunately, and I don't want to, um, you know, sound, um, I know, depressing, but in our, what, you know, um, the, these governments like Turkey also use uh, financial mechanisms such as the, you know, anti, um, you know, um, financing of terrorism laws also against journalists and funding and most of the times these actually when you know things like that go and you know are enacted in countries like Turkey Russia whatnot these unfortunately are again um, maybe not ignored but neglected by um, international financial institutions so um, I also uh, can't see you know um, in the case of investors right we thought but for example in the case of Turkey the most um, corrupt five companies which work with the government are also extremely active abroad in countries like Russia you know Poland or oh. construction where uh, where we can't you know really that are not uh, that that are actually home to a lot of slap cases themselves <laughs> so uh, so yes talking about them and secondly without you know um, infringing on you know um, uh, the the guarantee of judges maybe also hold um, more panels or discussions with judges and who are part of the you know judiciary and and uh, also keep this on their agenda when they are reviewing um, you know a petition or an indictment maybe keep this in mind that they could also be um, I mean, of course, obviously, it's up to them to, to um, you know, push ahead with the case. But it just makes me create awareness because lawyers, yes, but also judges and prosecutors are also part of the judiciary. And maybe just, you know, just 
having it in, in the back of their mind that this, uh, you know, this particular plaintiff could be trying to silence a journalist. Mm. Thanks. Um, uh, Barish, can I, can I possibly chip in with a, a slightly more direct strategy that is being talked about? Yeah, go ahead. For a moment. We've got one minute left. Well, it just... It, it goes uh, well, very quickly. It goes. It goes to Martin Bright's point as well about us maybe advertising these guys too highly. Um, it's certainly true that uh, you know a lot of them threatening letters from shillings, Carter Rock and the rest of them are just um, essentially mindless bullying designed to int intimidate people into silence. And it's also true that in uh, again and again when these cases reach court, large parts of them unravel because they're not based on sound um, legal strategies or s sound readings of the law. They are simply there to intimidate and the, one of the strategies that is doing the rounds about among some lawyers who are horrified by where this part of their profession is going is to do with costs ultimately it's all about costs it's about imposing enormous costs on those who try to um expose this wrongdoing right that's the purpose of a slap surely and um and and and, and therefore the question that the, the the strategy that these horrified lawyers are talking about is is whether there could be an argument that in a case that is found to be a slap or some other similar definition, the costs would fall on the law firm that had brought it. I think very quickly you would see a change in their approach. Yeah, turning the tables once again. Um, so I think that just about wraps us up for, for the time being. I can hear stomachs rumbling in the audience here. Uh, so I just wanted to thank our panel members for being excellent. Um, and thank you for being such an engaged audience as well. It's nice to be able to see uh, questions whizzing up on my phone every five seconds. That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our penultimate panel at the Anti-SLAP conference, which is called SLAP, What Next? Those uh, eagle-eyed amongst you will realize that I am not Rebecca Vincent from RSF, who's sadly been delayed in London traffic. So, uh, you know, aside from sort of any concerns of technical issues, turns out there's some issues with, you know, in-person conferences as well. So hopefully Rebecca is winging her way towards us right now. But in the meantime, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our fantastic panelists, three of which are on the stage with me. Uh, and we also have one uh, beaming in from Malta, who's Matthew Caruana Galizia. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing from Matthew not only the impact that SLAPs have had, of course, on his mum, um, and who we've talked about, about during the last couple of days, but also his own experiences in the work that he's tried to, to do in her legacy with the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. So uh, in Rebecca's absence, I'm going to just hand directly straight over to you, Matthew, uh, to hear a little bit about your experiences, the impact on, on you, your mum, but also the wider impact uh, in Malta and then what's happened since. And then hopefully we'll have Rebecca uh, and she'll be able to introduce the rest of the panellists joining us today. Thank you. So, sorry, Matthew, just to stop you, but uh, we can't hear you. We believe you might be muted. Just try, try again, if you can still hear me. Apologies, we'll just see if we can bring you back. Matthew, would you mind unplugging your headphones for us? We think that might be the problem. Sorry. Could you try speaking again? Okay, I think perhaps, I think, yeah. Thank you, Ma uh, Martin, for preempting me. I was about to say, given we're having in person and technical difficulties, let me introduce Martin Bright, who is acting editor at Index of Censorship. So we'd be delighted if you would kick us off and share your experiences. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to a certain extent, I'm slightly uh, embarrassed and in awe of um, following on from uh, Matthew or speaking with Matthew. Um, we're talking about the impact of slaps here today and I have a sorry tale to tell, but it's as nothing as compared to the story of what happened in Malta. Um, but bear with me, because I think it shows something of the historical context. Uh, it's a 20-year-old story, uh, and um, in some ways it's uh, a parable, in some ways it's uh, a model of how this situation we find ourselves in now came to be. Uh, it involves a character called Nadmi Auchi, who I first came across in the early 2000s when I was working at the Observer newspaper. <clears throat> We'd received a tip off from, uh, actually from the Conservative Party, about the Labour Party, because that's often the way it happens, um, that they'd received a large donation from this Iraqi British billionaire. Nothing unusual in this, particularly. At the time, the Labour Party was in its pomp, and everyone wanted to be Tony Blair's friend. The only problem was that Mr. Auchi was wanted for fraud in France. Uh, so, great story, rather simple story to tell. Um, Auchi had been named as a key middleman in the giant, sprawling Elf Aquitaine scandal, which reached to the very highest levels of the French government. The oil company was paying bribes across Africa and the Middle East, a pattern that would be very familiar to people who've been speaking throughout this conference. Um, and they've been paying these to win contracts and gain advantage for French interests. A Labour politician called Keith Vaz was effectively working for Mr. Auchi, um, but he was not the only politician on his board. Um, the former Liberal Democrat leader, Lord Steele, was on his board. Uh, former Conservative Chancellor, Norman Lamont, uh, also working for him, 
And Auchi, it turned out, was a collector of politicians, I reckon. Um, Jacques Santerre, the former president of the European Commission, is still on his board. Uh, this is quite a board, right? I mean, this is extraordinary. Um, and in fact, later on, Auchi even tried to suck Barack Obama into his circle of influence. <laughs> Uh, this was someone, quite clearly, who believed he could act beyond the boundaries of the nation-state. Um, and he operated, let's say, I mean, one of the reasons I'm reading rather than sort of just speaking about this, because I do know this story incredibly well, is I have to be very careful about what I'm saying. So let's say he had a creative approach to the normal rules of business. And for a while, Mr. Auchi was the gift that kept giving. Uh, I followed his trial for fraud in France, went there, sat in court, saw him receive his conviction, lengthy suspended sentence. In a series of stories, we looked closely into Auchi's past and present business dealings, uh, and others followed our lead. <laughs> stories started appearing about this man in The Telegraph, The Times, the international press. <laughs> and it became particularly embarrassing when um, Auchi's alleged links to a Chicago businessman called Tony Rezco were revealed. Now, Rezco was a Syrian-American fundraiser for the Democrat Party um, who eventually ended up with a 10-year prison sentence for corruption. Uh, uh, meanwhile, Auchi was refused an entry visa to the United States. It was all looking great, right? Mm -hmm. So far, so good. The net appeared to be closing on our guy. Enter Carter Ruck. Uh, in the mid-2000s, someone advised Mr. Auchi to hire the UK's most effective law firm, libel firm. And it was the best advice he ever received. It allowed Carter Ruck to develop a prototype of the sophisticated modern slap action, which they've used to great effect ever since. And remember who you're talking about here, right? Um, to be slightly careful here, but this is a man who has been convicted of a major international fraud in France, whose reputation is so damaged that he can't even travel to the United States. The Carter Ruck strategy was quite brilliant. They began writing to every UK newspaper who'd ever written about Auchi, and simply stated they would sue, or he would sue, if they did not remove stories about their client from the website. The Observer, who I was working for, initially, uh, I mean, we initially laughed at this letter, um, and we pointed out to our lawyers that this man didn't really have a reputation to defend. He was a convicted fraudster. Now, Carter Ruck immediately shot back and said that the word fraudster was difficult for them because it implied a repeated action, uh, and their client had a single conviction for fraud. They also pointed out that the conviction was in France, and therefore we would need to prove the allegations of fraud from scratch in the UK, in, in a UK law court. The lawyers at the Observer kind of shuffled their feet a little bit at this point, a uh, little bit nervous, uh, but they pushed back and actually went away. They have to remember at the time, it's hard to, hard to think this now, at the time it was almost a badge of honour to be sued in a UK newspaper. It was like, you know, you, you, you'd have colleagues slapping you on the back. It was, it was thought to be a sign of you doing your job correctly. Um, but things were changing. Uh, in 2005, I joined the New Statesman as, the, as, as that magazine's political editor. And while I was there, I noticed that articles about Mr. Auchi were disappearing from the web. So all these um, threats from Carter Ruck were beginning to work. The whitewashing of his reputation was gathering pace. At the time, I'd done some work with um, Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks, and we had a conversation about this story and uh, agreed to collaborate on a small publishing venture. We gathered as many articles as we could that were still around about Mr. Auchi and created an archive to save these uh, for posterity. And they are still there. Although, most of them have been re removed from the public record from the newspapers. I then wrote a short blog post for the New Statesman. I'm um, losing my place here, a bit like Boris Johnson, sorry. Um, 
I will, will save you from Peppa Pig at this point. Um, uh, I wrote a short blog post for the New Statesman expressing my disappointment that our brave national newspapers uh, had backed down in the face of these libel threats. I also linked, I put a little link in to the cache of articles. And Carter Ruck struck back immediately, arguing that the link effectively represented the republication of all those articles. Um, I'm going to name some names here. Um, the New Statesman's editor, Jason Cowley, still the editor, and owner, Mark Danson, still the owner, folded immediately. They agreed to remove the post, pay substantial damages uh, and costs, and apologise. Um, this was not enough for Ouchie and Carter Ruck, who demanded a personal apology from me. <laughs> now, I found this really difficult because I was effectively being asked to apologise on behalf of all these other journalists who'd written all these other articles, right? Uh, uh, I was effectively being asked to say that they were wrong. Uh, when I refused, uh, the magazine cut me loose and I was on my own. Over Christmas 2008, uh, with two small children, uh, I faced losing everything. Uh, my job, my house, my livelihood. <laughs> The fact that this did not happen, I owe to the National Union of Journalists, who funded my case, and to another UK law firm, and this may come as a surprise to you, uh, Mish Gondorea, uh, and Anthony Julius, um, the head of that firm, who agreed to represent me at a reduced rate initially, and then when the NUJ's money ran out for free. Ouchie eventually walked away, because like so many people we've been talking about, he had absolutely no intention of going to court. He just wanted to close the stories down. <coughs> uh, as it happened, he chose to walk away on New Year's Day, so I was uh, left to spend Christmas of that year wondering whether I was going to lose everything, but then received a letter on the 1st of January of the next year. Um, and I seriously believe that, you know, though he walked away, he had dragged British journalism's reputation through the mud in the process. On the matter of legal letters, which we've discussed, um, I made the decision to share the Carter Ruck threat letter uh, with Julian Assange to warn him that they'd be coming for him next. Julian, in his uh, inimitable style, uh, published it on WikiLeaks <laughs> immediately. Um, I should have known he would do that, really. Uh, that's what he does. Uh, <laughs> And this was then used by my employers to remove me from my job. Um, settlement I received was contingent on an NDA, which I subsequently ignored, obviously, and indeed I'm ignoring today. And I used my um, payoff uh, to set up a youth employment charity. So what happened to Ouchie? Well, he was granted the freedom of the City of London in 2013. Uh, he was last seen in British politics cozying up to Nick Clegg on a Liberal Democrat platform. Lord Steele is still on his board. The Carter Ruck website boasts of its work, I mean quite rightly in a way, boasts of its work in silencing publications that wrote about their client. He is a real success story for them. No one really writes about Ouchie anymore, which is how he likes it. So, he won, right? Um, but there is a slight uh, coda to this story. <clears throat> Just last year, the EU Observer was threatened with litigation over an article about a disinformation campaign against Daphne Carana Galizia, allegedly carried out by a former Luxembourg spy called Frank Schneider and the private intelligence firm Sandstone. Sandstone. And guess who owns Sandstone? Nadmi Auchi. Thank you, Martin, and hello. I'm really sorry to be a little bit late joining you uh, this morning, or this afternoon, rather. Um, Rebecca Vincent from Reporters Without Borders, and we've worked closely with many of the NGOs in this room together on our collective anti-slap efforts, which we've been hearing a lot about in every panel so far. Um, can I just check if we're able to bring in Matthew Caruana Galizia? Is, the, is he online now? Great. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Rebecca. Can you oh, hear great. me we now? We can hear you. Okay. 
Um, Matthew's joining us from Malta, of course, where he runs the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation uh, in his mother's name. Uh, Matthew himself is a journalist and <coughs> will speak to us today about uh, not only the slap cases that plagued his mother, um, but the continued situation, I believe, in Malta. Um, and Matthew often doesn't add this, but as moderator, I'm going to prod him on this a bit to, to talk about the cases against him as well, as much as he's able to. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm glad that Martin went first, actually, because <laughs> I, I think his, um, uh, the way he ended his story, like, allows me to continue from that really well. Um, I followed that that case uh, by Sandstone and Fra Frank Schneider really closely because um, it's it was about something that concerned me directly, which is the fight for justice for my mother. Um, and the the sad thing is that, and this is why this campaign against slaps is still so important to us. Um, I mean, to my family, is that my mother was threatened many times with defamation lawsuits. Um, and those threats were carried out. I mean, she was fighting close to 50 libel suits by the time of her murder, all at once. I mean, those were the ones that were ongoing, not counting the ones that had been fought off. But after her murder, um, as journalists tried to continue her investigative work, um, w worked on the investigation into her assassination itself, those same journalists were threatened with defamation action. And that, of course, includes the journalists at EU Observer um, that Martin mentioned. But it also includes the journalists who carried on investigations into, for example, um, Pilatus Bank, a particular private bank in Malta that my mother was investigating um, for its use by organized criminal groups to, to launder money. I mean, organized criminal groups made up of high-level politicians. Um, and the pattern that we saw in that case was near identical to what Martin describes, where we ignored the slap threats against my mother. I mean, we campaigned against them, but we simply didn't respond to them legally, didn't take the threat seriously, because we had the same, um, we made the same judgment that uh, the, the plaintiff simply didn't want to go to, or rather those threatening the action, didn't want to go to court at all. Um, they simply wanted to threaten us into submission. Um, but what we noticed is that articles connected to this particular bank were slowly disappearing off the internet. And when we made an effort to find out why, either the editors of those media organizations didn't want to talk about it, or some um, very kind of anxiously uh, passed, us on, passed on to us the legal threats that they had received and we're adamant that we should not discuss any of it publicly. Um, the threats of legal action force these media organizations into submission. How were they able to do this? Media organizations have, especially in Malta, um, have very small budgets for legal defense. And they correctly want to spend the majority of their time working on their reports rather than defending them in court. Um, for most media organizations, this is, again, correctly seen as a waste of time. They just want to move on with the work. And I agree with them. They should be free to focus on their investigative work. But, of course, I disagree that the solution to that is to have the articles deleted from the public record. The majority of these articles are of significant public interest. And very often we're proven right when it's too late, when the person making the threats is arrested for committing another crime, perhaps. Um, so we're proposing, together with other uh, international various solutions that include defense funds, um, assistance in campaigning about the legal threat and kind of 
um, making it a public uh, public relations problem for the companies that are making the threats. But again, these are all what I think are effective solutions, but we do not wish to spend the rest of our lives as campaigners doing the same thing, um, campaigning against individual slap actions. I just feel like we're on a hamster wheel doing this. Um, so our key campaign point is changing the situation permanently. How, we can, how can we do this? Changing the laws that govern the procedures around defamation, um, both in jurisdictions that are frequently used as, um, as a kind of launching pad for defamation action, like the UK, but also across the entire European Union. Now, the really important thing to say is that the, the European Union's focus and national government's focus currently is um, defending journalists against cross-border actions in cases where governments are doing something um, to fight back against slaps. But it's just really important to remind everyone that the majority of cases are not cross-border cases even though these might be the ones that rank most, among the most damaging because the costs are so punitively high. But the majority of cases remain national ones. And this is particularly true for my mother. Yes, she was sued in the United States. And yes, she was threatened with defamation lawsuits that would have bankrupted her by Mishkondereya in London. But the majority of the cases against her were national cases it's really important to remind everyone about this. So um, our, our focus in attacking slaps, I believe, really has to remain there. We should start by eliminating the threat of cross-border cases as much as possible. Um, but our focus really has to be on the, on the national cases. Thanks, Matthew, um, and really great that you've already started to get into some solutions and, and strategic approaches here, which I'd like to return to a bit later in the discussion. Um, Matthew, could you maybe, in a bit more detail, describe the impact that these cases had on your mother when she was still alive, when she was still working? What was the impact on, of this on her day-to-day -day life and her journalism? It's, I think, there are so many journalists out there who can relate to this experience because it's become such a commonplace problem where you spend the majority of your time as a journalist. Um, I mean, first of all, you do incredibly diligent work. Almost all of the journalists I know do incredibly diligent work before publication where you check every single thing um you go to all of the people mentioned in the story and get a comment from them have a very lengthy back and forth with all of the people involved when they respond um your articles are checked by numerous lawyers um so there's this incredible work that goes into every single article that the public simply never sees they just imagine that journalists are sitting there at their co computers, they get a tip, type up the story, and it goes out to publish. It's really not like that. Um, and in effect, we're kind of punished for doing this work. So we do our work really diligently. And then when it gets out, we have to deal with all of the post-publication threats. And this was, this was the case for my mother, too. So she had these incredible sources and she did everything she could to protect them. And based on these sources, she was really sure of the, investig of, of the reports that she published. But it's, it's again, like has been said over and over again, the objective is not to show that the journalist was wrong. It's simply to shut them up. And very often this is done um, before cases go to trial. The problem for journalists like my mother is that the majority of the expenses are incurred before the trial. So my mother was constantly in and out of court. Um, she forked out tens of thousands of euros for the si simply to respond um, to the lawsuits. Bear in mind that if you don't respond, 
you you lose by default. The judge has no choice, or the magistrate in Malta's case has no choice but to find against the defendant. Um, so not only she, was she spending huge amounts of money that she should have spent on her investigations, on improving her website, um, perhaps on personal things like going on holiday, which is something she rarely ever got to do. Um, instead, she was having to spend the majority of her money on defending against libel cases and the majority of her time on appearing in court. Well, one of the quirks about Malta that is still surprising to people internationally, I think, as well, is the fact that these lawsuits against Daphne continued posthumously. In fact, a few of them still remain open to this day. Um, those are it's so crazy by the that I forget that sometimes. Yeah, so I'm reminding, and I'll get you to speak a bit about it, if, that, if that's okay, Matthew. If I'm not mistaken, it's the suits brought by the former Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, former Minister for Tourism, also known as the Panama Papers Minister, Conrad Mitzi, that remain open to this day. And Matthew, in fact, uh, Joseph Muscat is still suing you, is that correct? Yes, it's unbelievable. I mean, Joseph Muscat, the former Prime Minister of Malta, is still suing my dead mother. It's just a completely crazy situation. Um, there were more than 10 other lawsuits. I believe there were about 30 that continued against my mother after her death. Um, we fought these down to about four or five, if I remember correctly, from, from about 30 to 40. Um, the, among the very few that still continue against my mother, um, that the former politicians have chosen to continue against my dead mother are the ones filed by Conrad Mitzi, the former Minister of Energy, um, and the former Prime Minister of Malta, Joseph Muscat, who is also suing me, yes, over a Facebook post where I described a hypothetical scenario. When I asked him about that, he said that your mother destabilized the nation with her reporting and that you were repeating the same story and he refused to drop it and to this day it <laughs> continues. Um, I mean, what the prime minister, what the former prime minister is saying there is that their corruption was so bad that reporting on that very corruption destabilized the nation. <laughs> <laughs> their response well, so instead of justice for the corruption was to shoot the messenger. Almost literally. Exactly. Well, your mother's case is really special to so many of us, um, in part because it was the entry point for many of our organizations in working on SLAP. We all know more about this issue because of the work that Matthew and his family have done on the ground. Um, and it's really honed how we're able to respond to these sorts of cases internationally. So a little bit later, I'll bring in Flutura to talk about some of the tools available and, and what uh, journalists facing these kind of threats can do, because it's really, as you're hearing, not just in this panel, but in other panels too, it's eerily similar country to country, regardless of the context, uh, the types of threats uh, that journalists are facing. Um, I'll bring in now Katie Barker, um, who is um, an investigative reporter with BuzzFeed News, um, who has also faced her own experience, um, a bit different to the others, but maybe Katie, I'll let you explain a bit yourself and maybe have a few questions for you as well. Thank you so much for having me, and it's really cathartic, honestly, to hear about other people's experiences, because it can be very lonely to go through something like this, and it's just really really great to you know remember you're not really great to you know remember you're not alone even as depressing as, as these stories are it's, it's also you know it's it's helpful to, to know that there's solidarity um, so I'm currently involved in ongoing litigation in the US and also in Ireland interestingly um, a country that I've never been and no one involved in the case has, has is, um, lives in so I can't comment on that litigation because it's ongoing but I can talk a little bit about how my um, I, I think the legal threats against reporters like me who report on sexual violence and sexual assault have changed and gotten worse in my experience over the past decade so um, for yeah for over a decade I've reported primarily on sexual violence sexual misconduct and usually about institutions so about um, like billion dollar companies and Ivy League universities and powerful people and, and how they respond to allegations of sexual misconduct. So I'm no stranger to legal threats and, um, I, and I'll be talking mostly about the US, which obviously the laws there are different than here, but um, most, of, most of my work, I work for a US company even though I'm based here. And 
And I would say that there's two things that, um, that I think have led to it being the, the legal threats changing over the past few years. One of them was the Hulk Hogan versus Gawker lawsuit. I don't know, I, I won't go into the details here, but basically uh, this former wrestler Hulk Hogan sued this online news publication Gawker. It was a privacy case, it wasn't a defamation case. Gawker had posted this sex tape and um, it, it's, it's a long story, but essentially the Gawker lost. Um, a jury awarded Hulk Hogan 100, over $100 million um, in Florida. And Peter, it came out that Peter Thiel, the billionaire um, PayPal founder, is on Facebook board, I think. He was funding the whole thing. And at the time, I think a lot of journalists kind of ignored, or not ignored, but didn't really pay too much attention. It was a weird lawsuit. It was kind of a gross situation all around. I think a lot of journalists thought, well, you know, Gawker shouldn't have posted this tape, but it had a real chilling effect on the media. And from then on, a lot of the legal threats I would get would, would oh, because Gawker shut down. So um, Peter Thiel and Hulk Hogan effectively shut shut this this website down. And so after that, even when I was getting threats for defamation, no, not privacy, they, you know, the threats would say, well, look at what happened with Gawker. You don't want that to happen to you. I know that's something a lot of other journalists have experienced. And then also I think that um, the, our former president, Donald Trump, his um, election really changed a lot for me in my experience in two ways. Um, first, he appointed over 200 federal judges and um, some of those judges are making really alarming t- decisions um, in regards to press freedoms right now. But more generally, he really created this culture of this war against the media where, you know, like we were just discussing, most journalists are, you know, I, I check, you know, my stories are fact checked, legal. I work so hard to make sure there is not one error in that story. But Trump really gave um, the impression to people that journalists are just, they all have an agenda. They're making everything up. They're, you know, they're, there's kind of a war against the, um, the people, you know, good people of America against journalists. and. I, you know, the threats I used to get in regards to these stories used to be about the facts of my stories, and those I never really cared that much about because I, I always stand by the facts of my stories. But after Trump, I got the impression that um, the, de- the, ca- the defamation threats I was getting were less about, you know, asking for a correction or, you know, demanding something was different. It was more about this idea that if this case got to a jury or, or kind of, you know, got into a jurisdiction that would be more favorable, um, it would, they could be, they could prove that I had an, like a Me Too agenda, um, obviously, especially after Me Too. So instead of going after the details of my story, the threat started to be more like, you know, you're just reporting on this because of your liberal bias, your Me Too agenda. And I, you know, many of my sources are Republicans. I, you know, I report on people from all over the political spectrum and, I, you know, it was very kind of alarming to me to see this change because it's confusing to know how to respond to that because it's not it's not really based in the reality of your reporting. It's it's based in the culture wars essentially, um, and so yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's really taken a toll on me personally to have to. Um, kind of put in the additional, you know, we, we always put in lots of work vetting our stories and making sure they're legally sound and that's part of my job and I'm always happy to do that. But the um, increase I've seen in legal threats and litigation has, it's very taxing. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to somebody, another lawyer who said that as a journalist, our job is to um, figure out why someone's doing what they're doing. And, you know, if someone, if someone is, is, covering something up or, or, you know, funding some company, you go, well, why are they doing this? What's, the, what's their motivation? And you're, you get to the bottom of it. But when someone sues you, you can't do, you know, I think the, the instinct is to say, like, why is this happening to me? There's no errors in my story. There's no corrections on it. Um, why, why, you know, I'm such a careful reporter. How could someone possibly sue me? But the lawsuits aren't necessarily about you or your story. They're about, you know, um, these kind of larger political purposes and, and also, you know, defending the person's reputation and all of that. But that's kind of what I've seen in the, re- in recent years that it, it almost feels like not really about me. And, and it, it's very confusing and, and, and stressful to deal with. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of sums it up for me, but it's, it's great to be here and hear everyone else's stories. 
I'm interested in the case in Ireland in particular, and as you noted, you didn't have any connections there. Um, Ireland has extremely high uh, defamation awards, and so it can be a really scary jurisdiction, I think, if you face a suit like this. Um, how, how did that impact you when you found that out? Has it impacted your work at all? Is it something now that you have to be conscious of going forward in this jurisdiction that maybe hadn't even occurred to you before? Yeah, I, you know, I wish I could say more about this case. I can't go into detail. I will say that I had no idea that I could be sued in another country that, um, you know, as I said, I'm not Irish. The person suing me is not Irish. My colleague isn't Irish. I, I live in the UK. You know, I've, I've never been to, it, been to Ireland. And, you know, it's it, if I have to go to court, it'll be in Dublin. You know, it's it's not it's not Northern Ireland. It's the Republic of Ireland. So, um, I yeah, it was... I genuinely had no idea that was even a possibility, but um, people are allowed to, you know, um, you can argue that even if just a few people um, read the story in a country, you can go try and try your luck there and sue there. And, you know, to me, I went, well, wouldn't, wouldn't someone think it was a bit embarrassing to, you know, for an American not even to sue me here, to sue me in a, a totally different country? But yeah, it's, I didn't even know it was possible. So no, I, I wouldn't say it's something I'm worrying about in terms of my work. And I'm really lucky. I'm a, I'm a staff writer. Um, I have amazing legal representation. I do not know how I would deal with this if I were a freelancer. I mean, it would affect the stories I did, no question. Um, I'm very lucky that my costs are, you know, paid for by my company because that, you know, they're suing my company, um, not just me. So, so yeah, I, you know, we are, we are pushing through, and we are just really making sure our reporting is is as strong and as accurate as can be. And we're just, you know, trying to do it despite these these legal threats. But it's definitely, I mean, I don't think any of us got into this profession to do this, right? Like, I, I didn't become a journalist because I wanted to go to court in, in Ireland for, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's hard, you know, I'm joking about it, but it, it is, it's, it's a bizarre part of my job that I never expected to have to deal with. I was struck by your comment that these types of cases are often not really about you, even though it can impact you so deeply on a personal level. Um, I guess I'm shifting a bit more to the solution side that we'll get into later, but would, do you have any advice just based on your own experience if others find themselves in the same position? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm still going through it, so I think that it's hard for me to know, you know, like maybe I'll feel differently after after this all is, is resolved, you know, hopefully, um, knock on wood, um, with, you know, for the better, but I think I would say what, what that person told me that I brought up earlier, just that don't try and figure out why it's happening to you, you know, in the U.S., maybe, you know, there, these are kind of personal injury attorneys just looking to make money. Um, I remember he said maybe someone at a barbecue just mentioned to the the person suing you, you know, why don't you prove that you didn't do anything wrong and, and try your luck? Like, like it doesn't, ne it doesn't necessarily mean that you um, deserve what's happening to you. And especially like, you know, in my case, um, there's no corrections on my stories. There's, there's no errors in it. Not, you know, nothing's been requested like that. It's, it's, it's much different than that. And I think just remembering, you know, I have no idea why this is happening to me and it, it feels very unfair and unjust and as journalists we care a lot about justice but you have to kind of just compartmentalize it and the thing with a lawsuit is, I mean, at least with my lawsuits, it's like a lot will happen at, you know, for a week or so and then you don't really have to think about it for six months and then, you know, a lot will happen and this goes on for years and you have to just kind of push it out of your mind and at first I found that kind of impossible, but it's been years now that I've been dealing with the one in the U.S. and I just, you know, I just try not to think about it, but, I, you know, maybe I'll, I would, I would love more advice myself. Certainly. Well, we'll bring in Flutra in a minute who will have some advice um, and can point you in the right direction, although you're well supported by now, I'm sure. Um, I'm also interested in the parallels, I think, between the, the sort of Me Too reporting and actually SLAP, because one of the things that has made such a big difference in the last few years is that people have started to speak out about this, because before, um, I think often, people would keep it to themselves, would comply possibly quietly, or would be scared to, to publicize what's happened to them. And I think it's really courageous. Um, you, Katie, and every other person who has spoken in the past two days who is, who is taking a stand and fighting back. Um, I think there is strength in numbers, and we're all here to support you. Thanks so much. So um, I will, because we haven't had any questions from the online audience, I will just take a moment to point out you can uh, use the chat function to put a question. I will see it here, and we'll open the floor up to questions in, um, in a few minutes' time. And of course, those here in the room is, as well are welcome uh, to ask questions. Can I just respond just briefly on the, on the, on the solidarity point? Uh, I mean, solidarity is everything. Yeah. Um, and there are a number of organizations in the room that specialize in, in solidarity for journalists. And we are so grateful. Um, I think 
it's been a little bit of a long time coming with slap cases, actually. Uh, we, well, I mean, I was very used to working on, for instance, official secrecy cases, a number of official secrecy cases over the years. And there's a kind of romance about that kind of case that means that if you're taking on the government, you're taking on the intelligence services, then people know what to do. They know that there's going to be a big case uh, at a big criminal court. The banners come out. You have the solidarity of your fellow journalists. And you know how to run that kind of campaign. But there's something slightly different about, about slap cases. And I think certainly 20 years ago when I was involved in, in, in my case, yes, there was a certain amount of, I suppose, embarrassment, shame involved in these kinds of cases where people don't really want to talk about them. You know, I was, I was certainly in dispute with my, my own magazine. I kind of just wanted to get away from there. Uh, and it is, I think, hugely to the tribute of the organizations that are getting together with this fantastic coalition that that, that, that really is changing. There are places to go. People do have networks uh, and, and that people can turn to others for advice. So I think, you know, that's a positive. That's something that really needs to be celebrated. Part of the fight back. Yeah. Um, Flutura, um, you are one of the most active people, I think, in this room, at, at least on the European level, in terms of um, championing our collective anti-slap efforts and providing concrete support to journalists. Um, maybe, in, in fact, in case you weren't introduced properly earlier, uh, you're the legal advisor for ECPM at the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom. Um, Flutura, could you maybe tell us a bit about how, um, how the coalition work has shaped up, what resources are available to journalists who find themselves in this position? Thank you, Rebecca. First of all, just to say that it has been very difficult for me to, to be with this panel because it just reminds me, and I hope I will not start crying, but it reminds me that slap destroy lives. Um, I've been in contact and we are friends with Martin for two years now. We've been working together in the case of Jonathan Taylor, but I didn't know about his personal um, <laughs> story. Thank you for sharing it. And also every time I hear Matthew and Daphne's family speaking about these cases, it's just, it reminds us that for all these people involved in slaps, it's very difficult. It, you, you pay a personal price, yeah. no matter what happens with the, with the case in, in the end. Um, it, yesterday we already discussed about the work that we are doing at European level with a lot of organizations. And I said this yesterday and I will say this today that at European level, we were able to achieve quite a lot. We have pushed all European institutions to address slaps. You have a report uh, published by the European Parliament. You have uh, Vera Europa and the European Commission being quite active. And you have some very good positive news from Council of Europe for a potential recommendation. And we owe this um, achievement to Daphne Caruana Galicia and her family. Um, and I can't thank enough Daphne's family, especially Matthew, for being so active. Because you, they are fighting on, so, on several fronts. They have all this work that ha they have to do in, in Malta. And then on top of this, you have the anti-slap work, which, as I mentioned yesterday, it has become a full-time job for all of us. Now, we try as ECPMF, but also as, as the case uh, coalition, we try to help journalists. Um, the support we provide cannot even be compared with the resources that are available for rich people, businessmen and politicians. What we try to do first as, as ECPMF, we have a legal support program which provides financial support to journalists in, in need. This program started in 2015, and at that time we had uh, a budget, please don't laugh, 10,000 euros. Um, but because there were so many applications coming in and, re and journalists asking for financial support, we have now around 100,000 euros available per year. We support journalists between 1,000 to 15,000 euros, depending on the case. For example, in uh, Poland and Croatia, we help journal uh, media houses with 15,000 euros because of the large amount of, of, of cases. Um, we've supported around 100 journalists in different jurisdictions, mainly EU, but also candidate countries, including also other countries uh, outside of, of the EU, such as Moldova, etc. Um, as I said, this is very minor 
support compared to what is needed, but this is what we can do. I think what helps is the collaboration we have with other organizations, MLDI, uh, FPU, Rural Pact Trust, they also have legal funds and we collaborate very well together because there is so much need. We are uh, able, for example, in cases where a journalist or a media house requires quite a lot of money, we come together, we put a fund together and we, we support them. I think beyond, you know, it, getting money for lawyers' fees is very important, but I think, and I thank uh, Martin because he reminds us of, of this, of the importance of, of showing solidarity with, with journalists. What has helped very often is not only the money that we sup we've provided, but also um, the advocacy around the cases. We were able to organize, mobilize ourselves very uh, quickly. An example of this is the EU Observer case. We were quite active on, on the case that you mentioned, uh, Martin, and I think the lawsuit never materialized, so we yeah. can get a bit of credit for, for that. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so we were able to offer this package of, of services, which is the legal support, is uh, statements of support co-signed by a lot of organizations, and in extreme cases, we're also able to bring journalists to Leipzig to stay there for up to six months, um, and we would provide all the financial support, etc. So this is kind of a combination of, of support. And now with the Case Coalition, what we're trying to do is to um, uh, to continue this work that a lot of organizations are, are doing. Uh, uh, lu we're lucky we've gotten some uh, financial support, and the idea is to continue the this work with the Case Coalition at European level. <coughs> Thank you, Flutara. Um, I will open the floor to questions in a minute, so please think of your questions. Um, but we are going to have one intervention from the floor first, um, and that is from Sibyl Raphael, the legal director at Protect UK, and she's going to speak to us a little bit about how these issues also impact whistleblowers, who, from RSS perspective, are often journalistic sources, so we work on them in our press freedom mandate as well. Thanks. Um, yes, indeed, it's not uh, just against journalists that uh, slap happen. It's also uh, against uh, workers, employees, raising their concerns to their employers, to the regulator, or indeed to um, the press. We have protection in the UK, in the UK employment law, so it is illegal for an employer to dismiss an employee um, or victimise an employee who has blown the whistle. And the law also says that gagging clauses that prevent you from making a protected disclosure are, are void. But that's completely worthless. If workers are made to sign NDAs just like Martin had to, that forbid them to talk to anyone in extremely violent terms. And unlike Martin, they may not have access to legal advice from Mishkan Duraya telling them that's fine, you can completely ignore that. Um, it's also completely worthless if you have the threat hanging over you of being dragged to the High Court for a breach of confidentiality, even if you won your employment tribunal case. So it's the same problems that we've heard uh, today and yesterday, the sort of inequality of arms. It's completely worthless for employers to go to the High Court for a breach of confidentiality claim against one of their employees. In terms of money, they're unlikely to recover um, any sort of meaningful damages. But, but in terms of um, you know, time and resources that, um, that um, the worker is going to have to um, um, you know, um, um, allocate to that, of course that makes perfect sense. Um, Martin also mentioned the Official Secrets Act. Again, if you work in the public service, um, your employer may tell you that anything you say will fall full uh, of the OSA, um, and it doesn't have a public interest defense at the moment, and you risk imprisonment um, if you mention anything, even if it's um, in the public interest. So our beautiful legal rights um, are uh, meaningless. And I have to confess to all the journalists in this room, I'm the legal director at Protect. We've been founded in 93. We've advised more than 45,000 whistleblowers to date. When we have a worker who calls us and says, hey, I've blown the whistle, I've been approached by the press, I want to tell them my story. The first thing we say is, oh, be careful, it's extremely dangerous. It will ruin your life, it will destroy your life, potentially. <laughs> um, um, so, um, you know, um, we think it's absolutely crucial for um, um, our well-being in the, in, in, you know, at work to be in a psychologically safe place where you know you can report things when they go wrong. We think it's a basic human rights, it's part 
of your freedom of expression. We also think it's a corner of democracy. Um, so we think that law needs to be changed to protect uh, whistleblowers and media freedom uh, better. And it's not just defamation, it's also employment law and it's also things like the Official Secrets Act. And we also think that um, maybe culture needs to be changed and the way we look at um, this sharing of information, the, you know, the whole framework of society um, also needs to be reviewed. Thank you, Sabil. And as you've touched on the Official Secrets Act, it's worth noting that here in the UK, not only does our law lack a public interest defence, we're now facing some extremely alarming proposals by the Home Office that will make it easy to label journalists, whistleblowers and others as spies with a prison sentence of up to 14 years for simply engaging in normal journalistic activity. So this is one of the most disturbing pieces of legislation I've seen uh, from a press freedom perspective since we've opened our bureau here for sure. Um, and that's not even an example of slap because it's not even an abuse of the law in that case. It's applying the law uh, as it's intended. So just a flag for those uh, interested in these issues here in the UK, we've got a big fight coming. And of course, in other jurisdictions, for example, the US Espionage Act, that also lacks a public interest defense, which is why we're able to see many of the cases uh, targeting whistleblowers and now a publisher, Julian Assange, as well in that jurisdiction. Um, I've got no questions coming in online, so one more just shout out to our virtual audience um, to please type in questions. You have about 20 minutes left to do so. Uh, for now, I'm going to go in, in the room here. Uh, if we can get a mic over to Jessica, and then I'll come over to you next. Um, hello, I'm Jessica um, from Index on Censorship as well. Um, but my, Kate, uh, my question is for Katie. Um, first of all, Katie, maybe I should do what Oliver did earlier. And, and as an Irish person, I should apologize to you for being subject to <laughs> our defamation laws. Um, but um, um, thank you for raising it, even though you can't speak that much about it. But um, can you, I wonder if you could tell us, uh, the lawyer who is representing uh, the individual who is suing you, um, there are some uh, particularly famous, I won't say infamous uh, lawyers who are acting in this regard. Um, maybe I can name uh, Paul Tweed as one who is acting. You got uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. For the record, that was Paul uh -huh. Tweed. <laughs> <laughs> What's Just repeating. Um, and yes, a question here, and then I'll come to you, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. Stephen DL, uh, independent Russia analyst, uh, although my question doesn't concern Russia, and I haven't worked full time as a journalist for some years now. Um, I listened to some of the sessions online yesterday. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. One thing that um, worries me greatly is what we're hearing. If I, if I had hair, my hair would be standing on end um, with some of the things I've heard. Um, but I just what worries me is if you go out on the street and stop someone and ask them, do they know about SLAP? Do they know about what's going on? They won't. And it seems to me there's something of a vicious circle here because journalists are being threatened therefore it's difficult for journalists to talk about it therefore people aren't people in the wider world aren't getting to hear about it um how do how do you square that circle how do you get out of that uh situation where people don't know about it so don't see how scary it is and how, how worrying it is um without telling them about it and therefore risking being sued does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I don't. Do you want to direct that to anybody in particular, or shall we bring in maybe fl who, who would like to take that first, Flutura and Martin? Uh, I'm happy to take that initially. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right, and you're you're right to think that this is uh, a situation we should be. Well, all our collective hair should be standing on end. Um, I think one of the problems is that what's shifted from the time when it was a point of honour to have a libel suit to now, is that the financial model of newspapers in particular has collapsed. So whereas previously there had been something uh, of an equality of arms, that just is not there anymore. Uh, we're in a position where local newspapers in particular in this country do not fight libel actions. Right? So if you are written about and you are relatively wealthy in the regions in the UK, you would be well advised to sue, right? Because, because the newspaper will collapse, it, they will fold and they will not fight it. And unfortunately that is increasingly becoming the case uh, with national newspapers. What happens is that they, they make a judgment. Is this story big enough to fight? Who cares about this obscure kleptocrat in some part of the country or some part of the world that nobody really knows about? Um, 
we, we managed to get the story in the paper. We hoped that no one would sue. They've sued, so therefore we can just pull it off the website. No one's going to even notice. Um, I can only hope that new models of uh, journalism, I mean, your publication is one of them, uh, can operate in a way that gives them uh, some sort of robust status that will allow them to fight back. But at present, yeah, I mean, you're right, your analysis is correct, and I think it comes back to the financial model of our, of our newspapers. And I'd say, I mean, I'm really grateful to BuzzFeed News. My employer, um, they fight these cases really strongly, and um, we have an incredible track record, and our, our lawyers are fantastic. But the, I do think that the toll it takes on the journalist, um, him or herself, you know, on me, it's like, I, I was, you know, if BuzzFeed keeps fighting these lawsuits for years, I mean, that also means that I have to participate in it, in it for years, and I can see why a journalist might at some point just go, you know, um, let me get back to my work, I'll let it go. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I, it's it's really difficult to, to keep up the fight, especially when it does feel so isolating and you don't want to talk about it or can't talk about it with other people. Can I just say two things very quickly? One is very often in discussions about SLAP, we end <laughs> up uh, looking for solutions from journalists, but this is not a problem of journalists. It's a, it's a problem which needs the intervention of politicians, governments, international organizations. And I am hopeful because three years ago when we started to, to talk to people in the European Commission and Council of Europe, they didn't want to discuss this topic. Now it's the opposite. They want to address slaps. Um, so I'm hopeful. I'm more optimistic than, than you. <laughs> that, that's true, <laughs> but at the same time, those newspapers that pulled down those articles about Nadby Auchi are a disgrace. Absolutely. I mean, they, they need, you know, newspapers do need to show some metal here because they, they, have a, they have a duty to wider society. They choose the stories which make them look heroic, but meanwhile behind the scenes are pulling down articles as soon as anyone wealthy enough threatens to sue them. So, you know, they do need to um, grow a pair. And we also discussed before, <laughs> not speaking about these lawsuits and trying to hide them from the public is not the solution. I know a lot of lawyers advise journalists not to talk about them. Um, I disagree with most of them. There are maybe sp specific cases when you can't, you, you shouldn't talk, but in general, and we've been uh, working with Matthew in several cases, especially in Malta, it's the opposite. You should publicize these cases and very often, um, there are these uh, lawsuits either don't materialize or they are withdrawn. Yeah, very often you can call their bluff, and of course that's a very personal decision to make, but as a campaigner, I completely agree with that, Flutura. If this, if this is not thrust into the, the spotlight, it will just continue. And maybe to add just a step further to what, to, to what you said about newspapers, Martin, um, sometimes we see examples where journalists who are affiliated with media outlets are targeted and not necessarily for something that was published in the paper but something that they did as an individual i'm thinking of one case in particular that i won't mention but for example a tweet where the content is similar to published reporting and you you don't always see the same support from that media outlet as they they would give the same journalist if it was based on the article that they had published so i think in my view, that's a little bit cowardly as well, and I'd like to see more robust support from media outlets across the board. Okay, we have a, a few questions in here. Was this a follow-up to your earlier one, if you have a final point? Yeah. Um, thank you. Now, th this is, uh, maybe I'm going kind of um, going back to the future because it hasn't happened, but um, one thing which, is, again, has come out in the last couple of days, you know, is just how money screams. Money doesn't just shout, it absolutely screams. Um, and. As a big football fan, uh, I have serious concerns about our game and the purchase recently of a premiership football club um, for a vast sum of money by a group that there are some questions that should be asked. Um, and there was, I read something online laying out all the questions that should be asked. Um, now, as far as I know, they haven't been slapped, but... Um, you know, people aren't asking the question. Here is someone who has asked the question, is he in danger on his, you know, it's an individual on a, on a website. Um, if they go after him because they've got the money, and they may well do, um, you know, wh wh where, 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 does this, where does this end up? I mean, th th that, I'm sure you know about the case, I'm mm. the club I'm talking about, which is, is just outrageous. It was bad enough when a certain Russian bought a certain football club on 
money that came from dubious sources, but this guy is even worse than that. Yeah, I think it's an, it's an open question. I think you're right. Should we, should we take some? And next it was Sir Dan Gorman and then Sarah Clark. <clears throat> Hi there, I'm Dan Gorman from English Pen. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories, everyone on the, on the panel, and thank you, Flutora, for talking about the work that ECPMF is doing. I suppose my question is a very practical one in terms of advice from the panel. If you are a journalist who is facing what you think is potentially a slap lawsuit, what would you do next? And I think also just bearing in mind Casey's point about the extra risks that freelancers face. It would be very helpful to know if there's any advice uh, or thoughts from the panel on that. Thank you. Can I share briefly our protocol? So in cases where when we are contacted by journalists who are facing legal threats, this is before they are sued, they would contact us. Uh, we would ask with them to share their letters. In the beginning, five years ago, this was quite difficult. Now they are willing to share these letters. Um, the first thing we would do is we would uh, propose to them to uh, go public about it, meaning uh, we, pr we would prepare a short description of facts, put them on Mapping Media Freedom and Council of Europe platform, and especially the platform of Council of Europe is kind of a, a protection fr from them, because as soon as you connect your name with Council of Europe, also litigants are a bit more careful. Secondly, we would help them hire a lawyer. It's always the, the journalist who chooses the lawyer and we tell them how much money we have uh, available. Uh, there are a lot of good lawyers because we've been naming and shaming a lot of lawyers here, but there are also some good lawyers helping journalists. So we would ask them to hire lawyers as soon as possible. And then uh, lastly, we would get a, a statement, which is usually co-signed by a lot of organizations uh, to, to publish it in support of that journalist. And we would, in cases when this is possible, with COVID it has been more difficult, we <laughs> would monitor the cases at national level. Uh, we don't know of any case when this advice turned out to be a bad advice. Uh, the thing that we are struggling, I keep mentioning this, is with cases when journalists don't want to talk about these cases. This is, these are cases with which we have difficulties. Uh, and as a result, we have more cases when the uh, claimants, they, they did not file a lawsuit. They backed down because of this public pressure. But there are also cases which went to court and they are developing stories. Maybe I could bring in Matthew as well. We've still got him online on the same question. Matthew, from your experience and your family's experience, do you have any practical advice that you'd give to others finding this, themselves in this situation? Oh, did it's I see Catherine out. Bell turn in the room? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm a big fan. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Also, <laughs> also to say that, um, I mean, on the point of speaking out about these cases, which I think is always the right thing to do, um, I mean, the lawyers that are fighting cases on your behalf always want to have as, um, they always want to have kind of tight control over the case, which is why they would advise you to not speak publicly about it or something like that. But I don't always think that this is good advice. I mean, there's this really good scene in that film, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, where one of the defendants in the case is arguing with his lawyer. And his lawyer is telling him, look, there are only two kinds of cases, criminal cases and civil cases. There's no such thing as a political case. But the key moment of the film comes when the lawyer is, realizes that this is a political case. <laughs> and for many libel cases, I mean, I would say that it's the same thing. They're, they're political cases. And with Catherine Milton, I mean, this, this point is proved, proven extraordinary well, because I believe the allegation um, being made by the claimants is that it's not true that they were ordered to make certain certain economic acquisitions um but i would say that i mean not only is that true but also the 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 order to sue the journalist making that um making that allegation came from 
um, came from Putin himself. So we have this kind of sort of where the very fact that they're making this libel claim um, shows that the libel case is in itself political and that the correct way to attack that case is to speak about it as much as possible to show that it's a political case, um, to reveal the interests that are behind fighting that case and so on. I really think that this is the right way to attack these kinds of cases. But again, to come back to what we were originally saying, of course, no one should have to endure what Catherine is enduring now. This is the whole point of our campaign, of our kind of strategic campaign, that laws have to change to make this kind of legal harassment impossible. Thank you, Matthew. Catherine, I'll put you on the spot if you have anything you'd like to add, since Matthew did mention your case, but if you can't, we understand as well. I'm happy to say uh, thank you, and I'm very uh, glad and honored that you're mentioning my case uh, for a very specific reason. I can't speak about it right now, but maybe I can in a week's time. It's an unfortunate point of, of timing right now, but I would love to, to have spoken today uh, or yesterday. Um, but I'm really very glad to be able to attend the forum. It is a kind of therapy. It is cathartic to hear that you are not alone and that others have undergone the same experiences. And it's been very, very useful for me to be here. So thank you, everyone. And okay. maybe, in, maybe in the meantime, we could add your book to our anti-slap reading list collectively. Yes. Maybe we can circulate a list of, of, of books that have been mentioned in the past couple can of I days. Can I just say something briefly these? about the about therapy, right? Um, <laughs> we were having a discussion earlier, in fact, about this, about the effects on, on, on journalists themselves. Um, and we all like to see ourselves as sort of big, tough journalists. In some ways we are, and you certainly are. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, there is a particular effect that happens as a result of, of libel actions, and particularly lengthy, lengthy libel actions. And I just wish that at the beginning of my process 20 years ago, that there'd been someone who'd taken me aside and said, look, this is going to have an effect on you personally. You know, you, you get to a position where you think, okay, well, I'll get to the court case or I'll, I'll get to the point where they drop the case or we'll get to the point where we can claim some sort of Pyrrhic victory and then I'll move on to the next story. But you can probably tell from the way I talked during, during my little presentation, I'm still affected to this day by what happened during that case. Nothing, as I say, compared to what you're going through or what Matthew's gone through. But still, you know, uh, it, I still get a croak in my voice. I still find it difficult to talk about it. And I think one of the things that Flutura and I have discussed is just the way that there really does need, with whistleblowers as well as journalists, some sort of intervention at a very early stage just to say, look, you're not alone. And by the way, do you need some specialist help here? Because this is going to be traumatic. Can, can I just yeah. add to that? I don't think employers also realize that necessarily. No. For example, I, I had to take a few weeks this summer to prepare for a deposition and be deposed. That's a US thing. I don't think there's many depositions here, but it's incredibly taxing. And you know, in my mind, I was just upset that it was taking away from the story I was working on. And I really just wanted to, I, really, I was very resentful of having to take the two weeks off. And I immediately, I worked right up until it. And then I immediately they went back into work and I wish I you know it was I it, you know it was it's not it's emotionally <laughs> very taxing to have to go through that to be you know questioned on emails you wrote five years ago by you know <laughs> by these lawyers and I really wish I had asked for that time off and I maybe advice I would give even though I'm not a freelancer and I'm very grateful for the support my company gives me is just to remember that um, you know you do deserve the the time that it takes to like, process and heal from going through this and it's not shameful to be affected by it. Victoria yeah. had mentioned earlier funds available for legal defense but just to mention as well a number of our organizations do have access to funds or can refer you elsewhere uh, for mental health support as well. We don't, not nearly enough but there are resources there so if anybody does need help in that regard please get in touch with any of us. Okay. Uh, we have time just a few minutes for one final question so I'll go to Sarah Clark here in the room. Thanks everyone. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the issue of trial monitoring and how important that is in this process. So we've talked a lot about the need to publicize um, legal threatening letters and for the, the stories to be published. Um, but something that we at Article 19 and, and many of the organizations in the room do all the time is show up in court 
to monitor the, the, the trials and we also intervene. Um, but it's extremely important to do this, um, not just out of solidarity, um, but also because it puts the judge often on notice that there's something wrong with a given case. Um, and it's really great that Rupert is in the room because we recently monitored one of his hearings in the Realted case, um, which was an online hearing. Um, and there was a large group of NGOs monitoring that case. And I think for a number of reasons, it was really important that we were there because the defendants, who are Swedish, knew that we were there and we were with them in solidarity. Um, but also the lawyers for the plaintiff knew that we were there and that our eyes were on them because we're talking a lot about the lawyers who were implicated in taking and in devising the legal strategies around the plaintiff's case. Um, and so I just wanted to really highlight the importance that I know it's very time consuming, um, but it's really worth being in the room and, and a number of us have, have monitored uh, the defamation cases in Malta. Um, and it is like it's taxing. Um, but it's totally worthwhile, and, and I'd also, as a shout out to funders, you know, please do continue to to fund people to show up at these cases, um, because that's the, it, it can both uh, be an element of, of, of huge solidarity, but also um, it can really notify both the judge, the press, um, and the plaintiff and their lawyers um, that the world is watching. So, thanks. Absolutely, Sarah, and RSF does uh, that kind of trial monitoring as well. Just to mention one practical thing for journalists facing these cases or their lawyers, you don't necessarily think of notifying us all when there is a hearing of interest, but many of us are interested and will come along if we can. So please don't hesitate to let us know. Even one of us, we all work together in coalition so can pass the information on uh, to others. So. That's okay, I'm getting looks here. Oh, we're right on 3.30. So I will just say thank you to the Justice for Journalists Foundation and to the Foreign Policy Center for organizing this conference. Thank you all uh, to our panelists and to the audience and for those joining online as well. Um, and I hope this is just the beginning of an even more in-depth conversation and more joint efforts in the months and years to come.
I still got the. Re- hey. We can hear you and we've got your audio. You're coming. Okay, I'm really sorry that it's, uh, this. I mean, it's just the bloody um. Part- Hi, Ron. Hi. 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 Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much indeed. And firstly, apologies. I've come through quite late. Uh, Poppy has been working miracles trying to uh, get things sorted here, but unfortunately, even by Parliament standards, the wireless and the Wi-Fi connectivity has been pretty shocking today. So I'm sorry I'm a bit late, uh, but I'm um, ready to start. Charlie, can I just issue an apology in advance? There are going to be some votes here, which is why I'm here and not there, because I haven't slipped, unfortunately. Uh, So therefore, once Parliament starts voting, I'm going to have to hand over to you. Got it. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you're nodding. And if you could shout yeah. yes or nodding every so often, I'll, I'll just crack on. Um, do you cool. want me to start and introduce? Um, OK. I think we have a, um, uh, some serious legal problems in our country, and we have certainly problems with non-conventional forms of conflict and this stuff known as lawfare, which is about the use of law, not necessarily for public good or for the settlement of legal disputes, but as a form of power projection whether it's attacking countries or whether it's trying to bankrupt individuals. We see Putin's oligarchs using uh, lawfare in this country um, and in a way that their critics would argue is trying to silence freedom of speech, trying to silence a free press, etc., etc., and not necessarily to, to settle more narrow disputes. Um, I, I think this is something that Parliament should be taking seriously. It's something that I take very seriously. It's of my interest in Russian hybrid war and forms of hybrid war. Um, I know that there are some great proposals, which I hope we're going to talk about in this session. Um, And although I've got the proposals here, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm hoping that our expert panel is going to um, is going to enlighten me and enlighten other folks there at your um, excellently named anti-slap conference. Um, And again, apologies, I'm not there in person. Um, And guys, I'm now going to introduce you all. And are you then, uh, if I understand, Charlie, we're going to have a brief introduction to sort of two to three, four minutes from everybody just to talk about their area of expertise. Neither we're going to be taking questions from me as the sort of interested but, um, you know, non-expert audience, or um, or we're going to take um, questions from the floor. Is that correct? Yeah? That sounds good, Bob. I, I probably have Fantastic. to take a few more minutes. A few more minutes on the introduction just of the measures, but yeah, roughly the same. Uh, as, as you see fit. So I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Bob Seeley, Member of Parliament for the Isle of Wight, and I sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, and I have an interest in hybrid warfare and forms of some non-traditional threat. So Charlie, Charlie Holt, do you want to, I'm going to hand over to you, Charlie, and then should we go through all, everyone's on the panel to introduce yourself and, and uh, the key points that you think need to be raised? Thank you very much, Bob. Um, My name's Charlie Holt. I am UK Campaigns Advisor for English Pen. I I think we're all probably feeling a bit emotionally fragile from the last very, very powerful session, but there's no better way to impose a stiff upper lip than for a relentless focus on the law, and that's what our role is going to be this afternoon. I I have both the the pleasure um, and the unenviable task of going through some of the mechanics of our proposal. Um, I will try to be as quick as possible. It might take a, a a bit more time, but I will try and get there. 
Just very quickly, by way of background, the, the working group on SLAPS has been around since the beginning of the year. One, one of the first things we did was to put together a policy paper, which I've got here and anyone can look at afterwards, to establish a common advocacy uh, position, a common position on what it is that we are calling for and who it is that we are calling on to act. To do this, we, uh, uh, as well as assessing the situation in the UK, we reviewed the measures that had been introduced or proposed around the world. So that includes the 32 uh, anti-slap laws that exist on a state level in the USA, the three provincial Canadian anti-slap laws, the Australian anti-slap laws, measures that have been proposed in Europe, including most notably the European Union model directive proposed by CASE. Um, we identified through this process five principles which any type of anti-slap measure needs to advance. The first is that slaps need to be dealt with and disposed of as quickly as possible in court. Slaps obviously take advantage of the litigation process and that process needs to be as short as possible as a result to minimise the potential for abuse. Secondly, costs for slap targets need to be kept to an absolute minimum, thereby minimising the financial threat of slaps. Thirdly, the costs for slap litigants uh, needs to be sufficiently high to deter slaps, uh, and that obviously involves some form of sanctions. The fourth principle is that laws implicating speech need to be narrowly drafted to avoid the potential for abuse. And lastly, the use of slaps or legal intimidation needs to be delegitimized as a means of responding to criticism. Then the next step for us in the working group was to work out how these, pr these principles translate in a UK context. Now, obviously, that might involve, to some extent, reforming existing laws, such as, for example, defamation. Um, there's obviously no magic bullet when it comes to changing the culture around slaps, uh, but a good place to start is by reforming some of the professional ethics that govern uh, the conduct of lawyers. We recognise, however, that the first three principles, that is the early dismissal, protective measures for defendants and sanctions for plaintiffs, needed legislative reform. A lot has been said, for example, during this conference about the importance of the Defamation Act of 2013, and it was important, but it's important to make a distinction about the difference between substantive law and procedural law. However robust the legal defences that are that are made available to journalists, they are of little use in the context of slaps if they only work to dispose of a case at trial. So having identified the need for new procedural protections, we convened a legal roundtable to discuss exactly what a UK anti-slap law would look like. And we were very fortunate to have my co-panelists here today at those roundtables. In this conference, we addressed three questions. And I think we've got slides to, to help guide this. Is this working, the slide? Yeah, brilliant. So the first of all, the first question was, how much of this is just about judicial education? Uh, how much of it is due to a lack of sensitivity about the use of slaps and the way that existing mechanisms can be applied in the context of, of these tactics? Secondly, to what extent can we address the question, the issue, by modifying rules of civil procedure? In the context of England and Wales, this question is particularly significant given the civil procedure rules. Um, the CPRC, the Civil Procedure Rules Committee, cannot make new law, but it does have a mandate to ensure the civil justice system is accessible, fair and efficient. And Nicola Solomon earlier today, if you were in that panel, made this point brilliantly, and she's emphasized the overriding objective of the CP, CR, uh, CPR of enabling the court to deal with cases justly and at proportionate cost. Finally, what is left over? What would a UK anti-slap law look like? What are the remaining bits that need to be covered? So the proposal document we have, and I've got it here, and we will be launching it after this uh, session, um, it, it, it's split into three parts. I think the next slide we can see this. And just very quickly, I'm going to go through these recommendations. I don't think you can read these on screen, but I'll explain what they are. So first of all, in the context of judicial guidance, we found there was a need for both new or amended practice directions and training, specifically in relation to two things. First of all, the use of security for costs to test the seriousness of a claim. Um, but that applies in cases where a motion to strike is not possible. 
The second thing here is the motion to strike, and that's important. Motion to strike should be used, it can be used, to filter out abusive claims. And much of the uh, uh, case law on the definition of abusive process includes the improper purpose, the improper use of civil proceedings. And that, of course, includes the improper use to silence public watchdogs. So that's something which very much needs to be elaborated on and drawn out. In the context of civil procedure rules, we've called on the CPR committee to assess how the CPR can be amended to address slaps. And again, there's a focus on three things here. One is summary judgment, uh, which at present is clearly inadequate to deal with slaps. Secondly is, the, uh, is cost orders, um, which allow the judge to depart from the default, from the default loser pays principle. Um, where the claim is intended to have or will have the impact of chilling further acts of public participation, or rather that is the way we think it should be amended. And lastly, a potential pre-action protocol. I think this is something Sophie will go into here, but it's important to set out the court's expectations about pre-action conduct. We've covered this during this conference. It includes mediation, includes the use of small claims courts, and potentially includes the right to reply process that we've been speaking so much about. All of this provides the context to the anti-slap law itself. So what exactly is that trying to achieve? Well, first of all, an affirmative right to public participation, reinforcing the application of Articles 10 and 11 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, in the context of civil lawsuits and defining the scope of the law. Secondly, a filter mechanism, that is a new means of summary disposal that would create a higher threshold that has to be met for claims which are targeting acts of public participation. This would also involve the suspension of proceedings to ensure that, for example, uh, cost-intensive measures such as the disclosure process does not, is not used to harass a defendant. Thirdly, and I think this is crucial, sanctions. All costs should be automatically borne by the plaintiff where the case is found to be a slap. But furthermore, exemplary damages should be made available for cases where the claimant has exhibited a particularly egregious conduct. Linked to that is this civil restraint orders. Courts should be empowered to issue a civil restraint orders against repeat offenders, those who use slaps more than once. There already exists a registry on the MOJ of vexatious litigants. Um, this should be extended to slap litigants so that that goal of delegitimizing slaps, naming and shaming, is advanced through these measures. So that's it. Uh, I, I'm going to shut up. If you think all of this is utter rubbish, and you, we, we really would like Sorry. to hear from you, if you've got anything you would like to add to this, to suggest this, please do get in touch. We will launch a public consultation after this, and we would love to hear from you. That will be open till the end of December. And Bob, I see your hand, and I'm sorry for going on as long as I have. No, no, no I'm so glad you did, actually, and I'm so glad you, um, uh, you talked for as long as you did. And just before we bring in Sandia, can I just ask you a couple of sort of almost yes? Are yes. you sure we need oh. new laws? Um, uh, to what extent is changing culture alone enough? The human rights stuff, surely that's better in UK law. And do we have good examples? from other states, which you talked about early on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I didn't hear all of that. You broke up a bit, but I'll try and answer them. I think the first question was about new laws rather than amending existing Yeah, do we ones. need... That... Yes. Do we need a new law? Okay. Yeah, so the first one is we will, just to elaborate on why. So, for example, you can uh, amend something like defamation law. You can even, the Defamation Act of 1996 did have a disposal mechanism. But as we've heard from this conference, this extends beyond defamation to all sorts of laws. We could fix all of the laws we know are problematic and new mechanisms which emer would emerge that would then be weaponized by slap litigants. So we need to preempt that, and it needs to be all-encompassing. And that's why we need a new law. Uh, in terms of the human rights, I think this is quite a, a, a simple one. I'm sorry for making that clear. When I talk about the European Convention of Human Rights, obviously I then talk about the Human Rights Act and about the way that that should be interpreted in the context of, of civil law. And again, having that affirmative right helps aid the interpretation in a way which uh, I think is, is appropriate. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Um, Charlie, can we now bring in Sandia, because she's sitting next to you, to discuss um, sort of her thoughts, not only on, you know, in regards to her role on index and censorship, but also taking the arguments that you've very eloquently outlined for us. Sandia, over to you. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Bob uh, and Charlie. I'm uh, Sandhya Sophie Argent. I'm a freelance uh, media lawyer. So I've uh, advised on everything from news and current affairs to even dramas and entertainment shows. So my, um, my sort of whole role is working with journalists and producers navigating around all of the, the laws that we've spoken about, whether that's defamation, privacy, data protection, uh, and also sort of Ofcom regulations as well, to really help journalists and, and producers make interesting, compelling public interest content, um, not just for themselves, but actually for us. And I think that's something that we always have to, to bear in mind when we're looking at Article 10 is, is also our rights to sort of receive that very important um, information. Um, I think uh, as sort of Charlie was pointing out, I mean, I come to this as an in, uh, mainly as an in-house lawyer, although I've just gone freelance and very much understand how exposing um, that can be. But, um, you know, in-house, if, if you are a journalist or a program maker and you've ever had to sort of work with a lawyer, um, uh, the first reaction might be, oh, <laughs> to, to possibly roll your eyes. But hopefully if it's... Uh, someone like me and, and hopefully Rupert and, and other people, really our aim is to try and get you to make that content in a way that's legal and robust. And I think a lot of my frustration working in-house has been part of that process, which is the right to reply process, is an integral part of it. You know, as, as, as journalists or people making content, you are, and rightly so, you know, judged on your ability and your evidence and work um, and how you've, you know, responded to the subject of those allegations. For me, a frustration comes that that right to reply process is actually undermined and becomes a stalking ground, really, for litigation, for threats. Um, and the point of right, the right to reply process in, in pre-publication um, is, is to demonstrate responsible journalism. And a lot goes into measuring journalists or publishers and how responsibly, and media organisations, how responsibly they've acted in that period. But where is the focus on uh, claimants or potential claimants who actually abuse the process, who use it, as I say, to threaten not to engage with your letters and your claims that you've meticulously researched? You've, you as the lawyer and, and the journalist are very satisfied that you have a robust, defendable uh, piece of, of journalism and content only to be met by intimidating sort of tactics. And, and for that reason, um, I think there should be sort of specific ring fencing around that right to reply process, which means that you cannot, as a claimant, use it to threaten baseless uh, threats and to... Uh, use it to intimidate and not to engage with the questions that are being asked. So uh, as you can probably tell, I'm very passionate about that because I've had many, many, many uh, times where even the most robust of uh, journalists has uh, often broken down because, you know, we're talking about their reputations here and, and their livelihoods that are on the line. Um, and so I think it's incredibly important that as any, any measures, particularly in the pre-action space, really safeguard that right to reply process. I think that's me. <laughs> uh, Sandia, can I come in and ask you a quick question? On that? Yep. Um, thank you so much indeed again. That was really fascinating. I'm just, I'm sort of, uh, the people I see using this threat of foreign oligarchs doing it as a form of almost state level intimidation. But clearly, you're going to see a lot more people trying to use anti slap sl uh, legislation to try to intimidate. So, who are the people who are doing this, you know, Putin oligarchs aside? Well, there are also big companies, big corporations that have the money, that have the resource, that have the time to engage expensive uh, lawyers um, to to fight their claims. So it's not there are many of those sort of actors that you've mentioned, um, but big corporations are also a big part of this that I've seen in my work and. You know, some of the, I can't obviously, for obvious reasons, talk about specifics, but some of the investigative work that I've helped with are, you know, showcasing big companies that are engaged in, in human rights or have some connection with human rights abuses. 
um, and you can bet um, your your dollar or your pound or whatever that, that you're going to get a very aggressive letter back from those corporations, almost as a matter of course, uh, really, if you if you step anywhere near that. I, I, that is, it seems to be an incredibly important point to make because clearly there are significant human rights abuses being conducted throughout the world. So thank you for that. Um, Rupert, you're next on the panel. Can I ask you to A, introduce yourself and B, to, to outline what you'd like to say, please? Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Bob. I'm uh, Rupert cooper -Coles. I'm a uh, partner at RPC and I'm in the media defence team um, where we represent um, media organizations, um, broadcasters, newspapers, uh, freelance journalists, uh, NGOs. Um, and um, so I, I, I wanted to make a few comments on the proposals that the working group have um, put forward. And um, from the perspective of somebody who um, is, is often tasked with taking over a piece of litigation and often what, what we describe as as slap litigation when it actually goes into the courts. Um, taking a step back, I think um, all these proposals are very desperately needed. It, it's very, um, last night we had Claire Rucastle Brown talking about her experience where the leader of a foreign um, political party in Malaysia, who wasn't even named in an article, brought a legal action to um, uh, in our courts over um, pretty low online publication here um, over an article discussing the 1MDB scandal. And un, a, a politician who wasn't even named, the, 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 the article discussed foreign politics and, and corrupt payment flows. And our courts were dragging Claire all the way to a, a, a high court trial that um, the, the, the the um, lawyers on the other side's costs were going to be well over a million pounds. And no other profession I can think of other than investigative journalist would you, as a matter of course, um, face the risk of being sued regularly just for doing your job, have your house on the line and be, be dragged through a process like that. Um, and th th just taking a step back, there's, there's got to be something wrong where litigation can be used by um, the the very very wealthy people who um, globally wealthy people who all have English lawyers and um, have access to these reputation management departments to, as a matter of course, intimidate and often sue um, uh, investigative journalists um, for for producing public interest journalism. Um, uh, uh, all the presentations today have, have really rung home, and and just at the coalface when you're fighting litigation, you know, we're doing Claire's case and and the number of other slap cases that come across our, our desks, um, uh, more re more recently, you can open the practitioners' um, texts, which talk about um, you know how to strike out a claim at the moment, and there's nothing in the practitioners' text on contempt or abusive process that, that says the word slap at the moment. Simply no recognition. And you know, when Claire was being, um, her witnesses were being intimidated, when documents we were sending to the other side were appearing on trolls' websites, um, uh, harassing her and you know, photoshopping her and when she was getting death threats um, uh, 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 from people who were being passed documents by the other side, um, you know, we, we looked at abusive process, striking out the claim as an abusive process, and we, we've considered these applications in a number of cases, but bringing an application at the moment um, is, there's, there's very little case law. Um, it's highly risky. Your costs could easily be £50,000 in bringing one of these applications. The other side's costs will almost inevitably be double. So, um, it, uh, you know, if you if you lose that application in this untested area of law, you're 150,000 pounds down. Um, uh, I think there's going to be a case uh, uh, where um, you know someone should test these principles and try and push the law forward. And you you've got to remember that our, our judge our judges can be activists, and when they see injustice, they, um, our law does evolve and and develop in the UK. And the, you know the Reynolds 
um, public interest defense was uh, created by judges um, moving the law forward. You know, having said that, I think these proposals, um, uh, you know, there's no, there's, I, I think this is a, a pretty urgent situation. I don't think we need to sit here hoping for the right case, hoping for someone who's willing to throw a few hundred thousand pounds, take a gamble that they've got to get the right judge, they get the wins behind them and they get, they can move precedent on. Um, judicial guidance, um, whether it's practice directions or you know, possibly guidance from the master of the roles um, could play a, a really important uh, role. We, about 10 years ago, we had the super injunction spring and the, the scandal of basically court processes and court orders being made, which couldn't be reported at all. The, the orders themselves made them unreportable. And it was the master of the roles uh, interim guidance on the interim non-disclosure orders, super injunctions, which effectively has solved that problem. He's implemented transparency, reporting on the number of injunctions, how they should operate. Uh, and, and so that, that judicial guidance has vastly reduced the number of abusive super injunctions. And um, when, they, when privacy, interim privacy injunctions are brought, they're, they're generally warranted. It's in a case where there's, it's normally in cases where there's blackmail or some other proper reason for maintaining someone's privacy. Um, so I think, I think uh, uh, move, you know, pra uh, judicial guidance and, and practice directions, you know, security for costs is, a, is an important, um, uh, very important lever. And at the moment, it, it's simply not fit for purpose for um, getting rid of claims. Um, I mean, the one, the one ex, it's very, very hard to get security for costs against an individual, even if they're based abroad. Um, and we, we need to a change in the rules so that that changes. Um, I, I do remember my, my fellow partner, Keith Matheson, um, I might not be quoting this correctly, but he had a case about 10 years ago involving a Sudanese um, uh, politician who was suing over some sort of corruption allegation. And he was ordered to pay security for costs. But when he paid um, several hundred thousand pounds into court uh, in cash, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the defender refused to accept that as security and the case eventually dropped away. Um, but uh, I, think, I think that could play um, a, an important role. Um, uh, yeah, changing the the threshold on summary judgment applications. It's it, it's um, everything at the moment. When you when you you're looking at a way to dispose of a case early, a slap early, um, all the claimant has to do is keep it alive to keep the pressure on. They just got to make this is they got to tell the court this is a tribal issue. You need evidence which needs um, can only be properly assessed under cross examination. Let's not let it go. That you, you can't kick it out at this stage, and you've got the um, you know uh, very well resourced legal teams, very eloquent uh, uh, silks. So lowering that threshold will have a massive deterrent, um, and I think would, would make a real difference. Sanctions um, and, and cost sanctions. I mean, I think the naming and shaming does have an impact. Some of these slap litigants re really don't care about money. Uh, often it's not their money which they're spending on uh, legal fees, mm. um, but I, I think that's part of the puzzle. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I do think I, I agree with you, Charlie, um, completely that um, uh, ultimately uh, our judges are there to implement the law, and we do need a, a, a new law. We need a press freedom law. Mm -hmm. We need something to actually shift the paradigm, and you know. Um, I think anyone who's been sitting here for even part of the last two days feels, uh, you know, a sense of shame about this jurisdiction and, and you know, how we compare to, uh, I mean, there's, there's certainly are, are worse jurisdictions in the world um, when, you, we, when you hear other stories, but um, we, we should be an example um, about, uh, you know, we've got fantastic journalists, fa fantastic news organizations, uh, and um, it's, it's a shame our, our laws, I feel, are quite retrograde mm. um, at the moment. So, so, so new statute, I think, is what is ultimately, uh, you know, going to um, solve this problem, um, uh, you know, in the long term.
Charlie, thank you very much indeed. We've got some questions, some very interesting questions come in, and I want to ask you a question, but I'm aware of the time. So, Jessica, I'm going to go straight to Jessica, because I know she's been waiting a long time to talk. So, Jessica, could you introduce yourself? Thank you very much for being here. Um, and uh, the, points that, the, sorry, the points that you want to make. Sure. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, well, I am obviously here seated, seated beside some very uh, esteemed uh, lawyers, so I'm going to try to, as a non-lawyer, I'm going to sidestep a lot of that and leave them to, to, to deal with questions and, and topics around that um, and discuss some of the other structures and mechanisms that the government here should be using to um, to really uh, you know protect freedom of expression and media freedom with regard to slaps. Um, so firstly, um, some of you may have already heard um, the Global Media Freedom Coalition um, mentioned over the last two days. Um, so in 2019, the UK um, launched the coalition, which is now made up of uh, 49 countries, to defend media freedom where it is under threat. But as um, Jill Phillips um, of The Guardian mentioned yesterday, um, you can't help but feel that the government uh, thinks that uh, this is a problem that other countries have, or um, perhaps that you know that media freedom um, doesn't need to be doesn't need protection in the UK. Um, and I think the, it's fair to say that while they are the one of the co-leaders of this coalition, they have repeatedly um, undermined uh, media freedom, including by boycott boycotting the Today program and. Um, Good Morning Britain. They've uh, prevented certain journalists from accessing and asking questions at press briefings. Um, and just last week, we saw that uh, uh, one of, I think it was the director of communications uh, for uh, Boris Johnson, um, issued a legal threat or, or made a, a verbal uh, legal threat um, against uh, the new European. So. It's fair to say, I think, that they're not really taking their responsibility, their leadership uh, responsibility in this regard seriously. Um, and as Rupert said, I think, you know, they should be leading by example on this. Uh, we've heard as well over the last two days about cross-border um, threats. And I think this is something um, that the UK could also uh, really or should also be um, leading on. Secondly, so after the um, coalition was um, launched, um, also there was, uh, they set up the National Committee for the Safety of Journalists, which has um, then also brought about the National Action Plan for the Safety of Journalists. Um, and uh, um, I suppose, yeah, as I said, the, the committee had a role in drafting the National Action Plan. And the plan um, so far has focused very narrowly on the safety of journalists. But I think we'd really like to see it also address slaps, because as we've heard, um, including in the previous um, panel, um, or my colleague Flutora, you know, I think it was very, I, I think, uh, you know, when you became emotional, I think that it's it's an Im important to show that side of it because this isn't just a legal, you know, very clean cut, uh, as as Charlie said at the beginning, stiff upper lip issue. Like these are issues that are really affecting people, um, and you know, it was referred to as a trauma. And I think it is that is a safety of journalists issue if we're looking at uh, at approaching the issue of safety of journalism holistically, including mental health, which I think we should be. Um, and so this uh, national action plan for the safety of journalists, the government says it's a living document um, and that they will uh, revisit the plan which was published in March uh, published for the first time in March earlier on this year um, but we'd like to see um, you know as the as the growing evidence of slaps continues to emerge and we need we need journalists to help us with that right uh, to, to bring these to light so that we can show the government that this needs to be included in their plan um, thirdly as well we'd like to see the UK Pay, play a bigger role um, at the Council of Europe. Um, you know, um, the Council of Europe platform for the protection of journalism and safety of journalists was mentioned several times over the last few days. Um, and we do file um, SLAP, um, you know, um, media freedom alerts with regards to SLAPs on the platform. And um, yeah, we'd like to see more engagement um, from the UK government on that as well. So um, this year, uh, or just in the last year, we filed three alerts. Um, I should say that that's obviously not reflective of how many slaps there has been in the UK during that period. Uh, we, as I say, we do rely on journalists to actually notify us of, the s of those um, slap actions, and we need to, you know, they need to be kind of current as well for them to go on the platform. Um, but the UK, g the government has only replied to one of those three. So. Yeah, we need more engagement. Um, finally, uh, fourth and finally, um, uh, 
you know, as, as I said, this is not a problem for just out there. The rest of the world at the UK, you know, uh, which the UK government seems to think it is, um, also in Northern Ireland. So um, Northern Ireland didn't act in lockstep with uh, England and Wales when they brought in the 2013 Defamation Act. Um, the defamation legislation that's in action there is from 1955 and um, 1996. So it's um, pretty outdated and it's in need of reform. And even though um, the 2013 Defamation Act doesn't, it's not a silver bullet, it doesn't solve uh, everything, it's certainly better than what is uh, currently the, the situation in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, yeah, basically we see as well that that creates space. Maybe, maybe Rupert, you might want to speak a little bit about that as well. It creates a space uh, for abuse um, of the law as well, including um, targeting um, elsewhere in, in the UK. Um, so a carbon copy of the 2013 Defamation Act is currently before the Nor Northern Ireland Assembly, um, and we really hope um, that that uh, will be taken forward uh, in the coming uh, months as well. Um, and I hope maybe we can discuss some of these points as we go ahead, but I'll just leave it there for now. Guys, thank you very much indeed. I just before I come to the questions, a couple of questions that have been sent through. I just want to ask, um, um, who should I ask? Is Rupert very quickly? What is the percentage of if he's trying to stop slap? What is the percentage of effectiveness of a new law versus some change in custom? And to what extent will a new law encourage a sort of cultural change within the law? That means actually, we can't, we should be doing slaps in this country. Is that is that clear? <coughs> Um, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think I get the gist. Uh, I, I think uh, I, uh, you know our law evolves in in various ways, and it, it, it's often um, when you're involved in a court case, it's it's, it's very easy to get in, um, very frustrated with the judge who's hearing your case for not seeing the bigger picture and not seeing what's really fair sort of quote unquote but um we we have you know a, a very well developed legal um system with a rule of law and if a judge doesn't apply the principles that exist uh or their best understanding of of the law as it exists um uh then they're likely to be appealed and judge judges don't like being appealed they like to get the law right the first time around um so it it's it's all very well you know saying can, can judges move the law on and recognize slaps but um the law develops slowly and and often uh, only when you go up at a appellate level the court of appeal okay. or the supreme court do you really get these these shifts okay. um shifts on so that's why I think uh, a law, uh, a the new law. law is actually really needed to move stuff on. Okay, so um, a question from Franz, who is with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, uh, and he taught, he's asking about how to achieve cultural change specifically, and he says, he also points out that a lot of, a lot of law firms engage repeatedly in slaps are sometimes named and shames, and he says to them it's a bit like having a calling card. So how can we really dictate how law firms act, um, to, um, and how can we force that cultural change? Who wants to take that forward? I, I don't mind starting on that. On it. Um, yeah. I mentioned this very briefly when I was talking about delegitimizing the use of slaps, and I was saying that this was something that we had discussed and we felt was was, was something that really the imperative was on the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority, the SRA, the Bar Standards Board, to act on. Um, the SRA published a document uh, called um, Conflicting Rights and Litigation, Balancing Conflicting Rights and Litigation. The Bar Standards Board doesn't have any similar guidance. At the moment, barristers in particular are able to hide behind principles such as the cap rank rule. Uh, and they are able to say, well, we're just fearlessly and tenaciously pursuing the interests of our client. Uh, there is this conflict there, and there is a sufficient ambiguity for them to avoid the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the shame that really should accompany uh, facilitating slaps. So I think at the very least there needs to be clarity there, which means that there needs to be guidance published. But I would go further, and I would say that the code itself, the codes itself need to be examined in the context of slaps. 
uh, at the moment, and I think this has already been mentioned, if you want to hold a lawyer to account for the use of slaps, you have to rely on deception on, 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 and, and make, you have to make a case largely that either they've been deceiving the court or they've been acting with a lack of integrity. And I, the, the latter, I think, is, is fairly underdeveloped. Um, so I think being actually building into this idea that you cannot you know, abuse the court's processes. You cannot use it uh, you know, at, with an improper purpose of just trying to silence speech. I think that's, that's quite important. But I'll just say one thing really quickly. I know I'm talking too long, but that's just the very sense that this idea about the law itself changing the culture, I think that does to a limited extent, but I think it's more important that we build mechanisms into the law in order to be able to have that effect. Uh, and that can be done, as I said, okay. through the, I, the registry of elements. I can see Sandy wants to come in just before, just before she does. I mean, we talk about having a list of vexatious litigants. I mean, I take it there's no chance yeah. of uh, a list of vexatious lawyers, is there? <laughs> He's a very good I'm not, point. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure Jessica would find that particularly funny. So apologies uh, if he doesn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, just just quickly to add um, onto Charlie's point. It's, it's also about hiding behind privilege and confidentiality, which is what happens a lot of the time when you get these letters. I think if you are engaging in conduct that or, or, or litigation or pre-action that is designed to shut that journalist down, and that's your only aim, or to shut public interest journalism down, um, you cannot, by the same account, um, be hiding under under privacy and, and privilege. You should be able to publish those letters um, that are coming so that people can see the attempts that are made. It's important that, that people know uh, what steps are being taken to prevent uh, this debate from moving forward in the public arena. And just on that point, I find it appalling because I've come across some friends who've had these sort of issues and the amount of threats and potential threats. And I'm saying this sounds like actually harassment. Why aren't you fighting back claiming harassment because of the amount of letters? But the problem is because you're dealing with lawyers and people who know the law and there is a, the, the threat, not of physical destruction in this country, but financial destruction. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if it becomes every time you get another abusive letter from some incredibly well paid lawyer acting on somebody on behalf of a very rich person or institution it, it's sort of it's sort of numbing you into silence it seems to be just it is a legal form of intimidation yeah. i think if i could just uh, briefly come in as well sorry bob if you can hear me just on the on the subject of um, yeah. cultural change i think one of the big um issues that we're facing as well is that people don't really understand what the what the role of journalists is you know earlier on um matthew caron galicia said that people have this idea that you know journalists receive a tip they write up the story and they just press publish and i think not only do people think like that but they also believe that um they don't really understand that journalists are there to hold power to account and they have an essential role in democracy and that there's there's uh, you know, it's can, it's in a wider picture of, of rule of law as well, and and democracy, human rights. They're not just uh, they're not just there to make people's lives difficult, just to you know, and, and to harass politicians or, or things like that, and so on. And um, yeah, so I think I think we need to have maybe like an information campaign. Uh, you know, the government should obviously take a bigger role in this as well, and also maybe civil society also to to make people understand the the role of journalists and the importance of media freedom. Right, Jessica, I don't know if you can hear, we've got bells in the background, so I'm going to wave goodbye. Charlie, can you take over? But I've got a question from a gentleman in Sudan who talks about how to protect this authoritarian hegemony in African countries like Sudan um, and that um, why aren't there sanctions for countries that violate international laws? I'm not sure if that quite covers the same ground, um, but I'm wondering if, uh, have you got access to that question? Can you see it? I can't. I think mean, maybe Susan's no, okay. sent it my way there. So don't worry, I think it's going to be sent my way. Fantastic. Okay, I better go and get a bung on a suit and run and vote. So very nice to see you all, and I will see you all again Thank you. soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know if you caught the last question about Sudan. I've just got it now. I'm reading for it now. It's how to protect, protect journalists in light of... Um, the authoritarian experiences in, in, in countries such as Sudan and restriction of journalistic freedoms. Why weren't there sanctions for countries that violate international laws and work to restrict media freedom? Um, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts about that. <clears throat> I mean, it, yeah, it's a, I suppose it's a, um, uh, a, a bit, bit beyond the scope of my day-to-day -day experience, but we, we have, thanks to a lot of 
um, important campaigning. We've in the EU and the UK finally adopted the equivalent of US Magnitsky sanctions um, in these jurisdictions. And I, I think these are really powerful tools. Um, you know, I, I know UK law firms who are perfectly happy to act in the UK for people who are subject to US Magnitsky sanctions, threatening people, journalists in the UK about matters which are tied to those sanctions. And, um, uh, you know, that wouldn't be possible in the US. And so um, I, I do think um, both in, in the UK, well, in, in the UK, you wouldn't normally, we wouldn't sanction people in the UK, we'd investigate and charge them. But in terms of, um, you know, projecting higher standards around the world, once people uh, are sanctioned by our, our, our government or the EU um, EU authorities because they there's intelligence that they are corrupt and and that's the the government's you know view on matters those people are, are, are probably going to fall out of the the slap game and the you know abusive libel game and I'd hope um, at that point um, uh, the the only lawyers they'd be getting in the UK are ones to um, you know uh, interact with the authorities about those sanctions yeah. and not beyond that I think there were if you don't mind me just putting in there, I mean, there was a conversation earlier about the due diligence or due diligence obligations which should be um, imposed on, on, on lawyers. There was it's something that we've explored in depth, and there's kind of two different issues here. There's the question about, and we often refer to them as slap tactics. So, you know, it, tactics to try, for example, to deliberately stretch out proceedings mm -hmm. so as to cause as much pain and, 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 and drive out costs as much as possible for the defendant. And then there's a separate issue about when we often refer to as facilitating slaps, i.e. representing people who are transparently using the legal process as a means of harassing their critics. There's kind of two different issues there which I think are really interesting to explore. I think the first one, the use of abusive tactics, is potentially easier to address than the second. It, I think really the problem with the first seems to be a lack of evidence. You know, or be able to show that this is the real purpose. It's all too easy to be able to say, "Oh no, the real reason we were, you know, delaying was because of unavoidable conflicts of schedule or whatever it is." The second one about facilitating slaps is where things get really quite messy, because then people say, "Well, that will then run up against this principle of non-discrimination or the cab rank rule." You know, we we can't make a decision about who it is we 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 um, we represent. But crucially, if there are very compelling reasons, if it's really obvious, if there is compelling evidence that the real reason they're using it is just as, as part of a broader campaign of harassment, there really should be uh, accountability for that. I don't know if you've got thoughts about that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot. To <laughs> there's a lot to take in. I mean, also just sorry um, to to revert back, but I think it's important with the, the question from from the gentleman about um, uh, you know sanctions and, and to go on from what you've both said. I mean, yes, we're talking about UK, but this there's a whole ecosystem that that happens here. There's journalists based here that have sources in other countries as well. And if, for example, you know, we have to get our own house in order, I think. Uh, first, you yeah. know, uh, we have to have the moral authority to say um, we take media freedom uh, seriously, and there are lots of things that we've obviously been talking about. So that's that's sort of uh, the first thing, and and part of that is uh, other countries and and uh, other journalists not viewing this as a very friendly um, jurisdiction, which it's which it still is, and and it has implications. It has implications for other sources that are also living uh, in 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 other countries as well that are either whistleblowers or informants or part of that. Um, particularly when you're in uncovering uh, international human rights abuses, there's a very very tight ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly important that we take these things seriously here because they do have we're talking about the UK but they have wider ramifications as well than the UK um, I mean touching on your point Charlie uh, I, I was saying to um, Sophie earlier that um, my, I'm not an intellectual property lawyer but my, my understanding of trademark law is if you make an unjustified trademark threat if you threaten another business saying you're passing off or infringing my trademark and it turns out that there isn't actually merit in that compl complaint 
the person you've threatened um, uh, and you, you never issued a claim has a legal has legal recourse against you for the impact of that threat on their business. So it it, it just feels mm. like we've got something slightly wrong, mm. where uh, our, our IP laws um, protect the wrong of like businesses being heavy-handed with other businesses. Yeah. <laughs> but there is there's no protection for uh, lawyers writing. Um, 15 10 page letters throughout a whole weekend to get a story killed which goes to um, you could argue probably a more important public good mm -hmm. so um, uh, you know that's just a sort of observation but I, I, I think it is it's incredibly difficult and incredibly sensitive that um, you know holding lawyers to account for who they represent um, because it points of privilege you, you, you've mentioned um, article 6 rights to fair trial and fair mm -hmm. representation um, but uh, you know I, I've, I, I think there are there are definitely firms out there overstepping the mark and this this increasing tendency of um, legal threats to be sent anonymously from generic law firm accounts mm -hmm. um, reputation at blank firm um, I, I think shows an unwillingness by partners and associates to actually yeah. be associated yeah. with their own client, which yeah. is perhaps telling you something. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think you know the um, in 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 trying to move the law on. Um, I think it is really important that we like keep an eye on um, the unintended consequences of like going too far and recognizing um you know recognizing that there are legitimate libel claimants and there are people who um suffer badly when their privacy is invaded or uh, un are unfairly defamed on the internet um a a a and having a, a degree of recognition of the other side's perspective and you know recognizing when um Article 8 rights should prevail over Article 10 rights, reputation and privacy should re prevail over free speech. I think that will only make, um, if we keep our eye on the, on the other side's perspective, it will only make our, uh, our proposals and our arguments move the law forward um, stronger. Thanks, Teresa. I've got a, a comment and a question, but if anyone here does have any questions, please do raise your hand. Um, we can start with a comment which is coming online from Adelaide Lopez at Wigan LLP. Um, it's clear that a change in law really can have an effect. See, for example, what happened when the success fee uplifts, uplifts were finally removed for publishing claims. The ambulance chasers who were really taking advantage of the most vulnerable potential claimants disappeared almost overnight. And with them, those cases which were a waste of time and money for publishers have really reduced. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on, on that. But it's a really interesting parallel. Yeah, it's a it's been a fantastic change, um, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. A AT, um, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, 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 yeah, CFA uplifts and AT policies has been um, lead to completely abusive like costs being run up, which no client them themselves would actually ever incur. Mm -hmm. And yes, just changing the the cost rules has had a uh, enormous impact and made the lives of a lot of publishers a lot easier. So I agree with that. Room for optimism there. I've got a question here for both Sophie and Robert. Maybe I'll start with you, Sophie, which is, what is the attitude within the legal profession on this issue? Do we need more lawyers to speak out against this part of their profession? Um, yes, perhaps I'm uh, encouraged by my freelance status. I don't know if I, um, I don't know about Rupert, but no, we do, and I think it's important as well. We were talking about, I think, education uh, and, and culture, but you know, even even for me, when I um, started uh, talking with um, 
Susan first, I had to be educated on what a slap was. For me, there was a distinction between a very robust uh, letter and somebody acting robustly um, for their client, and perhaps actually letters, when I thought about them, where I thought, no, actually, they were threats. They were not talking about the law. As, as Rupert was saying, I mean, I, I also, I'm not just here saying free speech and, and journalists and people making programs never do anything wrong. That That's that's not what we're talking about here. But um, when I get a letter from, from another law firm, what I expect is that they're also going to engage reasonably with the issue that I've that we've raised or that's been raised by it, not, as I say, uh, a, a chance to start telling you that they can issue injunctions which they don't actually, which are not actually legally able to do in any event, uh, or, as I say, to make threat, um, threatening and actually quite rude remarks about uh, the people that are writing the story. So I think, firstly, it is an education. I think uh, even for me as a lawyer, it's, it's sort of distinguishing this is just somebody that's robustly and has a right to put their uh, claimants uh, claims to you, and this is actually somebody that is uh, issuing language and behaving in a way that's that's in accordance with a slap. Thanks. Yeah. I don't know if you've got anything to add. No, well, I, 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 I agree with all that. I, you can tell the difference, you know, you know, um, uh, a, a law firm which doesn't engage in this practice, um, you, you take them more seriously um, when you get a letter from them because you, you know they won't write something that um, goes, you know, um, beyond uh, w the law that they don't engage in abusive practice and they have some discretion about their clients. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I personally think it's in like my colleagues who are doing claimant work. Um, I think it's in their interest to move out of the market of acting for um, uh, some of the shadier clients who um, come this way, and um, and yeah, ad advising our clients, um, we we often you know we'll take very seriously and we'll listen to to people who, who don't overstep the mark and don't engage in this abusive practice. Interesting one here. I guess a good follow up from this is whether law firms defending media consider reporting other law firms who they believe are sending vexatious threats to their clients to the SRA. Have any lawyer on lawyer combat going on there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it does happen, um, but um, we're we're generally quite like reluctant to to do that. I mean, you do get claimants reporting you to the SRA, uh, claimants solicitors because they're unhappy with something. Um, but uh, the, the regulator doesn't normally um, get involved and. Um, yeah, it would have to be quite a serious matter, um, uh, you know, a, a clear breach of the rules for us to consider doing that. Got a question here, which actually I think is, I think this leads on nicely from what we we're talking about. So has there been an attempt to involve the law society as the profession's regulatory body? And a, a separate question about how receptive have UK parliamentarians been, and is there a parliamentary committee set up or planned? I think we'll probably separate those in two bits with the professions regulatory body. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts about that. I, mean, I think as probably has been said, it is quite a high bar. And again, it's part of this education. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it is sort of really difficult. I mean, one thing I, I always think about and, and I always think to myself, am I being um, too highly, highly principled? But you know, when I was uh, first started out studying, one of the things that you were taught, particularly um, at the, you know, at the bar, was that you, if you were dealing with people that were unrepresented, then you, you had to take that into account and not um, use it um, to have a, have a barrel over people. And sometimes I, I, I see this manifested in, in some of the correspondence that gets sent to um, journalists or producers when they're acting on their own and then when those same sort of letters are possibly sent knowing that 
that they're dealing with a lawyer shouldn't really be that discrepancy and I think I, I'm pretty sure I mean I'm scratching my head because <laughs> it's a few years ago now but I'm pretty sure that was as part of your ethics that was one of the things that was was sort of drawn into you that at the end of the day you're an officer of the court yes we all act for our clients but what we're really there to do is is to uphold the law uh, and not just run away with the, the the money that we're paid and and forget all of that um yeah <laughs> yeah I, I mean i i completely agree it, it's there, there was and i think there still is a in in the new um sra regulatory code an obligation not to take unfair advantage mm -hmm. is there <laughs> um and yeah i mean we uh, in the last year i or uh, well, 13 months i've had um done three jurisdiction cases um against um uh, an Italian news organization, a Swedish news organization, Realtid, which was mentioned earlier in the conference, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and just last week, a, a Spanish news organization. Um, and um, it, without picking out any particular case, uh, it, issues we've had is you know, writing let, letters of claim which don't comply with the pre-action protocol, which don't fairly describe the rules and jurisdiction and suggest it's a sort of no-brainer that the courts here would accept jurisdiction. They don't even write to them in their own language and expect them, and then you know blame them for um, uh, you know not not engaging in um, not responding. Um, so yeah, I think I think it. it, it I, I've never heard of um, SRA taking issue with it, but I, I do think there is a temptation when you're in the territory as a reputation manager of sending out notice and takedown letters, you know, cease and desists. You're firing them out to websites around the world. I think there is a temptation to um, forget your position as a solicitor, forget your uh, obligation not to take unfair advantage of the recipient's lack of knowledge. There may be, it may be a big media organization, but you can't ex assume that the foreign media around the world knows the intricacies of uh, English libel and jurisdiction law. Mm. Um, I, I, I just add, add, add to this because I think it's a, a really good question. I'd say first of all that it's very much on the to-do list of the UK working group <laughs> to, to engage the law society, but it's part of a broader effort to um, raise awareness and to delegitimize the use of slaps, to reach out to lawyers. There, there does need to be more education about this and also, like I said, providing clarity about how to reconcile some of the 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 the, the more compl complex uh, 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 ethical principles with the use of slaps i think is really important something that annika said in one of the previous sessions i think is worth re-emphasizing again because she mentioned about law students and about this movement that you've got in some parts of the usa um, in relation to fossil fuel uh, law firms that are facilitating some of the abuse of fossil fuel companies I think it'd be great to see something like that in law schools. Um, uh, this is something I've had a conversation about yesterday. Uh, it's something you see in the USA and here, which is that while there is a course on legal ethics, while that is, it, you you have to pass your ethics exam in order to be able to get your bar, bar you know, to be able to pass the bar. There isn't really a live discussion when it comes to selecting which law firm you go to about the ethical standards that they have. And I think that's something we need to have more of a presence on in law schools, which is like that needs to really, we need to get to a point when that is, is really factored in as one of the, the, the considerations as to which law school uh, a student joins. Um, I've got, uh, maybe I could just pursue the second part of that, the question I raised before, which is how receptive UK parliamentarians have been and about parliamentary committees. Jessica, maybe I could direct that one at, at you about uh, the, the parliamentary landscape in, in this respect. Um, yes, yeah, so we've had um, a few meetings with um, parliamentarians, including um, Bob Seeley, uh, um, and it's something that we continue, you know, that we're going to continue to try to do as part of the UK working group as well, because, um, you know, as, as Sophie said as well, it, it is about educating them also, uh, you know, as, legis as legislators about why this is important and why it's important for them to take action in this regard. Um, so, yeah, it's part of an ongoing process. Um, some are more receptive than others, let's say, but uh, we're keen to bring more of them on side. Especially now, uh, as has been mentioned, that the U EU is taking action against slaps. Hopefully that will, um, you know, help, I suppose, uh, raise awareness about it and, and of the importance as well of taking action in this regard. 
Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I think again ties in with this question about raising awareness and how important that is. So I think after this session, you go away, you contribute to the consultation, you read our proposal, and then you start tweeting about slaps. It's going to be important on everyone's to-do list. Uh, I've got another question here, which is about, is there a way to tie this into high levels of noise around environmental, social, and governments, governance investing? Uh, it says non-ESG compliant businesses are now starting to suffer in terms of their access to capital which would surely irritate any wealthy individual. Is it po possible to have this become a part of ESG investing criteria so it's tracked and pressure is put on the investing community? Um, that is a great question. I I've got some thoughts, but maybe Sophie you wanted to come in first. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm really interested in this space of business and, and, and human rights. And I think it's, and as we see in the whole sustainability ESG sort of sector, you know, companies, corporations, everyone's being measured on um, environmental goals, things like modern slavery, but what about uh, you, you're facilitating or inhibiting or your parts that you're playing when it comes uh, to issues of slaps or, or free expressions or access to information? And I think that's a really, really important space. And I, it's, it's sort of related, but I mean, you know, particularly I've worked in obviously bigger kind of organizations, but also now in my capacity, I'm uh, you know, advising very independent um, sort of uh, companies that have only just one or two people where the resource is few. And I think if you are a company that has a lot of resource, I think you have that big a responsibility to, uh, you know, ensure what you're doing and how, what the impact is on, on, on free expression. And I, I do think personally the sort of business and human rights space and ESG is a really uh, good uh, and, and kind of innovative way of looking at this as well, and we should definitely be incorporating it in our thinking. Yeah, you go ahead. Well, the, the only thing I'd um, jump in on that is um, as soon as you have somebody that is deciding that X company or X person is uh, abuses the court process and issues slaps, that they'll be the next that that body will be the next defendant so <laughs> ju just like bodies that do G aml processes that um assess that you know play any role in trying to um outside of the court process and court convictions ever anyone raises uh suspicions or concerns and records that that's processing personal data they're a data controller mm -hmm. and um and and the, the claimant's law claimants letters will just start hitting those investment platforms that share this information or refuse to uh, you know inaccurately describe them as abusing court processes um and so yeah the sort of the cycle continues um yeah yeah, yeah that's why you need a solidarity network i suppose <laughs> uh, i just add one thing i'm not sure whether jessica you want to come but i'll just say one thing really um uh, which guy one uh, um made me think of this i think just being able to characterize this as human rights abuse is, is, is an important thing to do. A lot of people don't think of it in human rights because they think of human right, attacks on human rights as you know, always emanating from state bodies, from government bodies. And they don't realize that corporations or powerful individuals can uh, impact human rights in the same way or can exercise powers of censorship in a way which is comparable to government bodies. So that's important in itself. The other thing I would just raise awareness to is that this, this is something, the, the engaging investors is something that has already been undertaken elsewhere in the world. The Business and Human Rights Resource Center, we heard from Lady in the first session, have been very good on this one. They put together an investor brief, which you can find online, um, which lays out, again, the implications of slaps for human rights and talks about the obligations of investors. I think they, they, there was a, some success, I think it was earlier this year, I've got it in front of me here, for an investor statement on SLAPs where 44 institutions with more than 270 billion US dollars of combined assets called on companies to take broad systemic action to protect human rights and, and ensure they do not use or support SLAPs. So again, there has been that success on, on the global stage and I think it'd be great to apply that on a national level and ensure it actually has some practical effect. We're getting too close to the end. I don't know whether, Jessica, you wanted to come in with any of that. 
like I say, yeah, that I, I heard recently um, someone mentioned that I think it was of the tech companies, the people who were whistleblowers in the tech companies are identifying themselves increasingly, I think, as dissidents, you know, as if these really large corporations are countries, you know, and I think that this is something that is um, really ties into something that came up in the first panel as well, which is around inequality and the rise, the fact that there is more and more, uh, more and more millionaires, more and more billionaires. Um, and uh, yeah, th this means that there needs to be a rebalancing of the, of the, you know, uh, a key uh, symptom of a slap is the inequality of arms. So there needs to be a rebalancing done there to take, uh, to kind of counter this uh, rich get richer, um, you know, phenomenon, I suppose. Absolutely. I think it's really good to remember the, the broader systemic problems of which this is a symptom that we need to address as well. I think that's a, a good note to, to wrap up on, unless anyone's got any final questions. Um, I'm going to wrap up now, mainly because I do want to do one final plug, and also because we're fortunate enough to be able to listen, to hear from Maria, uh, who's the Director of Justice for Journalist Foundation, who's going to wrap up this conference. Before we do, I would like to say one thing. I said it uh, briefly at the end of, of my um, presentation, but I, I would like to emphasize it again, which is that we're going to be opening up this. And for anyone who's in the room, you can actually see our proposals. I've got a physical document here that you can read through and you can take away of it. It's not quite as good as the gift I got from Claire yesterday, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's <laughs> I'll give it to you if you like. Um, and you can, so, uh, you can find that online. Uh, there is a consultation document, a Google form that you can access and you can contribute. If you've got any thoughts at all, we would appreciate to hear from you. Uh, you can find this on the conference website. Um, I don't know if we've got an address. We, we Thank you so much. Anti slash, anti slash, wait, anti dash slap conference dot info. Um, and uh, there is a resources part of that website and you can find there this proposal and you can find the link to the consultation. With that, I think we're a little bit early. We've got a couple of minutes early, but I think we will wrap up at this point so that we can give time to hear from Maria. Oh, he's here. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much, Charlie. And uh, it's really hard to speak after this uh, brilliant panel. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll try to um, be brief, but I really wanted to start with thanks and uh, continue with just a few uh, finalizing um, wrap-up comments. So uh, starting with thanks, I really would like to uh, thank our host, which is uh, Open Russia, and amazing technical team who uh, is headed by Anthony and who made this all happen and run so seamlessly. Uh, so thank you very much, Anthony. We can't see you, but we know you're here. Thank you. Um, and of course, our uh, co-organizer, which is Foreign Policy Center, with uh, Susan and Poppy and Adam. Uh, thank you, guys. It's it's amazing, and I'm very privileged to um, <laughs> to be able to um, to work with you for the last, um, I think, 15 years. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's in different capacities and uh, my different roles. But uh, this is another amazing example of of how great is the work that you're doing. And of course, I would like to to um, to thank my team. Uh, who were instrumental in putting this all together and uh, working on the website. Uh, and uh, uh, Wafa, uh, who is not here, Wafa Fatizadeh, whom you know from, from the Anti-Slap Coalition, she represents us uh, in the working group, uh, represents Justice for Journalists Foundation, and she was uh, instrumental, and uh, the other guys from my team here uh, as well. So thank you very much. And it's also also, our Wafa's birthday today, so it's, it's a good, uh, good uh, present to her, I think, this, the success of this conference. Um, and, uh, of course, I would like to salute to all the amazing chairs and speakers and the audience. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible honor to have been in the same room with uh, all these brave journalists who stand up to intimidation and quasi-legal bullying. I extend my admiration to strategic thinking NGO representatives, researchers and politicians who clearly recognize the severity of what used to be perceived as a very niche problem. Uh, I thank you for tirelessly looking for ways of, uh, to expose this uh, criminal practice and fight uh, corrupt and disproportionate pressure tactics employed by powerful and wealthy against the truth that uh, threatens their existence. And there are a couple of um, points or uh, concepts uh, that I would like to highlight in my closing remarks, and uh, they, they've been all highlighted uh, in this conference. 
so first is the really the expression uh, which uh, seemed to have been mentioned in every remark we've been listening to, which is a chilling effect. Uh, and uh, this, I think, certainly deserves uh, special attention as um, because of the frequency, obviously, and because um, uh, the striking similarity um, of um, this um, impact, which is demoralizing, uh, extremely demoralizing uh, impact of those exhausting tactics uh, with zero, usually zero legal merit, that are aimed solely at uh, draining the journalists' resources, uh, which are moral, emotional, financial, reputational, physical. And coming myself from a very chilly country in many senses, uh, that has been, um, uh, that has seen only uh, really a couple of decades of thaws over the last uh, hundred years. Um, and um, these this hundred of years were, of course, very uh, politically uh, and socially freezing. Um, so I can testify to the destructive impact um, on the generation of, of people that this chilling effect has. And, um, of course, those who speak up in these conditions, those who are keen uh, to discover and publicize the truth and who project democratic values uh, are usually squeezed from countries like that. They are deprived of their freedom and um, they sometimes are almost um, driven to take their own lives um, as the only remaining means to express their protest uh, against this gripping political winter. I'm very hopeful that um, examples of uh, actions of this uh, aggressive and uh, accountable kleptocracies mentioned here today, like Russia and Kazakhstan, as well as the, those that did not, uh, that, that were not mentioned today and, and yesterday, uh, like Belarus, Turkmenistan and China, uh, and the actors, of course, who employ the same uh, aggressive tactics against journalists, uh, so-called legal methods, uh, and they take these tactics to extreme. I do believe that uh, this, is, uh, this will serve uh, like a wake-up call to the rest of the world. Uh, and naming uh, those countries and actors um, well known for oppressing their own citizens uh, take me to the second uh, concept I would like to highlight today. And this concept is uh, weaponized bullying. Um, and um, we all know that it takes a lot to stand up to bullying. And uh, weaponized and well-funded bullying, uh, masked uh, at, as, as the legal or legitimate uh, legal tactics, uh, by uh, seemingly uh, respectable members of the society, legal professionals, is almost impossible to stand up to. And uh, it is uh, true that uh, no one uh, can resist sending, uh, no, no one can resist these tactics um, standing up alone to them. And uh, this, this brings me to an important point that this conference is uh, um, specifically serving this, this purpose of uh, showing that no one has to do it alone anymore. And uh, although, of course, there is a gaping uh, inequality of the playing field that, again, was mentioned many times today, and uh, the law lawfare is supported by seemingly unlimited funds, there is a growing recognition of this phenomenon, and the body of support is being formed and is being strengthened as we speak. And this conference, I believe, clearly contributed uh, to the growing awareness of what is really hiding behind the smoke screen of legalistic language of fancy letter-headed letters. Slaps against journalists or lawfare or quasi-legal bullying should stop. Uh, as this incredible uh, collection of talent that we had the privilege to listen today and yesterday has vividly demonstrated, we do have a capacity to stop it. Which brings me to the first, uh, to the third concept uh, that uh, was implied yesterday and was uh, actually explicitly pronounced today, which is a solidarity, of course. Uh, although journalism used to be viewed as highly competitive uh, industry, we now see more and more cooperation between journalists from different countries working to uncover transnational crimes. Uh, it is my strong belief that such cooperation within the industry must be taken further. Uh, I believe that it is ultimately the enhanced solidarity within this industry and beyond that will save journalists from aggressive and destructive might of hybrid attacks, of which slaps are an integral part. And uh, we purposely uh, brought speakers from uh, all over the world uh, today and tomorrow. And it was indeed heartwarming to listen to the mutual expressions of solidarity and awe about the similarity, similarities of experiences by journalists from South Africa, Australia, USA, Europe, and the UK. Um, the, um, the, um, 
actually, I, yeah, probably say it again. Uh, the thing that Rebecca mentioned uh, uh, from, from this uh, stage today and uh, something that I heard uh, throughout uh, the conference on the fringes, uh, it was indeed this conference, and it serves as a sort of a Me Too moment that um, actually highlighted that uh, you know we uh, everyone shouldn't suffer alone. The 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 experience that the experiences are shared, and um, in solidarity, those experienced uh, can can be uh, can be you know uh, remedied. So I am optimistic about uh, this solidarity and about the momentum that this conference built, um, and I'm so uh, I'm I'm optimistic about the uh, the targeted counter slap measures that um, were being discussed over the last two days. Uh, and they include, of course, publicity, trial monitoring, um, due diligence, uh, legal, psychological, financial help to the targets of vexatious uh, legal threats and, uh, and many other measures. Uh, if argued for and, and promoted and implemented systematically, those measures will ultimately lead to more favorable environment for exposing the wrongdoings, uh, strengthening media support, and ultimately a genuine and not declarative, de declarative democracy. And um, as um, Dario Milo said this, this morning, uh, he quoted an African famous African proverb that it takes a village to uh, raise a child, and he said that he's proud to be this part of the village that is going to ultimately uh, bring uh, the slaps to, to the end. I think, um, we are seeing the beginning of it, and I think uh, we all, as, as this village, uh, are going to bring this collective uh, case ultimately to the, uh, to the new, to the winning dimension. So thank you very much again for participating, and I hope we meet again soon. Thank you. <laughs>